Section 27 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3, by Robert Burton. Section 27. Partition 3. Section 2. Member 5. Subsection 5. Part 2. Another let or hindrance is strict and severe discipline, laws and rigorous customs that forbid men to marry at set times and in some places. As apprentices, servants, collegiates, states of lives in copyholds or in some base inferior offices, velle licet in such cases, poteri non licet, as he said. They see but as prisoners through a grate, they covet and catch, but tantalus a labris, etc. Their love is lost, and vain it is in such an estate to attempt. Gravissimum est adamare nec potiri. Tis a grievous thing to love and not enjoy. They may, indeed, I deny not, marry if they will, and have free choice some of them. But in the meantime their case is desperate. Lupum auribus tenent. They hold a wolf by the ears. They must either burn or starve. Tis cornutum sophisma, hard to resolve. If they marry, they forfeit their estates. They are undone, and starve themselves through beggary and want. If they do not marry, in this heroical passion they furiously rage, are tormented, and torn in pieces by their predominant affections. Every man hath not the gift of continence. Let him pray for it then, as Beza adviseth in his tract de divortiis, because God hath so called him to a single life, in taking away the means of marriage. Paul would have gone from Mysia to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered him not, and thou wouldst peradventure be a married man with all thy will, but that protecting angel holds it not fit. The devil, too, sometimes may divert by his ill suggestions and mar many good matches, as the same Paul was willing to see the Romans, but hindered of Satan he could not. There be those that think they are necessitated by fate, their stars have so decreed, and therefore they grumble at their hard fortune. They are well inclined to marry, but one rub or other is ever in the way. I know what astrologers say in this behalf, what Ptolemy, Quadripartitum, Tract 4, Chapter 4, Sconer, Book 1, Chapter 12, what Leovitius, Genitur, Exemplum 1, which Sextus Ab Heminga takes to be the horoscope of Hieronymus Wolfius, what Peselius, Origanus, and Leovitius his illustrator, Garceus, chapter 12, what Junctine, Protanus, Campanella, what the rest, to omit those Arabian conjectures, a parte conjugii, a parte lasciviae, triplicitates veneris, etc., and those resolutions upon a question, an amica potiatur, etc., determine in this behalf, viz., an sit natus conjugem habiturus facile an difficulter sit sponsam impetratoras, quot conjuges quo tempore, quales decernantur nato uxores, de mutuo amore conjugem. 
both in men's and women's genitures by the examination of the seventh house the almutes lords and planets there a sol descendens et luna ascendens etc by particular aphorisms si dominus septimae in septima vel secunda nobilem decernit uxorem servam aut ignobilem si duodecima si venus in duodecima etc with many such too tedious to relate yet let no man be troubled or find himself grieved with such predictions as hieronymus wolfius well saith in his astrological dialogue non sunt praetoriana decreta they be but conjectures the stars incline but not enforce sidera corporibus praesunt caelestia nostris sunt ea de vili condita nam queluto cogere sed nequeunt animum ratione fruentem quippe sub imperio solius ipse dei est wisdom diligence discretion may mitigate if not quite alter such decrees fortuna sua a cuisque fingitur moribus qui cauti prudentes voti compotes etc let no man then be terrified or molested with such astrological aphorisms or be much moved either to vain hope or fear from such predictions but let every man follow his own free will in this case and do as he sees cause better it is indeed to marry than burn for their soul's health but for their present fortunes by some other means to pacify themselves and divert the stream of this fiery torrent to continue as they are rest satisfied lugentes virginitatis florem sic aruise deploring their misery with that eunuch in libanius since there is no help or remedy and with jephthah's daughter to bewail their virginities of like nature is superstition those rash vows of monks and friars and such as live in religious orders but far more tyrannical and much worse nature youth and his furious passion forcibly inclines and rageth on the one side but their order and vow checks them on the other votoque suo sua forma repugnat what merits and indulgences they heap unto themselves by it what commodities i know not but i am sure from such rash vows and inhuman manner of life proceed many inconveniences many diseases many vices masturbation satyriasis preapismus melancholy madness fornication adultery buggery sodomy theft murder and all manner of mischiefs read but bale's catalogue of sodomites at the visitation of abbeys here in england henry stephanus his apologia pro herodito that which ulricus writes in one of his epistles that pope gregory when he saw six hundred skulls and bones of infants taken out of a fish-pond near a nunnery thereupon retracted that decree of priests marriages which was the cause of such a slaughter was much grieved at it and purged himself by repentance read many such and then ask what is to be done is this vow to be broke or not no saith bellarmine chapter thirty eight book de monachi melius est scortari et uriquam de voto celibatus ad nuptias transire better burn or fly out than to break thy vow and coster in his 
enchiridion de celibatu sacerdotum saith it is absolutely gravius peccatum a greater sin for a priest to marry than to keep a concubine at home gregory de valence chapter six de colibatu maintains the same as those of essay and montanists of old insomuch that many votaries out of a false persuasion of merit and holiness in this kind will sooner die than marry though it be to the saving of their lives anno fourteen nineteen pius the second pope james rosa nephew to the king of portugal and then elect archbishop of lisbon being very sick at florence when his physicians told him that his disease was such he must either lie with a wench marry or die cheerfully chose to die now they commended him for it but saint paul teacheth otherwise better marry than burn and as saint jerome gravely delivers it aleae sunt leges caesarum aleae christi aliud papinianus aliud paulus noster praecipit there's a difference betwixt god's ordinances and men's laws and therefore cyprian epistola eight boldly denounceth impium est adulterum est sacrilegum est quodcunque humano furore statuetur ut dispositio divina violetur it is abominable impious adulterous and sacrilegious what men make and ordain after their own furies to cross god's laws georgius wicelius one of their own arch divines inspectionis ecclesiae page eighteen exclaims against it and all such rash monastical vows and would have such persons seriously to consider what they do whom they admit ne in posterum querantur de inanibus stupris lest they repent it at last for either as he follows it you must allow them concubines or suffer them to marry for scarce shall you find three priests of three thousand qui per aetatem non ament that are not troubled with burning lust wherefore i conclude it is an unnatural and impious thing to bar men of this christian liberty too severe and inhuman an edict the silly wren the titmouse also the little red breast have their election they fly i saw and together gone whereas them list about environ as they of kind have inclination and as nature impress and guide of everything list to provide but man alone alas the hard stoned full cruelly by kind's ordinance constrained is and by statutes bound and debarred from all such pleasance what meaneth this what is this pretence of laws i wis against all right of kind without a cause so narrow men to bind many laymen repine still at priests marriages above the rest and not at clergymen only but of all the meaner sort and condition they would have none marry but such as are rich and able to maintain wives because their parish belike shall be pestered with orphans and the world full of beggars but these are hard-hearted unnatural monsters of men shallow politicians they do not consider that a great part of the world is not yet inhabited as it ought how many colonies into america terra australis incognita africa may be sent let them consult with sir william alexander's book of colonies 
Orpheus Jr.'s Golden Fleece, Captain Whitburn, Mr. Hagthorpe, etc., and they shall surely be otherwise informed. Those politic Romans were of another mind. They thought their city and country could never be too populous. Adrian the emperor said he had rather have men than money. Male se hominum adjectione ampliare imperium quam pecunia. Augustus Caesar made an oration in Rome, ad caelibus, to persuade them to marry. Some countries compelled them to marry of old, as Jews, Turks, Indians, Chinese, amongst the rest in these days who much wonder at our discipline to suffer so many idle persons to live in monasteries, and often marvel how they can live honest. In the Isle of Marignan, the governor and petty king there did wonder at the Frenchmen, and admire how so many friars and the rest of their company could live without wives, they thought it a thing impossible and would not believe it. If these men should but survey our multitudes of religious houses, observe our numbers of monasteries all over Europe, eighteen nunneries in Padua, in Venice thirty-four cloisters of monks, twenty-eight of nuns, etc. Ex ungue leonem, tis to this proportion in all other provinces and cities, what would they think? Do they live honest? Let them dissemble as they will, I am of Tertullian's mind, that few can continue but by compulsion. O chastity, saith he, thou art a rare goddess in the world, not so easily got, seldom continue it. Thou mayst now and then be compelled, either for defect of nature, or, if discipline persuade, decrees enforce, or for some such by respects, sullenness, discontent, they have lost their first loves, may not have whom they will themselves, want of means, rash vows, etc. But can he willingly contain? I think not. Therefore, either out of commiseration of human imbecility, impolicy, or to prevent a far worse inconvenience, for they hold some of them as necessary as meat and drink, and because vigour of youth, the state and temper of most men's bodies do so furiously desire it, they have heretofore in some nations liberally admitted polygamy and stews, a hundred thousand courtesans in Grand Cairo in Egypt, as Radzivilius observes, are tolerated besides boys. How many at Fez, Rome, Naples, Florence, Venice, etc., and still in many other provinces and cities of Europe they do as much, because they think young men, churchmen, and servants amongst the rest can hardly live honest. The consideration of this belike made Ribius the Spaniard, when his friend Crassus, that rich Roman gallant, lay hid in the cave, ut voluptatis quam aetas illa desiderat copiam faceret, to gratify him the more, send two lusty lasses to accompany him all that while he was there imprisoned, and Surenus, the Parthian general, when he warred against the Romans, to carry about with him two hundred concubines, as the Swiss soldiers do now commonly their wives. But because this course is not generally approved, but rather contradicted as unlawful and abhorred, in most countries they do much encourage them to marriage, give great rewards to such as have many children, and mulct those that will not marry. Justrium liberorum. And in Agellius, Book 2, Chapter 15, Aelianus, 
book six chapter five valerius book one chapter nine we read that three children freed the father from painful offices and five from all contribution a woman shall be saved by bearing children epictetus would have all marry and as plato will six de legibus he that marrieth not before thirty-five years of his age must be compelled and punished and the money consecrated to juno's temple or applied to public uses they account him in some countries unfortunate that dies without a wife a most unhappy man as boethius infers and if at all happy yet infortunio felix unhappy in his supposed happiness they commonly deplore his estate and much lament him for it o oh, my sweet son etc see lucian de luctu sans folio eighty three etc yet notwithstanding many with us are of the opposite part they are married themselves and for others let them burn fire and flame they care not so they be not troubled with them some are too curious and some too covetous they may marry when they will both for ability and means but so nice that except as theophilus the emperor was presented by his mother euprosyne with all the rarest beauties of the empire in the great chamber of his palace at once and bid to give a golden apple to her he liked best if they might so take and choose whom they list out of all the fair maids their nation affords they could happily condescend to marry otherwise etc why should a man marry saith another epicurean rout what's matrimony but a matter of money why should free nature be entrenched on confined or obliged to this or that man or woman with these manacles of body and goods etc there are those too that dearly love admire and follow women all their lives long sponsi penelopes never well but in their company wistly gazing on their beauties observing close hanging after them dallying still with them and yet dare not will not marry many poor people and of the meaner sort are too distrustful of god's providence they will not dare not for such worldly respects fear of want woes miseries or that they shall light as lemnius saith on a scold a slut or a bad wife and therefore tristem juventam venere deserta colunt they are resolved to live single as epimenondas did nil ait esse prius melius nil celebe vita and ready with hippolytus to abjure all women detestor omnes horeo fugio execror etc but Hippolite nescis quod fugis vitae bonum Hippolite nescis. Alas, poor Hippolytus, thou knowest not what thou sayest, tis otherwise, Hippolytus. Some make a doubt, an uxor literato sit ducenda, whether a scholar should marry. If she be fair, she will bring him back from his grammar to his horn-book, or else with kissing and dalliance she will hinder his study if foul with scolding he cannot well intend to do both as philippus beroaldus that great bononian doctor once writ impediri enim studia literarum etc but he recanted at last and in a solemn sort 
with true conceived words he did ask the world and all women forgiveness but you shall have the story as he relates himself in his commentaries on the sixth of apuleius for a long time i lived a single life et ab uxore ducenda semper ab horui nec quisquam libero lecto censui jucundius i could not abide marriage but as a rambler erraticus ac volaticus amator to use his own words per multiplices amores discorebam i took a snatch where i could get it nay more i railed at marriage downright and in a public auditory when i did interpret that sixth satire of juvenal out of plutarch and seneca i did heap up all the dictaries i could against women but now recant with stesichorus palinodium cano nec prenitat censeri in ordine maritorum i approve of marriage i am glad i am a married man i am heartily glad i have a wife so sweet a wife so noble a wife so young so chaste a wife so loving a wife and i do wish and desire all other men to marry and especially scholars that as of old martia did by hortensius terentia by tullius calphurnia to plinius pudentilla to apulius hold the candle whilst their husbands did meditate and write so theirs may do them and as my dear camilla doth to me let other men be averse rail then and scoff at women and say what they can to the contrary vir sine uxore malorum expers est etc a single man is a happy man etc but this is a toy nec dulces amores sperne puer neque tu coreas these men are too distrustful and much to blame to use such speeches parcite paucorum defundere crimen in omnes they must not condemn all for some as there be many bad there be some good wives as some be vicious some be virtuous read what solomon hath said in their praises proverbs thirteen and Siracides, chapter twenty six and thirty blessed is the man that hath a virtuous wife for the number of his days shall be double a virtuous woman rejoiceth her husband and she shall fulfil the years of his life in peace a good wife is a good portion and thirty six twenty four an help a pillar of rest columna quietus qui capit uxorem fratrem capit atque sororem and thirty he that hath no wife wandereth to and fro mourning minuuntur atrae conjuge curae women are the soul only joy and comfort of a man's life born ad usum et lusum hominum firmamenta familiae delitiae humani generis solatia vitae blanditiae noctis placidissima cura diei vota virum juvenum spes etc a wife is a young man's mistress a middle ages companion an old man's nurse particeps laetorum et tristium a prop a help etc optima viri possessio est uxor benevola mitigans iram et avertens animam eius atristitia man's best possession is a loving wife she tempers anger and diverts all strife there is no joy no comfort no sweetness no pleasure in the world like to that of a good wife quam cum cara domi coniux fidusque maritus unanimes degunt 
saith our latin homer she is still the same in sickness and in health his eye his hand his bosom friend his partner at all times his other self not to be separated by any calamity but ready to share all sorrow discontent and as the indian women do live and die with him nay more to die presently for him admetus king of thessaly when he lay upon his deathbed was told by apollo's oracle that if he could get anybody to die for him he should live longer yet but when all refused his parents etsi decrepiti friends and followers forsook him alcestus his wife though young most willingly undertook it what more can be desired or expected and although on the other side there be an infinite number of bad husbands i should rail downright against some of them able to discourage any women yet there be some good ones again and those most observant of marriage rights an honest country fellow as fulgosus relates it in the kingdom of naples at plough by the seaside saw his wife carried away by mauritanian pirates he ran after in all haste up to the chin first and when he could wade no longer swam calling to the governor of the ship to deliver his wife or if he must not have her restored to let him follow as a prisoner for he was resolved to be a galley slave his drudge willing to endure any misery so that he might but enjoy his dear wife the moors seeing the man's constancy and relating the whole matter to their governors at tunis set them both free and gave them an honest pension to maintain themselves during their lives i could tell many stories to this effect but put case it often prove otherwise because marriage is troublesome wholly therefore to avoid it is no argument he that will avoid trouble must avoid the world eusebius praeparatio evangelica five chapter fifty some trouble there is in marriage i deny not et si grave sit matrimonium saith erasmus edulcatur tamen multis etc yet there be many things to sweeten it a pleasant wife placens uxor pretty children dulces nati deliciae filorum hominum the chief delight of the sons of men ecclesiastes two eight etc and howsoever though it were all troubles utilitatis publicae causa devorandum grave quid libenter subeundum it must willingly be undergone for public good's sake audite populus haec inquit susarion malae sunt mulieres veruntamen o populares hoc sine malo domum in habitare non licet hear me o my countrymen saith susarion women are not yet no life without one malum est mulier sed necessarium malum they are necessary evils and for our own ends we must make use of them to have issue supplet venus ac restituit humanum genus and to propagate the church for to what end is a man born why lives he but to increase the world and how shall he do that well if he do not marry matrimonium humano generi immortalitatem tribuit saith nevisanus matrimony makes us immortal and according to tacitus tis firmissimum imperii munimentum 
the sole and chief prop of an empire indigne vivit per quem non vivit et alter which pelopidas objected to epiminondas he was an unworthy member of a commonwealth that left not a child after him to defend it and as trismegistus to his son tatius have no commerce with a single man holding belike that a bachelor could not live honestly as he should and with georgius wicelius a great divine and holy man who of late by twenty-six arguments commends marriage as a thing most necessary for all kinds of persons most laudable and fit to be embraced and is persuaded withal that no man can live and die religiously and as he ought without a wife persuasus neminem posse neque pie vivere neque bene mori citra uxorem he is false an enemy to the commonwealth injurious to himself destructive to the world an apostate to nature a rebel against heaven and earth let our wilful obstinate and stale bachelors ruminate of this if we could live without wives as marcellus numidicus said in agelius we would all want them but because we cannot let all marry and consult rather to the public good than their own private pleasure or estate it were a happy thing as wise euripides hath it if we could buy children with gold and silver and be so provided sine mulierum congressu without women's company but that may not be orbis jacebit squalido turpis situ vanum sine ulis classibus stabit mare alesque celo deerit et silvis fera earth air sea land eft soon would come to naught the world itself should be to ruin brought necessity therefore compels us to marry but what do i trouble myself to find arguments to persuade to or commend marriage behold a brief abstract of all that which i have said and much more succinctly pithily pathetically perspicuously and elegantly delivered in twelve motions to mitigate the miseries of marriage by jacobus de voragine primus res est habes quae tueatur et augeat secundus non est habes quae quaerat tertius secundae res sunt felicitas duplicatur quartus adversae sunt consolatur adsidet onus participat ut tolerabile fiat quintus domi es solitudinis taedium pellit sextus foras discedentem visu prosequitur absentem desiderat redeuntem laeta excipit septimus nihil jocundum absque societate nulla societas matrimonio suavior octavus vinculum conjugalis caritatis adamantinum nonus acrescit dulcis affinium turba duplicatur numerus parentum fratrum sororum nepotum decimus pulcra sis prole parents undecimus lex mosis sterilitatem matrimonii execratur quanto amplius celebatum duodecimus si natura poenam non effugit ne voluntas quidem effugiet one hast thou means thou hast one to keep and increase it two hast none thou hast one to help to get it three 
art in prosperity, thine happiness is doubled. 4. Art in adversity, shall comfort, assist, bear a part of thy burden to make it more tolerable. 5. Art at home, shall drive away melancholy. 6. Art abroad, she looks after thee going from home, wishes for thee in thine absence, and joyfully welcomes thy return. 7. There's nothing delightsome without society, no society so sweet as matrimony. 8. The band of conjugal love is adamantine. 9. The sweet company of kinsmen increaseth, the number of parents is doubled, of brothers, sisters, nephews. 10. Thou art made a father by a fair and happy issue. 11. Moses curseth the barrenness of matrimony, how much more a single life. 12. If nature escape not punishment, surely thy will shall not avoid it. All this is true, say you, and who knows it not? But how easy a matter it is to answer these motives, and to make an antiparodia quite opposite unto it. To exercise myself, I will essay. 1. Hast thou means? Thou hast one to spend it. 2. Hast none. Thy beggary is increased. 3. Art in prosperity. Thy happiness is ended. 4. Art in adversity. Like Job's wife shall aggravate thy misery, vex thy soul, make thy burden intolerable. 5 art at home, she'll scold thee out of doors. 6. Art abroad, if thou be wise, keep thee so, she'll perhaps graft horns in thine absence, scowl on thee coming home. 7. Nothing gives more content than solitariness, no solitariness like this of a single life. 8. The band of marriage is adamantine, no hope of loosing it, thou art undone. 9. Thy number increaseth, thou shalt be devoured by thy wife's friends. 10. Thou art made a cornuto by an unchaste wife, and shalt bring up other folk's children instead of thine own. 11. Paul commends marriage, yet he prefers a single life. 12. Is marriage honorable? What an immortal crown belongs to virginity? So Siracides himself speaks as much as may be for and against women, so doth almost every philosopher plead pro and con every poet thus argues the case though what cares vulgus hominum what they say so can i conceive peradventure and so canst thou when all is said yet since some be good some bad let's put it to the venture i conclude therefore with seneca cur toro viduo jaces Tristem juventam solve, nunc luxus rape, effunde habenas, optimos vitae dies, effluere prohibe. Why dost thou lie alone, let thy youth and best days to pass away? Marry whilst thou mayst, donec viventi canities abest morosa, whilst thou art yet able, yet lusty. Elige cui dicas, tu mihi sola plaques. Make thy choice, and that freely, forthwith, make no delay, but take thy fortune as it falls. Tis true. 
calamitosus est qui inciderit in malam uxorem, felix qui in bonam. Tis a hazard both ways, I confess, to live single or to marry. Nam et uxorem ducere et non ducere malum est. It may be bad, it may be good, as it is a cross and calamity on the one side, so tis a sweet delight, an incomparable happiness, a blessed estate, a most unspeakable benefit, a soul content on the other. Tis all in the proof. Be not then so wayward, so covetous, so distrustful, so curious and nice, but let's all marry, mutuos foentes amplexus. Take me to thee, and thee to me. Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day. Let's keep it holiday for Cupid's sake, for that great God love's sake, for Hymen's sake, and celebrate Venus's vigil with our ancestors for company together, singing as they did. Crasam et quinunquam amavit, quique amavit, cras amet, ver novum, ver jam canorum, ver natus orbis est, vere concordant amores, vere nubunt alites, et nemus coma resolvit, etc. Cras amet, etc. Let those love now who never loved before, and those who always loved now love the more. Sweet loves are born with every opening spring, birds from the tender boughs their pledges sing, etc. Let him that is averse from marriage read more in Barbarus de Re Uxoria, Book One, Chapter One, Lemnius de Institutione, Chapter Four, Petrus Godefridus de Amoribus, Book Three, Chapter One, Nevisanus, Book Three, Alexandrus ab Alexandro, Book Four, Chapter Eight, Tunstall, Erasmus's Tracts in Laudem Matrimonii, etc., and I doubt not but in the end he will rest satisfied, recant with Beroaldus, do penance for his former folly, singing some penitential ditties, desire to be reconciled to the deity of this great god love, go a pilgrimage to his shrine, offer to his image, sacrifice upon his altar, and be as willing at last to embrace marriage as the rest. There will not be found, I hope, no, not in that severe family of Stoics, who shall refuse to submit his grave beard and supercilious looks to the clipping of a wife, or disagree from his fellows in this point. For what more willingly, as Varro holds, can a proper man see than a fair wife, a sweet wife, a loving wife? Can the world afford a better sight, sweeter content, a fairer object, a more gracious aspect? Since then this of marriage is the last and best refuge and cure of heroical love, all doubts are cleared and impediments removed. I say again, what remains, but that according to both their desires they be happily joined, since it cannot otherwise be helped. God send us all, good wives, every man his wish in this kind, and me mine. And God, that all this world hath wrought, send him his love that hath it so dear bought. If all parties be pleased, ask their bands, tis a match. Fruitur Rodante sponsa, sponso dosicle. Rodantha and Dosicles shall go together, Clitiphon and Leucippe, Theagines and Chariclea, Polyarchus hath his Argenis, Lysander Callista, to make up the mask. Potiturque sua puer ifis iante, 
and troilus in lust and in quiet is with creseid his own heart sweet and although they have hardly passed the pikes through many difficulties and delays brought the match about yet let them take this of aristenatus that so marry for their comfort after many troubles and cares the marriages of lovers are more sweet and pleasant as we commonly conclude a comedy with a wedding and shaking of hands let's shut up our discourse and end all with an epithalamium feliciter nuptis god give them joy together hymen o hymenae hymen ades o hymenae bonum factum tis well done haud equidem sive mentereor sive numine divum tis a happy conjunction a fortunate match an even couple ambo animis ambo praestantes viribus ambo florentes anis they both excel in gifts of body and mind are both equal in years youth vigour alacrity she is fair and lovely as lais or helen he as another carinus or alcibiades ludite ut lubet et brevi liberos date then modestly go sport and toy and let's have every year a boy go give a sweet smell as incense and bring forth flowers as the lily that we may say hereafter scitus me castor natus est pamphilo puer in the meantime i say ite agite o juvenis non murmura vestra columbae brachia non hederae neque vincant oscula concae gentle youths go sport yourselves betimes let not the doves outpass your murmurings or ivy clasping arms or oyster kissings and in the morn betime as those lacedaemonian lasses saluted helena and menelaus singing at their windows and wishing good success do we at yours salve o sponsa salve felix det vobis latona felicem sobolem venus dea det aequalem amorem inter vos mutuo saturnus durabiles divitias dormite in pectora mutuo amorem inspirantes et desiderium good morrow master bridegroom and mistress bride many fair lovely bairns to you betide let venus to you mutual love procure let saturn give you riches to endure long may you sleep in one another's arms inspiring sweet desire and free from harms even all your lives long contingat vobis torturam concordia corniculae vivacitas the love of turtles hap to you and ravens years still to renew let the muses sing as he said the graces dance not at their weddings only but all their days long so couple their hearts that no irksomeness or anger ever befall them let him never call her other name than my joy my light or she call him otherwise than sweetheart to this happiness of theirs let not old age any whit detract but as their years so let their mutual love and comfort increase and when they depart this life concordes quoniam vixere tot annos auferat hora duos eadem nec conjugis usquam busta suae videat nec sit tumulandus ab illa because they have so sweetly lived together let not one die a day before the other he bury her she him with even fate one hour their souls let jointly separate 
fortunati ambo si quid mea carmina possunt nulla dies unquam memori vos eximet aevo atque haec de amore dixi se sufficiat sub correctione quod ait ille cuiusque melius sentientis plura qui volet de remediis amoris legat jasonem pratensem arnoldum montaltum savanarolum langium valescum crimisonum alexandrum benedictum laurentium valeriolam e poetis nasonem e nostratibus chaucerum etc with whom i conclude for my words here and every part i speak them all under correction of you that feeling have in love's art and put it all in your discretion to entreat or make diminution of my language that i you beseech but now to purpose of my rather speech End of section 27section twenty eight of the anatomy of melancholy volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by morgan scorpion the anatomy of melancholy volume three by robert burton section twenty eight partition three section three member one subsection one Jealousy, its equivocations. Name, definition, extent, several kinds, of princes, parents, friends. In beasts, men, before marriage, as co-rivals, or after, as in this place. Valescus de Taranta, Aelian Montaltus, Felix Platerus, Guianerius, put jealousy for a cause of melancholy, others for a symptom, because melancholy persons amongst these passions and perturbations of the mind are most obnoxious to it. But methinks for the latitude it hath, and that prerogative above other ordinary symptoms, it ought to be treated of as a species apart, being of so great and eminent note, so furious a passion, and almost of as great extent as love itself, as Benedetto Varchi holds. No love without a mixture of jealousy, qui non zelat, non amat for these causes i will dilate and treat of it by itself as a bastard branch or kind of love melancholy which as heroical love goeth commonly before marriage doth usually follow torture and crucify in like sort deserves therefore to be rectified alike requires as much care and industry in setting out the several causes of it prognostics and cures which i have more willingly done that he that is or hath been jealous may see his error as in a glass he that is not may learn to detest avoid it himself and dispossess others that are anywise affected with it jealousy is described and defined to be a certain suspicion which the lover hath of the party he chiefly loveth lest he or she should be enamoured of another or any eager desire to enjoy some beauty alone to have it proper to himself only a fear or doubt lest any foreigner should participate or share with him in his love or as scaliger adds a fear of losing her favour whom he so earnestly affects cardan calls it a zeal for love and a kind of envy lest any man should beguile us ludovicus vives defines it in the very same words or as little differing in sense there may be other jealousies but improperly so called as that of parents tutors guardians over their children friends whom they love or such as are left to their wardship or protection storax non reddit hac nocte a coena e skinus neque servulorum quispiam qui adversum lirant as the old man in the comedy cried out in a passion and from a solicitor's fear and care he had of his adopted son not of beauty but lest they should miscarry do amiss 
or any way discredit, disgrace, as Vives notes, or endanger themselves and us. Aegeus was so solicitous for his son Theseus, when he went to fight with the Minotaur, of his success, lest he should be foiled. Prona est timor semper in pages fides. We are still apt to suspect the worst in such doubtful cases, as many wives in their husband's absence, fond mothers in their children's, lest if absent they should be misled or sick, and are continually expecting news from them, how they do fare, and what is become of them. They cannot endure to have them long out of their sight. O oh, my sweet son, O oh, my dear child, etc. Paul was jealous over the church of Corinth, as he confesseth to Corinthians 11.12, with a godly jealousy, to present them a pure virgin to Christ, and he was afraid still, lest as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so their minds should be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. God himself, in some sense, is said to be jealous. I am a jealous God, and will visit. So Psalm 76.5 Shall thy jealousy burn like a fire for ever? But these are improperly called jealousies, and by a metaphor, to show the care and solicitude they have of them. Although some jealousies express all the symptoms of this which we treat of, fear, sorrow, anguish, anxiety, suspicion, hatred, etc., the object only varied. That of some fathers is very eminent to their sons and heirs, for though they love them dearly being children, yet now coming towards man's estate they may not well abide them. The son and heir is commonly sick of the father, and the father again may not well brook his eldest son. Inde simultates, plerumque contentiones et inimicitiae. But that of princes is most notorious, as when they fear co-rivals, if I may so call them, successors, emulators, subjects, or such as they have offended. Omnisque potestas impatiens consortis erit. They are still suspicious lest their authority should be diminished. As one observes, and as Comenius hath it, it cannot be expressed what slender causes they have of their grief and suspicion, a secret disease that commonly lurks and breeds in princes' families. Sometimes it is for their honour only, as that of Adrian the emperor, that killed all his emulators. Saul envied David. Domitian Agricola, because he did excel him, obscure his honour, as he thought, eclipse his fame. Juno turned Praetius' daughters into kine, for that they contended with her for beauty. Ciparisi, King Etiocles' children, were envied of the goddesses for their excellent good parts, and dancing amongst the rest, saith Constantine, and for that cause flung headlong from heaven, and buried in a pit, but the earth took pity of them, and brought out cypress trees to preserve their memories. Niobe, Arachne, and Marcius can testify as much. But it is most grievous when it is for a kingdom itself, or matters of commodity. It produceth lamentable effects, especially amongst tyrants, in despotico imperio, and such as are more feared than beloved of their subjects, that get and keep their sovereignty by force and fear. Quod civibus tenere ten invitis theus, etc., as Philaris Dionysius, Periander held theirs. For though fear, cowardice, and jealousy, in Plutarch's opinion, be the common causes of tyranny, as in Nero, Caligula, Tiberius, yet most take them to be symptoms. For what slave, what hangman, as Bodine well expresseth this passion, can so cruelly torture a condemned person as this fear and suspicion. Fear of death, infamy, torments, are those furies and vultures that vex and disquiet tyrants, and torture them day and night, with perpetual terrors and affrights, envy, suspicion, fear, desire of revenge, and a thousand such disagreeing perturbations, turn and affright the soul out of the hinges of health, and more grievously wound and pierce. Then those cruel masters can exasperate and vex their apprentices or servants, with clubs, whips, chains, and tortures. Many terrible examples we have in this kind, amongst the Turks especially, many jealous outrages. Selimus kills Cornutus, his youngest brother, five of his nephews, Mustafa Bassa, and diverse others. Bajazet, the second Turk, jealous of the valour and greatness of Ahmed Bassa, caused him to be slain. 
Suleiman the Magnificent murdered his own son Mustafa, and tis an ordinary thing amongst them to make away their brothers or any competitors at the first coming to the crown. Tis all the solemnity they use at their father's funerals. What mad pranks, in his jealous fury, did Herod of old commit in Jewry, when he massacred all the children of a year old? Valens, the emperor in Constantinople, when as he left no man alive of quality in his kingdom, that had his name begun with Theo, Theodoti, Theognosti, Theodosi, Theoduli, etc., they went all to their long home, because a wizard told him that name should succeed in his empire. And what furious designs hath Johannes Basilius, that Moscovian tyrant, practised of late? It is a wonder to read that strange suspicion, which Suetonius reports of Claudius Caesar, and of Domitian. They were afraid of every man they saw, and which Herodian of Antoninus and Geta, those two jealous brothers, the one could not endure so much as the other's servants, but made him away, his chiefest followers, and all that belonged to him, or were his well-wishers. Maximinus, perceiving himself to be odious to most men, because he was come that height of honour out of base beginnings, and suspecting his mean parentage would be objected to him, caused all the senators that were nobly descended to be slain in a jealous humour, turned all the servants of Alexander his predecessor out of doors, and slew many of them, because they lamented their master's death, suspecting them to be traitors, for the love they bare to him. When Alexander in his fury had made Clytus his dear friend to be put to death, and saw now, says Curtius, an alienation in his subjects' hearts, none durst talk with him, he began to be jealous of himself, lest they should attempt as much on him, and said that they lived like so many wild beasts in a wilderness, one afraid of another. Our modern stories afford us many notable examples. Henry the Third of France, jealous of Henry of Lorraine, Duke of Guise, anno 1588, caused him to be murdered in his own chamber. Louis the Eleventh was so suspicious he durst not trust his children. Every man about him he suspected for a traitor. Many strange tricks Comenaeus telleth of him. How jealous was our Henry the Fourth of King Richard the Second, so long as he lived, after he was deposed, and of his own son Henry, in his latter days, which the prince, well perceiving, came to visit his father in his sickness, in a watchet velvet gown, full of eyelet holes, and with needles sticking in them, as an emblem of jealousy, and so pacified his suspicious father, after some speeches and protestations which he had used to that purpose. Perpetual imprisonment, as that of Robert, Duke of Normandy, in the days of Henry I, forbidding of marriage to some persons, with such like edicts and prohibitions, are ordinary in all states. In a word, as he said, three things cause jealousy a mighty state, a rich treasure, a fair wife, or, where there is a cracked title, much tyranny and exactions. In our state, as being freed from all these fears and miseries, we may be most secure and happy under the reign of our fortunate prince. His fortune hath indebted him to none, but to all his people universally, and not to them but for their love alone, which they account as placed worthily, he is so set. He hath no cause to be jealous, or dreadful of disloyalty. The pedestal whereon his greatness stands is held of all our hearts and all our hands. But I rove, I confess, these equivocations, jealousies, and many such which crucify the souls of men, are not here properly meant, or in this distinction of ours included, but that alone which is for beauty, tending to love, and wherein they can brook no co-rival, or endure any participation and this jealousy belongs as well to brute beasts as men. Such creatures, saith Bivies, swans, doves, cocks, bulls, etc., are jealous as well as men, and as much moved for fear of communion. Grege pro toto bella ju juvenci, si con jugio timuere suo, poscunt timidi praelia curvi, et mugitus dan concepti signa furoris. In Venus's cause what mighty battles make your raving bulls, and stirs for their herd's sake, and hearts and bucks that are so timorous, will fight and roar, if once they be but jealous. In bulls, horses, goats, this is most apparently discerned, bulls especially, allium in pasculis non admitit, 
he will not admit another bull to feed in the same pasture, saith Oppin, which Stephanus Bathorius, late king of Poland, used as an impress, with that motto, Regnum non capit duos. R.T., in his Blazon of Jealousy, telleth a story of a swan about Windsor, that finding a strange cock with his mate, did swim I know not how many miles after to kill him, and when he had so done, came back and killed his hen. A certain truth, he said, done upon Thames as many watermen and neighbour gentlemen can tell. Fidem suam liberet, for my part. I do believe it may be true, for swans have ever been branded with that epithet of jealousy. The jealous swan against his death that singeth, and eke the owl that of death bold bringeth. Some say as much of elephants, that they are more jealous than any other creatures whatsoever, and those old Egyptians, as Pierius informeth us, express in their hieroglyphics, the passion of jealousy by a camel, because that fearing the worst still about matters of venery, he loves solitudes, that he may enjoy his pleasure alone, et in quoscunde obvius insurgit. Zelolipii stimulus agitatus. He will quarrel and fight with whatsoever comes next, man or beast, in his jealous fits. I have read as much of crocodiles, and if Peter Martyr's authority be authentic, you shall have a strange tale to that purpose confidently related. Another story of the jealousy of dogs, see in Hieronymus Fabricius, Tract 3, Chapter 5, De Loquela Animalium. But this furious passion is most eminent in men, and is as well amongst bachelors as married men. If it appear amongst bachelors, we commonly call them rivals, or co-rivals, a metaphor derived from a river, rivales, a rivo, for as a river, saith Aquon in Horace's Ars Poetica, and Donatus in Terence's Eunuch, divides a common ground between two men, and both participate of it, so is a woman indifferent between two suitors, both likely to enjoy her. And thence comes this emulation, which breaks out many times into tempestuous storms, and produceth lamentable effects. Murder itself, with much cruelty, many single combats. They cannot endure the least injury done unto them before their mistress, and in her defence will bite off one another's noses. They are most impatient of any flout, disgrace, lest emulation or participation in that kind. Lacerat lacerium, largi mordax memnius. Memnius the Roman, as Tully tells the story, de oratore book two, being co rival with Largus Terracina, bit him by the arm, which fact of his was so famous that it afterwards grew to a proverb in those parts. Phaedria could not abide his co rival Thraso, for when Parmeno demanded, numquid aliud imperas, whether he would command him any more service, no more, says he, but to speak in his behalf and to drive away his co-rival if he could. Constantine, in the eleventh book of his husbandry, chapter eleven, hath a pleasant tale of the pine tree. She was once a fair maid, whom Pinius and Boreas, two co-rivals, dearly sought, but jealous Boreas broke her neck, etc. And in his eighteenth chapter, he telleth another tale of Mars, that in his jealousy slew Adonis. Petronius calleth this passion amantium furioso emulationum, a furious emulation, and their symptoms are well expressed by Sir Geoffrey Chaucer in his first Canterbury tale. It will make the nearest and dearest friends fall out. They will endure all other things to be common, goods, lands, monies, participate of each pleasure, and take in good part any disgraces, injuries in another kind, but as Propertius well describes it in an elegy of his, in this way they will suffer nothing, have no co-rivals. To mihi vel ferro pectus, vel perde veneno, ad domina tantum te modo toile mea, te socium vitae te corporis esse licebit, te dominum admito rebus amaci meis, lecto te solum, lecto te depreco uno, rivalem possum non ego ferre jovem. Stab me with sword, or poison strong, give me to work my bane. So thou caught not my lass, so thou from mistress mine refrain. Command myself, my body, purse, as thine own goods, take all. 
and as ever my dearest friend i ever use thee shall o oh, spare my love to have alone her to myself i crave nay jove himself i'll not endure my rival for to have this jealousy which i am to treat of is that which belongs to married men in respect of their own wives to whose estate as no sweetness pleasure happiness can be compared in the world if they live quietly and lovingly together so if they disagree or be jealous those bitter pills of sorrow and grief disastrous mischiefs mischances tortures gripings discontents are not to be separated from them a most violent passion it is where it taketh place an unspeakable torment a hellish torture an infernal plague as ariosto calls it a fury a continual fever full of suspicion fear and sorrow a martyrdom a mirth-marring monster the sorrow and grief of heart of one woman jealous of another is heavier than death ecclesiasticus twenty eight six as penina did hannah vex her and upbraid her sore tis a main vexation a most intolerable burden a corrosive to all content a frenzy a madness itself as benedito varchi proves out of that select sonnet of giovanni de la casa that reverend lord as he styles him End of section 28section twenty nine of the anatomy of melancholy volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by morgan scorpion the anatomy of melancholy volume three by robert burton section twenty nine partition three section three member one subsection two part one causes of jealousy who are most apt idleness melancholy impotency long absence beauty wantonness naught themselves allurements from time place persons bad usage causes astrologers make the stars a cause or sign of this bitter passion and out of every man's horoscope will give a probable conjecture whether he will be jealous or no and at what time by direction of the significators to their several promises their aphorisms are to be read in albubata pontanus scona junctine etc bodine chapter five ascribes a great cause to the country or clime and discourseth largely there of this subject saying that southern men are more hot lascivious and jealous than such as live in the north they can hardly contain themselves in those hotter climes, but are most subject to prodigious lust. Leo Appa telleth incredible things almost, of the lust and jealousy of his countrymen of Africa, and especially such as live about Carthage, and so doth every geographer of them in Asia, Turkey, Spaniards, Italians. Germany hath not so many drunkards, England tobacconists, France dancers, Holland mariners, as italy alone hath jealous husbands and in italy some account them of piacenza more jealous than the rest in germany france britain scandia poland muscovy they are not so troubled with this feral malady although damianus argoas which i do much wonder at in his topography of lapland and herbestein of russia against the stream of all other geographers would fasten it upon those northern inhabitants Altomarius Poggius, and Munster in his description of Baden, reports that men and women of all sorts go commonly into the baths together, without all suspicion. The name of jealousy, saith Munster, is not so much as once heard of among them. In Friesland the women kiss him they drink to, and are kissed again of those they pledge. The virgins in Holland go hand in hand with young men from home, glide on the ice, such is their harmless liberty and lodge together abroad without suspicion which rash sansovinus an italian makes a great sign of unchastity in france upon small acquaintance it is usual to court other men's wives to come to their houses and accompany them arm in arm in the streets without imputation 
in the most northern countries young men and maids familiarly dance together men and their wives which siena only excepted italians may not abide the greeks on the other side have their private baths for men and women where they must not come near nor so much as see one another and as bodine observes book five de republica the italians could never endure this or a spaniard the very conceit of it would make them mad and for that cause they lock up their women and will not suffer them to be near men so much as in the church but with a partition between he telleth moreover how that when he was ambassador in england he heard mendoza the spanish legate finding fault with it as a filthy custom for men and women to sit promiscuously in churches together but dr dale the master of the requests told him again that it was indeed a filthy custom in spain where they could not contain themselves from lascivious thoughts in their holy places but not with us baronius in his annals out of eusebius taxeth licinus the emperor for a decree of his made to this effect jubens neviri simul cum mulieribus in ecclesia interessant for being prodigiously naught himself allorum naturum ex sua vitiosa mente spectavit he so esteemed others but we are far from any such strange conceit and will permit our wives and daughters to go to the tavern with a friend as urbanus saith modo absit lascivia and suspect nothing to kiss coming and going which as erasmus writes in one of his epistles they cannot endure england is a paradise for women and hell for horses italy a paradise for horses hell for women as the diverb goes some make a question whether this headstrong passion rage more in women than men as montaigne one three but sure it is more outrageous in women as all other melancholy is by reason of the weakness of their sex scaliger concludes against women beside their inconstancy treachery suspicion dissimulation superstition pride for all women are by nature proud desire of sovereignty if they be great women he gives instance in juno bitterness and jealousy are the most remarkable affections sed neque fulvus apa media tam fulvus in ira est fulmineo rapidus dum rotat ore canes nec leo etc tiger boar bear viper lioness a woman's fury cannot express some say red-headed women pale-coloured black-eyed and of a shrill voice are most subject to jealousy high colour in a woman colour shows naught are they peevish proud malicious but worst of all red shrill and jealous comparisons are odious i neither parallel them with others nor debase them any more men and women are both bad and too subject to this pernicious infirmity it is most part a symptom and cause of melancholy as plata and valescus teach us melancholy men are apt to be jealous and jealous apt to be melancholy pale jealousy child of insatiate love of heart-sick thoughts which melancholy bred a hell tormenting fear no faith can move by discontent with deadly poison fed with heedless youth and error vainly led a mortal plague a virtue drowning flood a hellish fire not quenched but with blood if idleness concur with melancholy such persons are most apt to be jealous tis nevisanus's note an idle woman is presumed to be lascivious and often jealous mulier cum sola cogitat male cogitat and tis not unlikely for they have no other business to trouble their heads with more particular causes be these which follow impotency first when a man is not able of himself to perform those dues which he ought unto his wife for though he be an honest liver hurt no man yet trebius the lawyer may make a question and suum cuique tribuat whether he give every one their own and therefore when he takes notice of his wants and perceives her to be more craving clamorous insatiable and prone to lust than is fit 
he begins presently to suspect that wherein he is defective she will satisfy herself she will be pleased by some other means cornelius gallus hath elegantly expressed this humour in an epigram to his lycoris jamque alios juvenes aliosque requirit amores me vocat imbellum decrepitumque senem etc for this cause is most evident in old men that are cold and dry by nature and married succi plenis to young wanton wives with old doting janivere in chaucer they begin to mistrust all is not well she was young and he was old and therefore he feared to be a cuckold and how should it otherwise be old age is a disease of itself loathsome full of suspicion and fear when it is at best unable unfit for such matters tam apta nuptius quam bruma mesibus as welcome to a young woman as snow in harvest saith nevisanus et si capis juvenculum faciet tibi cornua marry a lusty maid and she will surely grow horns on thy head all women are slippery often unfaithful to their husbands as aeneas silvius epistula thirty eight seconds him but to old men most treacherous they had rather mortem amplexaria lie with a corpse than such a one oduant illum pueri contemnant mulieris on the other side many men saith hieronymus are suspicious of their wives if they be lightly given but old folks above the rest insomuch that she did not complain without a cause in apuleius of an old bald bedridden knave she had to her good man poor woman as i am what shall i do i have an old grim sire to my husband as bald as a coot as little and as unable as a child a bedful of bones he keeps all the doors barred and locked upon me woe is me what shall i do he was jealous and she made him a cuckold for keeping her up suspicion without a cause hard usage is able of itself to make a woman fly out that was otherwise honest plerasque bonus tractatio pravus esse facit bad usage aggravates the matter nam quando mulieris cognoscunt maritum hoc advertere licentius peccant as nevisanus holds when a woman thinks her husband watcheth her she will sooner offend liberius peccant et puda omnis abest rough handling makes them worse as the good wife of bath in chaucer brag in his own grease i made him fry for anger and for every jealousy of two extremes this of hard usage is the worst tis a great fault for some men are uxorii to be too fond of their wives to dote on them as signor de liro on his falache to be too effeminate or as some do to be sick for their wives breed children for them and like the tiberini lie in for them as some birds hatch eggs by turns they do all women's offices caelius rodinus makes mention of a fellow out of seneca that was so besotted on his wife he could not endure a moment out of her company he wore her scarf when he went abroad next his heart and would never drink but in that cup she began first we have many such fondlings that are their wives pack-horses and slaves nam grave malium uxor superans virum suum as the comical poet hath it there's no greater misery to a man than to let his wife domineer to carry her muff dog and fan let her wear the breeches lay out spend and do what she will go and come whither when she will they give consent here take my muff and do you hear good man now give me pearl and carry you my fan etc poscit palam redimicula in aures cure quid hic cessas vulgo vult illa videri tu pete lecticas many brave and worthy men have trespassed in this kind multos foras claros domestica haec destruxit infamia 
and many noble senators and soldiers, as Pliny notes, have lost their honour, in being uxori, so sottishly overruled by their wives. And therefore Cato in Plutarch made a bitter jest on his fellow citizens, the Romans. We govern all the world abroad, and our wives at home rule us. These offend in one extreme, but too hard and too severe are far more offensive on the other. As just a cause may be a long absence of either party, when they must of necessity be much from home, as lawyers, physicians, mariners, by their professions, or otherwise make frivolous, impertinent journeys, tarry long abroad to no purpose, lie out, and are gadding still, upon small occasions. It must needs yield matter of suspicion, when they use their wives unkindly in the meantime, and never tarry at home. It cannot use but engender some conceit. Uxor si cessus amare te cogitat, aut tote amare, aut potare, aut animal of sequi, ex tibi bene esse soli, quum sibi sit male. If thou be absent long, thy wife then thinks thou art drunk, at ease, or with some pretty minx. Tis well with thee, or else beloved of some, while she, poor soul, doth fare full ill at home. Hippocrates, the physician, had a smack of this disease, for when he was to go home as far as Abdera, and some other remote cities of Greece, he writ to his friend Dionysius, if at least those epistles be his, to oversee his wife in his absence as Apollo set a raven to watch his coronis. Although she lived in his house with her father and mother, who he knew would have a care of her, yet that would not satisfy his jealousy. He would have his special friend Dionysius to dwell in his house with her all the time of his peregrination, and to observe her behaviour, how she carried herself in her husband's absence, and that she did not lust after other men. For a woman had need to have an overseer to keep her honest. They are bad by nature, and lightly given all, and if they be not curbed in time, as an unpruned tree, they will be full of wild branches, and degenerate of a sudden, especially in their husband's absence. Though one Lucretia were trusty, and one Penelope, yet Clytemnestra made Agamemnon cuckold, and no question there be too many of her conditions. If their husbands tarry too long abroad upon unnecessary business, well may they suspect, or if they run one way, their wives at home will fly out another, quid pro quo, or if present, and give them not that content which they ought, primum ingratae, nox invisae noctes quae per somnum transiguntur, they cannot endure to lie alone, or to fast long. Peter Godefridus, in his second book of love, and sixth chapter, hath a story out of St. Anthony's life of a gentleman who by that good man's advice would not meddle with his wife in the passion week but for his pains she set a pair of horns on his head such another he hath out of abstemius one persuaded a new married man to forbear the three first nights and he should all his lifetime after be fortunate in cattle but his impatient wife would not tarry so long well he might speed in cattle but not in children such a tale hath Heinsius of an impotent and slack scholar, a mere student, and a friend of his, that seeing by chance a fine damsel sing and dance, would needs marry her. The match was soon made, for he was young and rich, genis gratus, corpore glabellus, arte multiscius, et fortuna opulentus, like that Apollo in Apuleius. The first night, having liberally taken his liquor, as in that country they do, my fine scholar was so fuzzled that he no sooner was laid in bed, but he fell fast asleep, never waked till morning, and then much abashed, purpureus formosa rosis cum aurora ruberet. When the fair morn with purple hue gan shine, he made an excuse, I know not what, out of Hippocrates cus, etc., and for that time it went current. But when as afterward he did not play the man as he should do, she fell in league with a good fellow, and whilst he sat up late at his study about those criticisms, mending some hard places in Festus or Pollux, came cold to bed, and would tell her still what he had done. 
she did not much regard what he said, etc. She would have another matter mended much rather, which he did not conceive was corrupt. Thus he continued at his study late, she at her sport, alibi enim festivas noctes agitabat, hating all scholars for his sake, till at length he began to suspect, and turned a little yellow as well he might, for it was his own fault, and if men be jealous in such cases, as oft it falls out, the men's is in their own hands, they must thank themselves. Who will pity them, saith Neander, or be much offended with such wives? Si decepti prius viros decipiant, et cornutos redant, if they deceive those that cozened them first. A lawyer's wife in Aristenetus, because her husband was negligent in his business, quando lecto danda opera, threatened to cornute him, and did not stick to tell Philina, one of her gossips as much, and that allowed for him to hear. If he follow other men's matters, and leave his own, I'll have an orator shall plead my cause. I care not if he knew it. End of section 29《30》of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3 by Robert Burton, Section 30. Partition 3, Section 3. Member 1, Subsection 2, Part 2. A fourth eminent cause of jealousy may be this, when he that is deformed, and as Pindarus of Vulcan, sine gratiis natus, hirsute, ragged, yet virtuously given, will marry some fair nice piece, or light housewife, begins to misdoubt, as well he may, she doth not affect him. Lis est cum forma magna pudicitiae. Beauty and honesty have ever been at odds. Abraham was jealous of his wife because she was fair. So was Vulcan of his Venus. When he made her creaking shoes, saith Philostratus, ne macareto sandalio scilicet deferente, that he might hear by them when she stirred, which Mars indigne ferre was not well pleased with. Good cause had Vulcan to do as he did, for she was no honester than she should be. Your fine faces have commonly this fault, and it is hard to find, saith Francis Philelphus in an epistle to Saxola, his friend, a rich man honest, a proper woman not proud or unchaste. Can she be fair and honest too? Saipe et tenim oculuit, picta sese hydra sub herba, sub specie formae, in cauto se saipe marito, necrum animus vendit. He that marries a wife that is snowy fair alone, let him look, saith Barbarus, for no better success than Vulcan had with Venus, or Claudius with Messalina. And it is impossible almost in such cases the wife should contain, or the good man not be jealous, for when he is so defective, weak, ill-proportioned, unpleasing in those parts which women most affect, and she most absolutely fair and able on the other side, if she be not virtuously given, how can she love him? And although she be not fair, yet if he admire her and think her so, in his conceit she is absolute. He holds it impossible for any man living not to dote as he doth, to look on her and not lust, not to covet, and if he be in company with her, not to lay siege to her honesty, or else, out of a deep apprehension of his infirmities, deformities and other men's good parts out of his own little worth and desert he distrusts himself for what is jealousy but distrust he suspects she cannot affect him or be not so kind and loving as she should she certainly loves some other man better than himself nevisanus libro four numero seventy two will have barrenness to be a main cause of jealousy if her husband cannot play the man, some other shall. 
they will leave no remedies unessayed, and thereupon the good man grows jealous. I could give an instance, but be it as it is. I find this reason given by some men, because they have been formerly naught themselves, they think they may be so served by others. They turned up trump before the cards were shuffled. They shall have therefore legem talionis, like for like. Ipse miser docui, quo posset ludere pacto, custodes ehu nunc premor arte mea. Wretch as I was, I taught her bad to be, and now mine own sly tricks are put on me. Mala mens, mala animus, as the saying is, ill dispositions cause ill suspicions. There is none jealous, I durst pawn my life, but he that hath defiled another's wife, and for that he himself hath gone astray, he straightway thinks his wife will tread that way. To these two above-named causes, or incendiaries of this rage, I may very well annex those circumstances of time, place, persons, by which it ebbs and flows, the fuel of this fury. As Vives truly observes, and such like accidents or occasions, proceeding from the parties themselves, or others, which much aggravate and intend this suspicious humour. For many men are so lasciviously given, either out of a depraved nature, or too much liberty, which they do assume unto themselves, by reason of their greatness, in that they are noble men. For licentiae peccandi et multitudo peccantium are great motives. Though their own wives be never so fair, noble, virtuous, honest, wise, able, and well given, they must have change. Qui cum legitimi jugunta facere lecti, virtute egregius, facieque domoque puellis. Scorta tamen, poetasque lupus in fornice querent, et per adulterium nova carpere gaudia tentant who being matched to wives most virtuous, noble and fair, fly out lascivious. Quod licet ingratum est, that which is ordinary is unpleasant. Nero, saith Tacitus, abhorred Octavia, his own wife, a noble virtuous lady, and loved Acte, a base queen in respect. Cerinthus rejected Sulpitia, a nobleman's daughter, and courted a poor servant-maid, Tanta est aliena in messe voluptus, for that stolen waters be more pleasant. Or, as Vitellius the emperor was wont to say, jucundiores amores, qui cum periculo habentur, like stolen venison, still the sweetest is that love which is most difficultly attained. They like better to hunt by stealth in another man's walk, than to have the fairest course that may be at game of their own. Aspice ut in coelo modo sol, modo luno ministret, sic etiam nobis una pella parum est. As sun and moon in heaven change their course, so they change loves, though often to the worse. Or that some fair object so forcibly moves them, they cannot contain themselves, be it heard or seen, they will be at it. Nessus the centaur, was by agreement to carry Hercules and his wife over the river Evenus. No sooner had he set De Janeira on the other side, but he would have offered violence unto her, leaving Hercules to swim over as he could. And though her husband was a spectator, yet would he not desist till Hercules with a poisoned arrow shot him to death. Neptune saw by chance that Thessalian Tyro, Eunipheus's wife, he forthwith, in the fury of his lust, counterfeited her husband's habit, and made him cuckold. Tarquin heard Colatine commend his wife, and was so far enraged, that in the midst of the night to her he went. Theseus stole Ariadne, vi rapuit, that Trazenian Anaxa, Antiope, and now being old, Helen, a girl not yet ready for her husband. Great men are most part thus affected all, as a horse they neigh, saith Jeremiah, after their neighbours' wives, ut visa pullus ad hinit equa, and if they be in company with other women, 
though in their own wives' presence, they must be courting and dallying with them. Juno in Lucian complains of Jupiter that he was still kissing Ganymede before her face, which did not a little offend her. And besides, he was a counterfeit amphitrio, a bull, a swan, a golden shower, and played many such bad pranks, too long, too shameful to relate. Or that they care little for their own ladies, and fear no laws, they dare freely keep whores at their wives' noses. Tis too frequent with noblemen to be dishonest. Pietas, probitas, fides, privata bona sunt, as he said long since. Piety, chastity, and such like virtues are for private men, not to be much looked after in great courts, and which Suetonius of the good princes of his time, they might be all engraven in one ring, we me truly hold of chaste potentates of our age. For great personages will familiarly run out in this kind, and yield occasion of offence. Montaigne, in his essays, give instate in Caesar, Mahomet the Turk that sacked Constantinople, and Ladislas, king of Naples, that besieged Florence. Great men and great soldiers are commonly great, etc. For Bartum est. They are good doers. Mars and Venus are equally balanced in their actions. Militis in Galea nidum fecere columbi, a parrot marti quam sit amica Venus. A dove within a headpiece made her nest. Twixt Mars and Venus see an interest. Especially if they be bold, for bold men have ever been suspicious. Read more in Aristotle, section 4, problem 19, as Galba, Otho, Domitian, and remarkable Caesar amongst the rest. Urbani servate uxores, maecum calvum aducimus. Besides, this bold Caesar, saith Curio in Sueton, was omnium mulierum vir. He made love to Eunoe, queen of Mauritania, to Cleopatra, to Postumia, wife to Sergius Sulpitius, to Lolia, wife to Garbinius, to Tertulla of Crassus, to Mutia, Pompey's wife, and I know not how many besides. And well he might, for, if all be true that I have read, he had a license to lie with whom he list. Inter alios honores Caesari decretos, as Sueton, cap. 52, de Julio, and Dion, libro. 44, relate. Jus illi datum, cum quibuscunque faeminis se jungendi. Every private history will yield such variety of instances, otherwise good, wise, discreet men, virtuous and valiant, but too faulty in this. Priamus had fifty sons, but seventeen alone lawfully begotten. Philippus Bonus left fourteen bastards. Lorenzo de' Medici, a good prince and a wise, but, says Machiavelli, prodigiously lascivious. None so valiant as Castruccius Castrucanus, but, as the said author hath it, none so incontinent as he was. And tis not only predominant in grandees this fault, but if you will take a great man's testimony, tis familiar with every base soldier in France, and elsewhere, I think. This vice, saith mine author, is so common with us in France, that he is of no account, a mere coward, not worthy the name of soldier, that is not a notorious whoremaster. In Italy he is not a gentleman that besides his wife hath not a courtesan and a mistress. Tis no marvel, then, if poor women in such cases be jealous, when they shall see themselves manifestly neglected, contemned, loathed, unkindly used, their disloyal husbands to entertain others in their rooms, and many times to court ladies to their faces, other men's wives to wear their jewels. How shall a poor woman in such a case moderate her passion? Quis tibi nunc dido canenti talia sensus? How, on the other hand, shall a poor man contain himself from this feral malady, when he shall see so manifest signs of his wife's inconstancy? When, as Milo's wife, 
she dotes upon every young man she sees, or as Martial's Sota, deserto sequitur Cletum marito, deserts her husband and follows Cletus. Though her husband be proper and tall, fair and lovely to behold, able to give contentment to any one woman, yet she will taste of the forbidden fruit. Juvenal's Iberina to a hair. She is as well pleased with one eye as one man. If a young gallant come by chance into her presence, a fastidious brisk that can wear his clothes well in fashion, with a lock, a jingling spur, a feather, that can cringe and withal compliment, court a gentlewoman, she raves upon him. Oh, what a lovely proper man he was! Another Hector, an Alexander, a goodly man, a demigod. How sweetly he carried himself, with how comely a grace! Sic oculos, sic ille manus, sic ora ferabat! How neatly he did wear his clothes! Quam sese ore ferens, quam forti pectore et armis! How bravely did he discourse, ride, sing, and dance, etc.! And then she begins to loathe her husband, repugnance osculato, to hate him and his filthy beard, his goatish complexion, as Doris said of Polyphemus. Totus qui sanium, Totus ut hercus olet. He is a rammy, fulsome fellow, a goblin-faced fellow. He smells, he stinks. Et caipus simul alumque ructat, si quando ad salamum, etc. How like a dizzard, a fool, an ass he looks! How like a clown he behaves himself! She will not come near him by her own good will but wholly rejects him, as Venus did her fuliginous Vulcan. At last, nec deus huc mensa, dea nec dignita cubili est. So did Lucretia, a lady of Senai, after she had but seen Euryalus. In Eurialum tota ferabato, domum reversa, etc. She would not hold her eyes off him in his presence. Tantum agregio decus enitet ore, and in his absence could think of none but him, odit virum. She loathed her husband forthwith, might not abide him. Et conjugalis negligens tore, viro praesente, acerbo nauseat fastidio. All against the laws of matrimony. She did abhor her husband's physomy and sought all opportunity to see her sweetheart again. Now when the good man shall observe his wife so lightly given, to be so free and familiar with every gallant, her immodesty and wantonness, as Camerarius notes, it must needs yield matter of suspicion to him, when she still pranks up herself beyond her means and fortunes, makes impertinent journeys, unnecessary visitations, stays out so long with such and such companions, so frequently goes to plays, masks, feasts, and all public meetings, shall use such immodest gestures, free speeches, and withal show some distaste of her own husband, how can he choose, though he were another Socrates, but be suspicious and instantly jealous? Socraticus tandem faciet transcendere metas, more especially when he shall take notice of their more secret and sly tricks, which to cornute their husbands they commonly use. Dum ludis, ludos haec te facit. They pretend love, honour, chastity, and seem to respect them before all men living. Saints in show, so cunningly can they dissemble, they will not so much as look upon another man in his presence. So chaste, so religious, and so devout, they cannot endure the name or sight of a queen, a harlot, out upon her, and in their outward carriage are most loving and officious, will kiss their husband and hang about his neck. Dear husband, sweet husband, and with a composed countenance salute him, especially when he comes home, or if he go from home, weep, sigh, lament, and take upon them to be sick and swoon, like Jocundo's wife in Ariosto when her husband was to depart. 
and yet arrant, etc., they care not for him. I me, the thought, quoth she, makes me so afraid that scarce the breath abideth in my breast. Peace, my sweet love and wife, Jocundo said, and weeps as fast and comforts her his best, etc. All this might not assuage the woman's pain. Needs must I die before you come again, nor how to keep my life I can devise. The doleful days and nights I shall sustain, from meat my mouth, from sleep will keep my eyes, etc. That very night that went before the morrow, that he had pointed surely to depart, Jocundo's wife was sick and swooned for sorrow, amid his arms, so heavy was her heart. And yet, for all these counterfeit tears and protestations, Jocundo coming back in all haste for a jewel he had forgot, his chaste and yoke fellow he found, yoked with a knave, all honesty neglected. The adulterer sleeping, very sound, yet by his face was easily detected. A beggar's brat bred by him from his cradle, and now was riding on his master's saddle. Thus can they cunningly counterfeit, as Platina describes their customs, kiss their husbands, whom they had rather see hanging on a gallows, and swear they love him dearer than their own lives, whose soul they would not ransom for their little dogs. Similis si permutatio detur, morte viri cupiunt aniniani servare catelai. Many of them seem to be precise and holy, forsooth, and will go to such a church, to hear such a good man by all means, an excellent man, when tis for no other intent, as he follows it, than to see and to be seen, to observe what fashions are in use, to meet some pander, bawd, monk, friar, or to entice some good fellow. For they persuade themselves, as Nevisanus shows, that it is neither sin nor shame to lie with a lord or parish priest, if he be a proper man. And though she kneel often, and pray devoutly, tis, says Platina, not for her husband's welfare, or children's good, or any friend, but for her sweetheart's return, her panda's health. If her husband would have her go, she feigns herself sick, et simulat subito condoluisi caput, her head aches, and she cannot stir. But if her paramour ask as much, she is for him in all seasons, at all hours of the night. In the kingdom of Malabar, and about Goa in the East Indies, the women are so subtle that, with a certain drink they give them to drive away cares, as they say, they will make them sleep for twenty-four hours, or so intoxicate them that they can remember naught of what they saw done, or heard, and by washing their feet restore them again, and so make their husbands cuckold to their faces. Some are ill-disposed at all times, to all persons they like, others more wary to some few, at such and such seasons, as Augusta, Livia, non nisi plena navi vectorum tolebat. But, as he said, no pen could write, no tongue attain to tell, by force of eloquence or help of art, of women's treacheries the hundredth part. Both, to say truth, are often faulty. Men and women give just occasions in this humour of discontent, aggravate and yield matter of suspicion, but most part of the chief causes proceed from other adventitious accidents and circumstances, though the parties be free, are both well given themselves. The indiscreet carriage of some lascivious gallant, et a contra of some light woman, by his often frequenting of a house, bold unseemly gestures, may make a breach, and by his over-familiarity, if he be inclined to yellowness, colour him quite out. If he be poor, basely born, says Benedito Varchi, and otherwise unhandsome, he suspects him the less. But if a proper man, such as was Alcibiades in Greece, and Castruccius Castrucanus in Italy, well descended, commendable for his good parts, he taketh on the more, and watcheth his doings. Theodosius the emperor gave his wife Eudoxia, a golden apple when he was a suitor to her, which she long after bestowed upon a young gallant in the court of her especial acquaintance. The emperor, espying this apple in his hand, suspected forthwith more than was. His wife's dishonesty, 
banished him the court, and from that day following forbear to accompany her any more. A rich merchant had a fair wife. According to his custom he went to travel. In his absence a good fellow tempted his wife. She denied him, yet he, dying a little after, gave her a legacy for the love he bore her. At his return, her jealous husband, because she had got more by land than he had done at sea, turned her away upon suspicion. Now when those other circumstances of time and place, opportunity and importunity shall concur, what will they not effect? Fair opportunity can win the coyest she that is, so wisely he takes time, as he'll be sure he will not miss. Then lie that loves her gamesome vein, and tempers toys with art, brings love that swimmeth in her eyes to dive into her heart. As at plays, masks, great feasts and banquets, one singles out his wife to dance, another courts her in his presence, a third tempts her, a fourth insinuates with a pleasing compliment, a sweet smile, ingratiates himself with an amphibological speech, as that merry companion in the satirist did to his glycerium. Ad sidens et interiorum palmum amabiliter concutiens. Quod meus hortus habet, sumat impune licebit. Sidederis nobis quod tuus hortus habet. With many such, etc. And then, as he saith, she may no while in chastity abide, that is assayed on every side. For after all great feast, vino saepe suum nescit amica virum. Noah, saith Hieromi, showed his nakedness in his drunkenness, which for six hundred years he had covered in soberness. Lot lay with his daughters in his drink, as Cinerus with Mera. Quid enim venus ebria curat? The most continent may be overcome, or if otherwise they keep bad company, they that are modest of themselves, and dare not offend, confirmed by others, grow impudent and confident, and get an ill habit. Alia quaestus gratia matrimonium corrumpit. Alia peccans multas vuit morbi habere socias. Or if they dwell in suspected places, as in an infamous inn, near some stews, near monks, friars, Nevisanus adds, where be many tempters and solicitors, idle persons that frequent their companies, it may give just cause of suspicion. Marshal of old inveighed against them that counterfeited a disease to go to the bath, for so many times, relicto, conjuge Penelope venit, abit Helene. Aeneas Silvius puts in a caveat against princes' courts, because there be, tot formosi juvenes qui promitunt, so many brave suitors to tempt, etc. If you leave her in such a place, you shall likely find her in company you like not. Either they come to her, or she is gone to them. Conmanus makes a doubting jest in his lascivious country. Virginis illibata censiata ne castitas, ad quam frequento accedant scolares. And Baldus the lawyer scoffs on, quum scolaris, inquit, loquitur cum puella, non presumitur e dicere. Pater nostra, when a scholar talks with a maid, or another man's wife in private, it is presumed he saith not a pater nostra. Or, if I shall see a monk or a friar climb up a ladder at midnight into a virgin's or widow's chamber window, I shall hardly think he then goes to administer the sacraments, or to take her confession. These are the ordinary causes of jealousy, which are intended or remitted as the circumstances vary. End of section 30《セクション31 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3, by Robert Burton, Section 31. Partition 3, Section 3, Member 2. 
Symptoms of jealousy, fear, sorrow, suspicion, strange actions, gestures, outrages, locking up, oaths, trials, laws, etc. Of all passions, as I have already proved, love is most violent, and of those bitter potions which this love melancholy affords, this bastard jealousy is the greatest, as appears by those prodigious symptoms which it hath, and that it produceth. For, besides fear and sorrow, which is common to all melancholy, anxiety of mind, suspicion, aggravation, restless thoughts, paleness, meagerness, neglect of business, and the like, these men are farther yet misaffected, and in a higher strain. Tis a more vehement passion, a more furious perturbation, a bitter pain, a fire, a pernicious curiosity, a gall corrupting the honey of our life, madness, vertigo, plague, hell, they are more than ordinarily disquieted, they lose bonum pacis, as Chrysostom observes. And though they be rich, keep sumptuous tables, be nobly allied, yet miserimi omnium sunt, they are most miserable. They are more than ordinarily discontent, more sad, nihil tristius, more than ordinarily suspicious. Jealousy, saith Vives, begets unquietness in the mind, night and day. He hunts after every word he hears, every whisper, and amplifies it to himself, as all melancholy men do in other matters, with the most unjust calumny of others. He misinterprets everything is said or done, most apt to mistake or misconstrue. He pries into every corner, follows close, observes to a hair. Tis proper to jealousy so to do. Pale hag, infernal fury, pleasure smart, envious observer, prying in every part. Besides those strange gestures of staring, frowning, grinning, rolling of eyes, menacing, ghastly looks, broken pace, interrupt, precipitate, half-turns, he will sometimes sigh, weep, sob for anger. Nempe suos imbres etiam ista tonitrua fundant. Swear and belie, slander any man, curse, threaten, brawl, scold, fight, and sometimes again flatter and speak fair, ask forgiveness, kiss and call, condemn his rashness and folly, vow, protest, and swear he will never do so again, and then eftsoons, impatient as he is, rave, roar, and lay about him like a madman, thump her sides, drag her about perchance, drive her out of doors, send her home, he will be divorced forthwith, she is a whore, etc. And by and by, with all submission, compliment and treat her fair, and bring her in again, he loves her dearly, she is his sweet, most kind and loving wife. He will not change, nor leave her for a kingdom. So he continues, off and on, as the toy takes him. The object moves him, but most part brawling, fretting, unquiet he is, accusing and suspecting, not strangers only, but brothers and sisters, father and mother, nearest and dearest friends. He thinks with those Italians, qui non tocca parentado, tocca mai erado, and through fear conceives unto himself things almost incredible and impossible to be effected, as a heron when she fishes, still prying on all sides, or as a cat doth a mouse, his eye is never off hers. He gloats on him, on her, accurately observing on whom she looks, who looks at her, what she saith, doth, at dinner, at supper, sitting, walking, at home, abroad, 
he is the same still inquiring maundering gazing listening affrighted with every small object why did she smile why did she pity him commend him why did she drink twice to such a man why did she offer to kiss to dance etc a whore a whore an arrant whore all this he confesseth in the poet omnia mi terent timidus sum ignosce timori et miser in tunica suspico esse virum me laedit si multa tibi dabit oscula mater me soror et cum qua dormit amica simul each thing affrights me i do fear ah pardon me my fear i doubt a man is hid within the clothes that thou dost wear is it not a man in woman's apparel is not somebody in that great chest or behind the door or hangings or in some of those barrels may not a man steal in at the window with a ladder of ropes or come down the chimney have a false key or get in when he is asleep if a mouse do but stir or the wind blow a casement clatter that's the villain there he is by his good will no man shall see her salute her speak with her she shall not go forth of his sight so much as to do her needs non ita bovem argus etc argus did not so keep his cow that watchful dragon the golden fleece or cerberus the coming in of hell as he keeps his wife if a dear friend or near kinsman come as guest to his house to visit him he will never let him be out of his own sight and company lest peradventure etc if the necessity of his business be such that he must go from home he doth either lock her up or commit her with a deal of injunctions and protestations to some trusty friends him and her he sets and bribes to oversee one servant is set in his absence to watch another and all to observe his wife and yet all this will not serve though his business be very urgent he will when he is half way come back in all post haste rise from supper or at midnight and be gone and sometimes leave his business undone and as a stranger court his own wife in some disguised habit though there be no danger at all no cause of suspicion she live in such a place where messalina herself could not be dishonest if she would yet he suspects her as much as if she were in a bawdy house some prince's court or in a common inn where all comers might have free access he calls her on a sudden all to naught she is a strumpet a light hussif a bitch an arrant whore no persuasion no protestation can divert this passion nothing can ease him secure or give him satisfaction it is most strange to report what outrageous acts by men and women have been committed in this kind by women especially that will run after their husbands into all places and companies as jovianus pontanus wife did by him follow him whithersoever he went it matters not or upon what business raving like juno in the tragedy miscalling cursing swearing and mistrusting every one she sees gomesius in his third book of the life and deeds of francis zimenius sometime archbishop of toledo hath a strange story of that incredible jealousy of joan queen of spain wife to king philip mother of ferdinand and charles v emperors when her husband philip either for that he was tired with his wife's jealousy or had some great business went into the low countries she was so impatient and melancholy upon his departure that she would scarce eat her meat or converse with any man and though she were with child the season of the year very bad the wind against her in all haste she would to see after him neither isabella her queen mother the archbishop or any other friend could persuade her to the contrary but she would after him when she was now come into the low countries and kindly entertained by her husband she could not contain herself but in a rage ran upon a yellow-haired wench with whom she suspected her husband to be naught cut off her hair did beat her black and blue and so dragged her about it is an ordinary thing for women in such cases to scratch the faces slit the noses of such as they suspect as henry the second's importune juno did by rosamond at woodstock for she complains in a modern poet she scarce spake but flies with eager fury to my face offering me most unwomanly disgrace 
look how a tigress etc so fell she on me in outrageous wise as could disdain and jealousy devise or if it be so they dare not or cannot execute any such tyrannical injustice they will miscall rail and revile bear them deadly hate and malice as tacitus observes the hatred of a jealous woman is inseparable against such as she suspects nulla vis flammae tumidique venti tanta nec teli metuanda torti quanta cum conjux viduata taedis ardet et odit winds weapons flames make not such hurly-burly as raving women turn all topsy-turvy so did agrippina by lollia and calphurnia in the days of claudius but women are sufficiently curbed in such cases the rage of men is more eminent and frequently put in practice see but with what rigour those jealous husbands tyrannise over their poor wives in greece spain italy turkey africa asia and generally over all those hot countries mulieres vestre terra vestra arate secut vultis mahomet in his alcoran gives this power to men your wives are as your land till them use them and treat them fair or foul as you will yourselves me castor lege dura vivunt mulieres they lock them still in their houses which are so many prisons to them will suffer nobody to come at them or their wives to be seen abroad nec campos liceat lustrare patentes they must not so much as look out and if they be great persons they have eunuchs to keep them as the grand signor among the turks the sophies of persia those tartarian mogors and kings of china infantes masculos castrant in numeros ut regi serviant saith riccius they geld innumerable infants to this purpose the king of china maintains ten thousand eunuchs in his family to keep his wives the zarifs of barbary keep their courtesans in such a strict manner that if any man come but in sight of them he dies for it and if they chance to see a man and do not instantly cry out though from their windows they must be put to death the turks have i know not how many black deformed eunuchs for the white serve for other ministries to this purpose sent commonly from egypt deprived in their childhood of all their privities and brought up in the seraglio at constantinople to keep their wives which are so penned up they may not confer with any living man or converse with younger women have a cucumber or carrot sent into them for their diet but sliced for fear etc and so live and are left alone to their unchaste thoughts all the days of their lives the vulgar sort of women if at any time they come abroad which is very seldom to visit one another or to go to their baths are so covered that no man can see them as the matrons were in old rome lectica aut cella tecta vectae so dion and seneca record velatae totae incedunt which alexander ab alexandro relates of the parthians lib five cap twenty four which with andreas tiraquellus his commentator i rather think should be understood of persians i have not yet said all they do not only lock them up said at pudendis serus ad hibent hear what bembus relates lib six of his venetian history of those inhabitants that dwell about quilon in africa lusitani inquit quorundum civitates adierunt qui natis statim faeminis naturam consunt co ad urine exitus ne impediato easque cum adoleverint sic consutas in matrimonium collocant ut sponsi prima cura sit conglutinatas puellae oras ferro interscindere in some parts of greece at this day like those old jews they will not believe their wives are honest nisi panum menstruatum prima nocte videant our countryman sands in his peregrination saith it is severely observed in zanzinthus or zante and leo Affer in his time at fez in africa non credunt virginem esse nisi videant sanguineam mappam si non ad parentes pudore regicitur those sheets are publicly shown by their parents and kept as a sign of incorrupt virginity the jews of old examined their maids ex tenui membrana called hymen 
which Laurentius in his anatomy, Columbus lib. 12, cap. 10, Capivaccius lib. 4, cap. 11, De uteri affectibus, Vincent, Alsarus genuensis, quaesit, med. sent. 4, Hieronymus mercurialis, consult, Ambros, Pareus, Julius Caesar, Claudinus, respons. 4, as that also de ruptura venarum ut sauguis fluat, copiously confute. Tis no sufficient trial, they contend. And yet others again defend it. Gaspar Bartolinus, Institute Anat, Lib. 1, Cat. 31. Pineus of Paris. Albertus Magnus, De Secret Mulier, Cat. 9 and 10, etc. And think they speak too much in favour of women. Ludovicus Boncialis, Lib. 4, Cap. 2, Mulier Naturalem, Ilam Uteri, Labiorum, Constrictionem, In Qua Virginitatem Consistere Volent, Astringentibus medicinis fieri posse vendicat, et si de florate sint, astute mulieres inquit, nos fallunt in his, idem alsarius crucius genuensis iis dem feri verbis, idem avicenna, lib. 3, fen. 20, tract. 1, cap. 47. Rasis continent, lib. 24, Rodericus a castro de nat mul, lib. 1, cap. 3. An old bawdy nurse in Aristonetus, like that Spanish Celestina, quae quinque mille virgines facit mulieres, totidemque mulieres arte sua virgines, when a fair maid of her acquaintance wept and made her moan to her, how she had been deflowered, and now ready to be married, was afraid it would be perceived, comfortably replied, noli vereri filia, etc., Fear not, daughter, I'll teach thee a trick to help it, said Hike Extra Calem. To what end are all those astrological questions, ansit Virgo, ansit Casta, ansit Mulier, and such strange, absurd trials in Albertus Magnus, Bat Porta Mag, Lib. 2, Cap. 21, in Vecca, Lib. 5, De Secret, by stones, perfumes, to make them piss, and confess I know not what in their sleep. Some jealous brain was the first founder of them. And to what passion may we ascribe those severe laws against jealousy? Numbers, verse 14, Adulterers, Deuteronomy, chapter 22, verse 22, as amongst the Hebrews, amongst the Egyptians. Read Bohemus, lib. 1, cap. 5, de more gen of the Carthaginians, cap. 6 of Turks, lib. 2, cap. 11. Amongst the Athenians of old, Italians at this day, wherein they are to be severely punished, cut in pieces, burned, vivi comburio, buried alive, with several expurgations, etc. Are they not as so many symptoms of incredible jealousy? We may say the same of those vestal virgins that fetched water in a sieve, as Tatia did in Rome, anno ab urb condita 800, before the senators, and Amelia, Virgo Innocens, that ran over hot irons, as Emma, Edward the Confessor's mother did, the king himself being a spectator with the like. We read in Nicephorus that Tunigunda, the wife of Henricus Bavarus Emperor, suspected of adultery, in simulata adulterii per ignitos vomeres illesa transit, trod upon red-hot coulters and had no harm. Such another story we find in Regino Lib. 2, in Aventinus and Sigonius of Charles the Third and his wife Richarda, anno 887, that was so purged with hot irons. Pausanias saith that he was once an eye-witness of such a miracle at Diana's temple. A maid without any harm at all walked upon burning coals. Pew Second, in his description of Europe, circa 46, relates as much, that it was commonly practised at Diana's temple for women to go barefoot over hot coals to try their honesties. Plinius, Solinus, and many writers make mention of Geronius Temple, and Dionysius Halicarnassus, Lib. 3 of Memnon's statue, which were used to this purpose. Tatius, Lib. 6 of Pan, his cave, much like old St. Wilfred's Needle in Yorkshire, wherein they did use to try maids whether they were honest. When Lucipe went in, suavissimus exaudiri sonus caipit austin, De Kiv De Lib. 10, C. 16, relates many such examples. All which Lavater, De Spect, Part 1, Cap. 19, 
contends to be done by the illusion of devils. Though Thomas, Christ, six day Polentia, etc., ascribes it to good angels. Some, saith Austin, compel their wives to swear they be honest, as if perjury were less a sin than adultery. Some consult oracles, as Pharaoh's that blind king of Egypt. Others reward, as those old Romans used to do. If a woman were contented with one man, corona pudicitiae donabato, she had a crown of chastity bestowed on her. When all this will not serve, saith Alexander Gaguinus, cap 5, descript Muscoviae, the Muscovites, if they suspect their wives, will beat them till they confess. And if that will not avail, like those wild Irish, be divorced at their pleasures, or else knock them on the heads, as the old Gauls have done in former ages. Of this tyranny of jealousy read more in Parthenius Erot Cap 10, Camerarius Cap 53, Hor Subsis et Cent 2 Cap 34, Caelius Epistles, Thomas Chaloner de Repub Aug Lib 9 Ariosto Lib 31, Stase 1, Felix Platerus Observat Lib 1, etc. End of section 31《Section 32 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3, by Robert Burton. Section 32 Partition 3 Section 3 Member 3 Prognostics of jealousy Despair Madness To make away themselves and others Those which are jealous, most part, if they be not otherwise relieved, proceed from suspicion to hatred, from hatred to frenzy, madness, injury, murder, and despair. A plague, by whose most damnable effect, diverse in deep despair, to die have sought, by which a man to madness near is brought, as well with causeless as with just suspect. In their madness many times, saith Vives, they make away themselves and others, which induceth Cyprian to call it fecundum et multiplicem perniciem, fontem cladium et seminarium delictorum, a fruitful mischief, the seminary of offences and fountain of murders. Tragical examples are too common in this kind, both new and old, in all ages, as of Cephalus and Procris. Phereus of Egypt, Tereus, Atreus, and Thiestes. Alexander Phereus was murdered of his wife, ob pelicatus suspitionem, Tully saith. Antoninus Verus was so made away by Lucilla, Demetrius the son of Antigonus, and Nicanor by their wives, Hercules poisoned by Degenera, Chichina murdered by Vespasian, Justina, a Roman lady, by her husband. A mistress, Xerxes' wife, because she found her husband's cloak in Masista's house, cut off Masista, his wife's paps, and gave them to the dogs, flayed her besides, and cut off her ears, lips, tongue, and slit the nose of Artainta, her daughter. Our late writers are full of such outrages. Paulus Emilius, in his History of France, hath a tragical story of Chilpericus I his death, made away by Ferdigunda his queen. In a jealous humour he came from hunting, and stole behind his wife, as she was dressing and combing her head in the sun. Gave her a familiar touch with his wand, which she, mistaking for her lover, said, Ah, Landre, a good knight should strike before, and not behind. But when she saw herself betrayed by his presence, she instantly took order to make him away. 
Hirome Osorius, in his eleventh book of the deeds of Emmanuel, king of Portugal. To this effect hath a tragical narration of one Ferdinandus Chalderia, that wounded Gotharinus, a noble countryman of his, at Goa in the East Indies, and cut off one of his legs, for that he looked, as he thought, too familiarly upon his wife which was afterwards a cause of many quarrels and much bloodshed. Gaianerius speaks of a silly jealous fellow, that seeing his child new-born included in a call, thought sure a Franciscan that used to come to his house was the father of it, it was so like the friar's cowl, and thereupon threatened the friar to kill him. Fulgosus, of a woman in Narbonne, that cut off her husband's privities in the night, because she thought he played false with her, the story of Jonas's Bassa, and fair Manto, his wife, is well known to such as have read the Turkish history, and that of Joan of Spain, of which I treated in my former section. Her jealousy, saith Gemesius, was the cause of both their deaths. King Philip died for grief a little after, as Martian his physician gave it out, and she for her part, after a melancholy, discontented life, misspent in lurking holes and corners, made an end of her miseries. Felix Plater, in the first book of his observations, hath many such instances of a physician of his acquaintance that was first mad through jealousy, and afterwards desperate, of a merchant that killed his wife in the same humour, and after precipitated himself, of a doctor of law that cut off his man's nose, of a painter's wife in Basel, anno sixteen hundred, that was mother of nine children, and had been twenty-seven years married, yet afterwards jealous and so impatient that she became desperate, and would neither eat nor drink in her own house, for fear her husband should poison her. Tis a common sign, this, for when once the humours are stirred, and the imagination misaffected, it will vary itself in diverse forms, and many such absurd symptoms will accompany even madness itself. Skenkius hath an example of a jealous woman, that by this means had many fits of the mother, and in his first book of some that through jealousy ran mad, of a baker that gelded himself to try his wife's honesty, etc. Such examples are too common. End of section 32。section 33 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, volume 3 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3, by Robert Burton, Section 33. Partition 3, Section 3, Member 4, Subsection 1. Cure of Jealousy by avoiding occasions, not to be idle, of good counsel, to contemn it, not to watch or lock them up, to dissemble it, etc. As of all other melancholy, some doubt whether this malady may be cured or no. They think tis like the gout, or switzers, whom we commonly call walloons, those hired soldiers, if once they take possession of a castle, they can never be got out. Qui timet ut sua sit, nequis sibi substrahat illam, ille maceonia vix ope salvus est. This is the cruel wound against whose smart no liquor's force prevails, or any plaster, no skill of stars, no depth of magic art, devised by that great clerk Zoroaster. A wound that so infects the soul and heart, as all our sense and reason it doth master, a wound whose pang and torment is so durable, as it may rightly called be incurable. Yet what I have formerly said of other melancholy, I will say again. It may be cured, or mitigated at least, by some contrary passion, good counsel and persuasion. If it be withstood in the beginning, maturely resisted, and as those ancients hold, the nails of it be pared before they grow too long. No better means to resist or repel it than by avoiding idleness, to be still seriously busied about some matters of importance. 
to drive out those vain fears, foolish fantasies, and irksome suspicions out of his head, and then to be persuaded by his judicious friends to give ear to their good counsel and advice, and wisely to consider how much he discredits himself, his friends, dishonours his children, disgraceth his family, publisheth his shame, and as a trumpeter of his own misery, divulgeth, macerates, grieves himself and others. What an argument of weakness it is! How absurd a thing in its own nature! How ridiculous! How brutish a passion! How sottish! How odious! For as Hieromi well hath it, odium sui facit, et ipse novissime sibi odio est, others hate him, and at last he hates himself for it. How harebrain a disease, mad and furious! If he will but hear them speak, no doubt he may be cured. Joan, Queen of Spain, of whom I have formerly spoken, under pretence of changing air, was sent to Complutum, or Alcada de las Heneras, where Ximenius, the Archbishop of Toledo, then lived, that by his good counsel, as for the present she was, she might be eased. For a disease of the soul, if concealed, tortures and overturns it, and by no physic can sooner be removed than by a discreet man's comfortable speeches. I will not here insert any consolatory sentences to this purpose, or forestall any man's invention, but leave it every one to dilate and amplify as he shall think fit in his own judgment. Let him advise with Syracides, Cap. 9, 1. Be not jealous over the wife of thy bosom. Read that comfortable and pithy speech to this purpose of Ximenius, in the author himself, as it is recorded by Gomesius. Consult with Chaloner, Librum 9 de Republicum Anglorum, or Caelia in her epistles, etc. Only this I will add, that if it be considered a right which causeth this jealous passion, be it just or unjust, whether with or without cause, true or false, it ought not so heinously to be taken. Tis no such real or capital matter that it should make so deep a wound. Tis a blow that hurts not, an insensible smart, grounded many times upon false suspicion alone, and so fostered by a sinister conceit. If she be not dishonest, he troubles and macerates himself without a cause. Or put case which is the worst, he be a cuckold. It cannot be helped, the more he stirs in it, the more he aggravates his own misery. How much better were it in such a case to dissemble or contemn it? Why should that be feared which cannot be redressed? Multi tandem deposuerunt, saith Vives, quum flecti maritos non posse vident. Many women, when they see there is no remedy, have been pacified. And shall men be more jealous than women? Tis some comfort in such a case to have companions. Solomon miseris socios habuisse doloris. Who can say that he is free? Who can assure himself he is not one di praeterito, or secure himself di futuro? If it were his case alone, it were hard, but being as it is almost a common calamity, tis not so grievously to be taken. If a man have a lock which every man's key will open, as well as his own, why should he think to keep it private to himself? In some countries they make nothing of it. Ne nobiles quidem, saith Leo Afa. In many parts of Africa, if she be past fourteen, there is not a nobleman that marries a maid, or that hath a chaste wife. Tis so common, as the moon gives horns once a month to the world, do they to their husbands at least. And tis most part true which that Caledonian lady, Ageta Culvers, a British prince's wife, told Julia Augusta, when she took her up for dishonesty, we Britons are not at least with some few choice men of the better sort, but you Romans lie with every base knave. You are a company of common whores. Severus the emperor in his time made laws for the restraint of this vice, and as Dion Nicaeus relates in his life, tria milia maecorum, three thousand cuckold makers, or naturae monetam adulterantes, as Philo calls them, false coiners and clippers of nature's money, were summoned into the court at once. And yet, non omnem molitor quae fluit undam videt. 
the miller sees not all the water that goes by his mill no doubt but as in our days these were of the commonality all the great ones were not so much as called in question for it marshall's epigram i suppose might have been generally applied in those licentious times omnia solus habes etc thy goods lands money wits are thine own uxorum said habes candide cum populo but neighbour candidus your wife is common husband and cuckold in that age it seems were reciprocal terms the emperors themselves did wear acteon's badge how many caesars might i reckon up together and what a catalogue of connuted kings and princes in every story agamemnon menelaus philippus of greece ptolemaeus of egypt lucullus caesar pompeius cato augustus antonius antoninus etc that wore fair plumes of bull's feathers in their crests the bravest soldiers and most heroical spirits could not avoid it they have been active and passive in this business they have either given or taken horns king arthur whom we call one of the nine worthies for all his great valour was unworthily served by mordred one of his round table knights and Guisera, or Helena Alba, his fair wife, as Leland interprets it, was an arrant honest woman. Parcerum libenta, saith mine author. Heroinarum lese majestati, si non historia veritas orum velicaret. I could willingly wink at a fair lady's faults, but that I am bound by the laws of history to tell the truth. Against his will, God knows, did he write it and so do i repeat it i speak not of our times all this while we have good honest virtuous men and women whose fame zeal fear of god religion and superstition contains and yet for all that we have many knights of this order so dubbed by their wives many good women abused by dissolute husbands in some places and such persons you may as soon enjoin them to carry water in a sieve as to keep themselves honest what shall a man do now in such a case what remedy is to be had how shall he be eased by suing a divorce this is hard to be effected sinon caste tamen caute they carry the matter so cunningly that though it be as common as simony as clear and as manifest as the nose in a man's face yet it cannot be evidently proved or they likely taken in the fact they will have a knave gallus to watch or with that roman sulpitia all made fast and sure ne se caducis destitutum fasciis nudum caleno concumbentem vidiat she will hardly be surprised by her husband be he never so wary much better then to put it up the more he strives in it the more he shall divulge his own shame make a virtue of necessity and conceal it yea but the world takes notice of it tis in every man's mouth let them talk their pleasure of whom speak they not in this sense from the highest to the lowest they are thus censured all there is no remedy then but patience it may be tis his own fault and he hath no reason to complain tis quid pro quo she is bad he is worse bethink thyself hast thou not done as much for some of thy neighbours why dost thou require that of thy wife which thou wilt not perform thyself thou rangest like a town bull why art thou so incensed if she tread awry be it that some woman break chaste wedlock's laws and leaves her husband and becomes unchaste yet commonly it is not without cause she sees her man in sin her goods to waste she feels that he his love from her withdraws and hath on some perhaps less worthy placed who strike with sword the scabbard them may strike and sure love craveth love like asketh like ea semper studebit saith nevisanus pares redere vices she will quit it if she can and therefore as well adviseth Siracides, cap nine one teach her not an evil lesson against thyself which as jansenius the runners on his text and carthusianus interpret 
is no otherwise to be understood than that she do thee not a mischief. I do not excuse her in accusing thee, but if both be naught, mend thyself first, for as the old saying is, a good husband makes a good wife. Yea, but thou repliest, tis not the like reason betwixt man and woman. Through her fault my children are bastards. I may not endure it. Sit amarulenta, sit imperiosa prodiga, etc. Let her scold, brawl, and spend. I care not, modo sit casta. So she be honest, I could easily bear it. But this I cannot, I may not, I will not. My faith, my fame, mine eye must not be touched, as the diverb is. Non patitur tactum fama. Fides oculus. I say the same of my wife. Touch all, use all, take all but this. I acknowledge that of Seneca to be true. Nullius boni jucundo possessio sine socio. There is no sweet content in the possession of any good thing without a companion. This only excepted, I say. And why this? Even this which thou so much abhorrest, it may be for thy progeny's good. Better be any man's son than thine, to be begot of base Iris, poor Seus, or mean Mevius, the town swineherds, a shepherd's son, and well is he, that like Hercules he hath any two fathers. For thou thyself hast peradventure more diseases than a horse, more infirmities of body and mind, a cankered soul, crabbed conditions, make the worst of it, as it is vulnus insanibile, sic vulnus insensibile. As it is incurable, so it is insensible. But art thou sure it is so? Iris agit, ille tuas, doth he so indeed? It may be thou art over-suspicious, and without a cause as some are. If it be Octimestris partus, born at eight months, or like him, and him, they fondly suspect he got it. If she speak or laugh familiarly with such or such men, then presently she is naught with them. Such is thy weakness, whereas charity, or a well-disposed mind, would interpret all unto the best. St. Francis, by chance, seeing a friar familiarly kissing another man's wife, was so far from misconceiving it, that he presently kneeled down and thanked God there was so much charity left. But they on the other side will ascribe nothing to natural causes, indulge nothing to familiarity, mutual society, friendship, but out of a sinister suspicion presently lock them close, watch them, thinking by those means to prevent all such inconveniencies. Presently lock them close, watch them, thinking by those means to prevent all such inconveniencies. That's the way to help it, whereas by such tricks they do aggravate the mischief. Tis but in vain to watch that which will away. Nec custodiri si velit fulla potest, nec mentem servare potes, licet omnia serves, omnibus exclusis, intus adulta erit, None can be kept resisting for her part. Though body be kept close within her heart, advertry lurks. To exclude it, there's no art. Argus with a hundred eyes cannot keep her. Et hunc unus saepe fefelit amor, as in Ariosto. If all our hearts were eyes, yet sure they said, we husbands of our wives should be betrayed. Hieromi holds, Uxo impudica servari non potest, pudica non debet, infida custos castitatis est, necessitas. To what end is all your custody? A dishonest woman cannot be kept, an honest woman ought not to be kept. Necessity is a keeper not to be trusted. Difficile custodito, quod plures amant, that which many covet can hardly be preserved, as Salisburiensis thinks. I am of Aeneas Silvius's mind. Those jealous Italians do very ill to lock up their wives, for women are of such a disposition they will most covet that which is denied most, and offend least when they have free liberty to trespass. 
it is in vain to lock her up if she be dishonest et tyrannicum imperium as our great mr aristotle calls it too tyrannical a task most unfit for when she perceives her husband observes her and suspects liberius peccat saith nevisanus toxica zelotipo dedit uxor moica marito she is exasperated seeks by all means to vindicate herself and will therefore offend because she is unjustly suspected the best course then is to let them have their own wills give them free liberty without any keeping in vain our friends from this do us dehort for beauty will be where is most resort if she be honest as lucretia to collatinus laodamia to protesilaus penelope to her ulysses she will so continue her honour good name credit penelope conjux semper ulysses ero i shall always be penelope the wife of ulysses and as phocius's wife in plutarch called her husband her wealth treasure world joy delight orb and sphere she will hers the vow she made unto her good man love virtue religion zeal are better keepers than all those locks eunuchs prisons she will not be moved at mihi vel tellus optem prius ima dehiscat aut pater omnipotens adigat me fulmine ad umbras palentes umbras erebi noctemque profundam arite pudor quam te violem aut tua jura resolvam first i desire the earth to swallow me before i violate mine honesty or thunder from above drive me to hell with those pale ghosts and ugly knights to dwell she is resolved with dido to be chaste though her husband be false she will be true and as octavia writ to her antony these walls that here do keep me out of sight shall keep me all unspotted unto thee and testify that i will do thee right i'll never stain thine house though thou shame me turn her loose to all those tarquins and satyrs she will not be tempted in the time of valence the emperor saith st austin one archidamus a consul of antioch offered a hundred pounds of gold to a fair young wife and besides to set her husband free who was then sub gravissima custodia a dark prisoner pro unius noctis concubitu but the chaste matron would not accept of it when odi commended theana's fine arm to his fellows she took him up short sir tis not common she is wholly reserved to her husband bilia had an old man to her spouse and his breath stunk so that nobody could abide it abroad coming home one day she reprehended his wife because she did not tell him of it she vowed unto him she had told him but she thought every man's breath had been as strong as his tigranes and armina his lady were invited to supper by king cyrus when they came home tigranes asked his wife how she liked cyrus and what she did especially commend in him she swore she did not observe him when he replied again what then she did observe whom she looked on she made her answer her husband that said he would die for her sake such are the properties and conditions of good women and if she be well given she will so carry herself if otherwise she be naught use all the means thou canst she will be naught non deest animus sed corruptor she hath so many lies excuses as a hare has muses tricks panders boards shifts to deceive tis to no purpose to keep her up or to reclaim her by hard usage fair means peradventure may do somewhat obsequio vinces aptius ipse tuo men and women are both in a predicament in this behalf no sooner one and better pacified duci volent non cogi though she be as arrant a scold as xanthippe as cruel as medea as clamorous as hecuba as lustful as messalina by such means if at all she may be reformed 
many patient grizzles by their obsequiousness in this kind have reclaimed their husbands from their wandering lusts in nova francia and turkey as leah rachel and sarah did to abraham and jacob they bring their fairest damsels to their husbands beds livia seconded the lustful appetite of augustus stratonike wife to king deotarus did not only bring electra a fair maid to her good man's bed but brought up the children begot on her as carefully as if they had been her own tertius emilius's wife cornelia's mother perceiving her husband's intemperance rem dissimulavit made much of the maid and would take no notice of it a new married man when a pig thank friend of his to curry favour had showed him his wife familiar in private with a young gallant courting and dallying etc tush said he let him do his worst i dare trust my wife though i dare not trust him the best remedy then is by fair means if that will not take place to dissemble it as i say or turn it off with a jest hear gregsera's advice in this case vel gioco excipies vel silentio eludes for if you take exceptions at everything your wife does solomon's wisdom hercules valour homer's learning socrates patience argus's vigilance will not serve turn therefore minus malum a less mischief nevisanus holds dissimulare to be cunarum emptor a buyer of cradles as the proverb is than to be too solicitous a good fellow when his wife was brought to bed before her time bought half a dozen of cradles beforehand for so many children as if his wife should continue to bear children every two months pertinax the emperor when one told him a fiddler was too familiar with his empress made no reckoning of it and when that macedonian philip was upbraided with his wife's dishonesty cum tot victor regnorum ac populorum esset etc a conqueror of kingdoms could not tame his wife for she thrust him out of doors he made a jest of it sapientes portant cornua in pectore stulte in fronte saith nevisanus wise men bear their horns in their hearts fools on their foreheads eumenes king of pergamus was at deadly feud with perseus of macedonia insomuch that perseus hearing of a journey he was to take to delphos set a company of soldiers to intercept him in his passage they did it accordingly and as they supposed left him stoned to death the news of this fact was brought instantly to pergamus attalus eumenes brother proclaimed himself king forthwith took possession of the crown and married stratonike the queen but by and by when contrary news was brought that king eumenes was alive and now coming to the city he laid by his crown left his wife as a private man went to meet him and congratulate his return eumenes though he knew all particulars past yet dissembling the matter kindly embraced his brother and took his wife into his favour again as if no such matter had been heard of or done jocundo in ariosto found his wife in bed with a knave both asleep went his ways and would not so much as wake them much less reprove them for it an honest fellow finding in like sort his wife had played false at tables and borne a man too many drew his dagger and swore if he had not been his very friend he would have killed him another hearing one had done that for him which no man desires to be done by a deputy followed in a rage with his sword drawn and having overtaken him laid adultery to his charge the offender hotly pursued confessed it was true with which confession he was satisfied and so left him swearing that if he had denied it he would not have put it up how much better is it to do thus than to macerate himself impatiently to rave and rage to enter an action as arnoldus tilius did in the court of toulouse against martin gur his fellow-soldier for that he counterfeited his habit and was too familiar with his wife so to divulge his own shame 
and to remain for ever a cuckold on record how much better be cornelius tacitus than publius cornutus to condemn in such cases or take no notice of it melius sic errare quam zelotipiae curis saith erasmus se conficere better be a wittol and put it up than to trouble himself to no purpose and though he will not omnibus dormire be an ass as he is an ox yet to wink at it as many do is not amiss at some times in some cases to some parties if it be for his commodity or some great man's sake his landlord patron benefactor as calvus the roman saith plutarch did by mycenus and phaelus of argos did by king philip when he promised him an office on that condition he might lie with his wife and so let it pass paul me haud proenitet scilicet boni dimidium dividere cum jove it never troubles me saith amphitrio to be cornuted by jupiter let it not molest thee then be friends with her ulcum alcmena uxore antiquam ingratium ready receive alcmena to your grace again let it i say make no breach of love between you howsoever the best way is to contemn it which henry the second king of france advised a courtier of his jealous of his wife and complaining of her unchasteness to reject it and comfort himself for he that suspects his wife incontinency and fears the pope's curse shall never live a merry hour or sleep a quiet night no remedy but patience when all is done according to that counsel of nevisanus si vitium uxoris corrigi non potest ferendum est if it may not be helped it must be endured date venium et sustinete taciti tis sophocles advice keep it to thyself and which chrysostom calls palaestrum philosophiae et domesticum gymnasium a school of philosophy put it up there is no other cure but time to wear it out injuriarum remedium est oblivio as if they had drunk a draught of lethe in trophonius's den to conclude age will bereave her of it dies dolorum minuit time and patience must end it the mind's affections patience will appease it passions kills and healeth each disease End of section 33 Section 34 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3, by Robert Burton. Section 34. Partition 3, Section 3, Member 4, Subsection 2. By Prevention Before or After Marriage, Plato's Community marry a courtesan philters stews to marry one equal in years fortunes of a good family education good place to use them well etc of such medicines as conduce to the cure of this malady i have sufficiently treated there be some good remedies remaining by way of prevention precautions or admonitions which if rightly practised may do much good plato in his commonwealth to prevent this mischief belike would have all things wives and children all as one and which caesar in his commentaries observed of those old britons that first inhabited this land they had ten or twelve wives allotted to such a family, or promiscuously to be used by so many men, 
not one to one as with us or four five or six to one as in turkey the nicolaites a sect that sprang saith augustinian from nicholas the deacon would have women indifferent and the cause of this filthy sect was nicholas the deacon's jealousy for which when he was condemned to purge himself of his offence he broached his heresy that it was lawful to lie with one another's wives and for any man to lie with his like to those anabaptists in munster that would consort with other men's wives as the spirit moved them or as mahomet the seducing prophet would needs use women as he list himself to beget prophets two hundred and five their alcoran saith were in love with him and he as able as forty men amongst the old carthaginians as bohemus relates out of sabellicus the king of the country lay with the bride the first night and once in a year they went promiscuously altogether munster cosmographia book three chapter four hundred ninety seven ascribes the beginning of this brutish custom unjustly to one picardus a frenchman that invented a new sect of adamites to go naked as adam did and to use promiscuous venery at set times when the priest repeated that of genesis increase and multiply out went the candles in the place where they met and without all respect of age persons conditions catch that catch may every man took her that came next etc some fasten this on those ancient bohemians and russians others on the inhabitants of mambrium in the lucerne valley in piedmont and as i read it was practised in scotland amongst christians themselves until king malcolm's time the king or the lord of the town had their maidenheads in some parts of india in our age and those islanders as amongst the babylonians of old they will prostitute their wives and daughters which chalcocondila a greek modern writer for want of better intelligence puts upon us britons to such travellers or seafaring men as come amongst them by chance to show how far they were from this feral vice of jealousy and how little they esteemed it the kings of calicut as ludovicus vertomanus relates will not touch their wives till one of their biarmi or high priests have lain first with them to sanctify their wombs but those essai and montanists two strange sects of old were in another extreme they would not marry at all or have any society with women because of their intemperance they held them all to be naught nevisanus the lawyer book four number thirty three silva nuptialis would have him that is inclined to this malady to prevent the worst marry a queen capiens meritricem hoc habet saltem boni quod non decipitur quia scit eam sic esse quod non contingit aliis a fornicator in seneca constuprated two wenches in a night for satisfaction the one desired to hang him the other to marry him hierome king of syracuse in sicily espoused himself to pitho keeper of the stews and ptolemy took thais a common whore to be his wife had two sons leontiscus and lagus by her and one daughter irene tis therefore no such unlikely thing a citizen of engubine gelded himself to try his wife's honesty and to be freed from jealousy so did a baker in basil to the same intent but of all other precedents in this kind that of combalus is most memorable 
who to prevent his master's suspicion for he was a beautiful young man and sent by seleucus his lord and king with stratonici the queen to conduct her into syria fearing the worst gelded himself before he went and left his genitals behind him in a box sealed up his mistress by the way fell in love with him but he not yielding to her was accused to seleucus of incontinency as that bellerophon was in like case falsely traduced by zenobia to king prytus her husband cum non possit ad coitum inducere and that by her and was therefore at his coming home cast into prison the day of hearing appointed he was sufficiently cleared and acquitted by showing his privities which to the admiration of the beholders he had formerly cut off the lydians used to geld women whom they suspected saith leonicus varia historia book three chapter forty nine as well as men to this purpose saint francis because he used to confess women in private to prevent suspicion and prove himself a maid stripped himself before the bishop of assisi and others and friar leonard for the same cause went through viterbium in italy without any garments our pseudo-catholics to help these inconveniences which proceed from jealousy to keep themselves and their wives honest make severe laws against adultery present death and withal fornication a venial sin as a sink to convey that furious and swift stream of concupiscence they appoint and permit stews those punks and pleasant sinners the more to secure their wives in all populous cities for they hold them as necessary as churches and howsoever unlawful yet to avoid a greater mischief to be tolerated in policy as usury for the hardness of men's hearts and for this end they have whole colleges of courtesans in their towns and cities of cato's mind belike that would have his servants cum anciris congredi coitus causa definitu aere ut graviora facinora evitarent caeteris interim interdicens familiar with some such feminine creatures to avoid worse mischiefs in his house and made allowance for it they hold it impossible for idle persons young rich and lusty so many servants monks friars to live honest too tyrannical a burden to compel them to be chaste and most unfit to suffer poor men younger brothers and soldiers at all to marry as those diseased persons votaries priests servants therefore as well to keep and ease the one as the other they tolerate and wink at these kind of brothel houses and stews many probable arguments they have to prove the lawfulness the necessity and a toleration of them as of usury and without question in policy they are not to be contradicted but altogether in religion others prescribe philters spells charms to keep men and women honest mulier ut alienum virum non admitat praeter suum accipe fel hirci et adipem et exica calescat in oleo etc et non alium praeter et amabit in alexi porta etc plura invenies et multo his absurdiora uti et in rasi ne mulia virum admitat et maritum solum diligat etc but these are most part pagan impious irreligious absurd and ridiculous devices 
the best means to avoid these and like inconveniences are to take away the causes and occasions to this purpose varro writ satiram menipeam but it is lost patritius prescribes four rules to be observed in choosing of a wife which whoso will may read fonseca the spaniard in his forty-fifth chapter amphitheatrum amorum sets down six special cautions for men four for women samuel neander out of schonbernerus five for men five for women anthony guevara many good lessons cleobulus two alone others otherwise as first to make a good choice in marriage to invite christ to their wedding and which saint ambrose adviseth deum conjugii praesidim habere and to pray to him for her a domino enim datur uxor prudens proverba nineteen not to be too rash and precipitate in his election to run upon the first he meets or dote on every stout fair piece he sees but to choose her as much by his ears as eyes to be well advised whom he takes of what age etc and cautelous in his proceedings an old man should not marry a young woman nor a young woman an old man quam male ene quales veniunt ad errata juvenci such matches must needs minister a perpetual cause of suspicion and be distasteful to each other noctua ut in tumulis super atque caravero bubo talis apud sophoclem nostra puella sedet night crows on tombs owl sits on carcass dead so lies a wench with sophocles in bed for sophocles as athenaeus describes him was a very old man as cold as january a bedfellow of bones and doted yet upon archipe a young courtesan than which nothing can be more odious senex maritus uxori ueni ingratus est an old man is a most unwelcome guest to a young wench unable unfit amplexus suos fugiunt puellae omnis horet amor venusque hymenque and as in like case a good fellow that had but a peck of corn weekly to grind yet would needs build a new mill for it found his error eftsoons for either he must let his mill lie waste pull it quite down or let others grind at it so these men etc seneca therefore disallows all such unseasonable matches habent enem maledicti locum crebrae nuptiae and as tully farther inveighs tis unfit for any but ugly and filthy in old age torpe senilis amor one of the three things god hateth plutarch in his book contra coletin rails downright at such kind of marriages which are attempted by old men qui jam corpore impotenti et a voluptatibus deserti peccant animo and makes a question whether in some cases it be tolerable at least for such a man to marry qui venerem affectat sine viribus that is now past those venerous exercises as a gelded man lies with a virgin and sighs ecclesiasticus thirty twenty and now complains with him in petronius funerata est haec pars jam quad fuit olim achillea he is quite done vixit puellae nuper idoneus et militavit non sine gloria 
but the question is whether he may delight himself as those priapean popes which in their decrepit age lay commonly between two wenches every night contactu formosarum et contractatione nomad hoc gaudeat and as many doting sires do to their own shame their children's undoing and their family's confusion he abhors it tanquam ab agresti et furioso domino fugiendum it must be avoided as a bedlam master and not obeyed alecto ipsa faces praefert nubentibus et malus hymen triste ululat the devil himself makes such matches lewinus lemnius reckons up three things which generally disturb the peace of marriage the first is when they marry intempestive or unseasonably as many mortal men marry precipitately and inconsiderately when they are effete and old the second when they marry unequally for fortunes and birth the third when a sick impotent person weds one that is sound novae nuptae spes frustratur many dislikes instantly follow many doting dizzards it may not be denied as plutarch confesseth recreate themselves with such obsolete unseasonable and filthy remedies so he calls them with a remembrance of their former pleasures against nature they stir up their dead flesh but an old lecher is abominable mulier tertio nubens nevisanus holds praesumitur lubrica et inconstans a woman that marries a third time may be presumed to be no honester than she should of them both thus ambrose concludes in his comment upon luke they that are coupled together not to get children but to satisfy their lust are not husbands but fornicators with whom saint augustine consents matrimony without hope of children non matrimonium sed concubium dici debet is not a wedding but a jumbling or coupling together in a word except they wed for mutual society help and comfort one of another in which respects though tiberius deny it without question old folks may well marry for sometimes a man hath most need of a wife according to puccius when he hath no need of a wife otherwise it is most odious when an old Asherontic dizzard that hath one foot in his grave, a Silicernium, shall flicker after a young wench that is blithe and bonny. Salaciorque verno passere et albulis columbis. What can be more detestable? Tu cano capite amas senex nequissime jam plenus aetatis, animaque fetida senex hircosus tu osculare mulierem, utine adiens vomitum potius excuties. Thou old goat, hoary lecher, naughty man, with stinking breath art thou in love? Must thou be slavering? She spews to see thy filthy face it doth so move yet as some will it is much more tolerable for an old man to marry a young woman our lady's match they call it for cras erit mulier as he said in tully cato the roman critobulus in xenophon tiraquellus of late julius scaliger etc and many famous precedents we have in that kind but not a contra tis not held fit for an ancient woman to match with a young man for as varro will annus dum ludit morti delitias facit 
tis charon's match between cascus and casca and the devil himself is surely well pleased with it and therefore as the poet inveighs thou old vetustina bedridden queen that art now skin and bones cui tres capili quatuorque sunt dentes pectus cicade crusculumque formicae rugosiorem quae geris stola frontem et arenaram casibus pares mamas that hast three hairs four teeth a breast like grasshopper an emmet's crest a skin more rugged than thy coat and dugs like spider's web to boot must thou marry a youth again and yet ducentas ire nuptum post mortes amant howsoever it is as apulius gives out of his meroe congressus anosus pestilens abhorrendus a pestilent match abominable and not to be endured in such case how can they otherwise choose but be jealous how should they agree one with another this inequality is not in years only but in birth fortunes conditions and all good qualities si qua voles apte nubere nube pare tis my counsel saith anthony Guevara, to choose such a one civis civem ducat nobilis nobilem let a citizen match with a citizen a gentleman with a gentlewoman he that observes not this precept saith he non generum sed malum genium non nurum sed furiam non vitae comitem sed litis fomitem domi habebit instead of a fair wife shall have a fury for a fit son-in-law a mere fiend etc examples are too frequent another main caution fit to be observed is this that though they be equal in years birth fortunes and other conditions yet they do not omit virtue and good education which musonius and antipater so much inculcate in stobaeus dos est magna parentum virtus et metuens alterius viri certo federe castitas if as plutarch adviseth one must eat modium salis a bushel of salt with him before he choose his friend what care should be had in choosing a wife his second self how solicitous should he be to know her qualities and behaviour and when he is assured of them not to prefer birth fortune beauty before bringing up and good conditions cocage god of cuckolds as one merrily said accompanies the goddess jealousy both follow the fairest by jupiter's appointment and they sacrifice to them together beauty and honesty seldom agree straight personages have often crooked manners fair faces foul vices good complexions ill conditions suspicionis plena res est et insidiarum beauty saith chrysostom is full of treachery and suspicion he that hath a fair wife cannot have a worse mischief and yet most covet it as if nothing else in marriage but that and wealth were to be respected francis sforza duke of milan was so curious in this behalf that he would not marry the duke of mantua's daughter except he might see her naked first which lycurgus appointed in his laws and morus in his utopian commonwealth approves in italy as a traveller observes if a man have three or four daughters or more and they prove fair they are married eftsoons if deformed 
they change their lovely names of Lucia, Cynthia, Camaina, call them Dorothy, Ursula, Bridget, and so put them into monasteries, as if none were fit for marriage but such as are eminently fair. But these are erroneous tenets. A modest virgin, well conditioned, to such a fair snout piece is much to be preferred. If thou wilt avoid them, take away all causes of suspicion and jealousy, marry a coarse piece, fetch her from Cassandra's temple, which was wont in Italy to be a sanctuary of all deformed maids, and so shalt thou be sure that no man will make thee cuckold but for spite. A citizen of Byzance in France had a filthy, dowdy, deformed slut to his wife, and, finding her in bed with another man, cried out as one amazed, O oh, miser! Quae te necessitas huc adeget. O oh, thou wretch, what necessity brought thee hither? As well he might, for who can affect such a one? But this is warily to be understood. Most offend in another extreme. They prefer wealth before beauty, and so she be rich they care not how she look. But these are all out as faulty as the rest. Attendenda uxoras forma, as Salisburiensis adviseth, ne si alteram espexeris, mox eam sordere putes, as the knight in Chaucer that was married to an old woman, and all day after hid him as an owl, so woe was his wife looked so foul. Have a care of thy wife's complexion, lest whilst thou seest another, thou loathest her, she prove jealous, thou not. Si tibi deformis coniux, si serva venusta, ne utaris serva. I can, perhaps, give instance. Molestum est possidere, quod nemo habere dignetur, a misery to possess that which no man likes, on the other side, difficile custoditur quod plures amant. And as the bragging soldier vaunted in the comedy, nimia est miseria pulcrum esse hominem nimis, Scipio did never so hardly besiege Carthage as these young gallants will beset thine house, one with wit or person, another with wealth, etc. If she be fair, saith Guadzo, she will be suspected howsoever. Both extremes are not. Pulcra quito adamatur, fede facile concupiscit. The one is soon beloved, the other loves. One is hardly kept because proud and arrogant, the other not worth keeping. What is to be done in this case? Aeneas in Menelippe adviseth thee as a friend to take statam formam siwis habere in columem pudicitiam, one of a middle size, neither too fair nor too foul. Nec formosa magis quam mihi casta placet. With old Cato, though fit let her beauty be, neque lectissima neque illiberalis between both this i approve but of the other two i resolve with salisburiensis caeteris paribus both rich alike endowed alike majori miseria deformis habetur quam formosa servatur i had rather marry a fair one and put it to the hazard than be troubled with a blouse but do as thou wilt, I speak only of myself. Howsoever, quod iterum maneo, I would advise thee thus much, be she fair or foul, to choose a wife out of a good kindred, parentage, well brought up in an honest place. 
primum animo tibi proponas quo sanguine creta, qua forma, qua aetate, quibus que ante omnia virgo moribus iniunctos veniat nova nupta penates. He that marries a wife out of a suspected inn or alehouse, buys a horse in Smithfield, and hires a servant in Paul's, as the diverb is, shall likely have a jade to his horse, a knave for his man, an arrant honest woman to his wife. Filia praesumitur esse matrisimilis, saith Nevisanus, such a mother, such a daughter, mali corvi malum ovum, cat to her kind. Scilicit expectas ut tradat mater honestos, atque alios mores quam quos habet. If the mother be dishonest, in all likelihood the daughter will matrezare, take after her in all good qualities. Creden pacifae non tore potente futuram tauripetam? If the dam trot, the foal will not amble. My last caution is that a woman do not bestow herself upon a fool or an apparent melancholy person. Jealousy is a symptom of that disease, and fools have no moderation. Justina, a Roman lady, was much persecuted, and, after made away by her jealous husband, she caused and enjoined this epitaph as a caveat to others to be engraven on her tomb. Discite ab exemplo justinae, discite patres, ne nubat fatuo filia vestra viro, etc. Learn, parents all, and by Justina's case, your children to no dizzards for to place. After marriage, I can give no better admonitions than to use their wives well, and which a friend of mine told me that was a married man, I will tell you as good cheap, saith Nicostratus in Stobaeus, to avoid future strife and for quietness sake. When you are in bed, Take heed of your wife's flattering speeches overnight and curtain sermons in the morning. Let them do their endeavor likewise to maintain them to their means, which Patricius ingeminates, and let them have liberty with discretion as time and place requires. Many women turn queens by compulsion, as Nebusanus observes, because their husbands are so hard, and keep them so short in diet and apparel, paupertas cogit eas meretricari, poverty and hunger, want of means, makes them dishonest, or bad usage, their churlish behavior forceth them to fly out, or bad examples, they do it to cry quittance. In the other extreme, some are too liberal, as the proverb is, turdus malum sibi cacat, they make a rod for their own tails, as Candaules did to Gyges in Herodotus, commend his wife's beauty himself, and besides would needs have him see her naked. Whilst they give their wives too much liberty to gad abroad, and bountiful allowance, they are accessory to their own miseries. Animae uxorum pessime olent, as Plautus gibes, they have deformed souls, and by their painting and colors procure odium mariti, their husbands hate, especially. Cum misere viscantur labra mariti. Besides, their wives, as Basil notes, Impudenter se exponunt masculorum aspectibus, jactantes tunicas et coram tripudiantes, impudently thrust themselves into other men's companies, and by their indecent wanton carriage provoke and tempt the spectators. 
virtuous women should keep house, and twas well performed and ordered by the Greeks. Mulier nequa in publicum spectandam se sine arbitro praebeat viro, which made Phidias belike at Elis paint Venus treading on a tortoise, a symbol of women's silence and housekeeping. For a woman abroad and alone is like a deer broke out of a park, quam mille venatores in sequuntur, whom every hunter follows and besides in such places she cannot so well vindicate herself but as that virgin dinah genesis thirty four two going for to see the daughters of the land lost her virginity she may be defiled and overtaken of a sudden imbeles damae quid nisi praida sumus and therefore i know not what philosopher he was that would have women come but thrice abroad all their time to be baptized married and buried but he was too straight-laced let them have their liberty in good sort and go in good sort modo non annos viginti aetatis suae domi relinquant as a good fellow said so that they look not twenty years younger abroad than they do at home they be not spruce neat angels abroad beasts dowdies sluts at home but seek by all means to please and give content to their husbands to be quiet above all things obedient silent and patient if they be incensed angry chid a little their wives must not campel again but take it in good part an honest woman i cannot now tell where she dwelt but by report an honest woman she was hearing one of her gossips by chance complain of her husband's impatience told her an excellent remedy for it and gave her withal a glass of water which when he brawled she should hold still in her mouth and that toties quoties as often as he chid she did so two or three times with good success and at length seeing her neighbour gave her great thanks for it and would needs know the ingredients she told her in brief what it was fair water and no more for it was not the water but her silence which performed the cure let every froward woman imitate this example and be quiet within doors and as marcus aurelius prescribes a necessary caution it is to be observed of all good matrons that love their credits to come little abroad but follow their work at home look to their household affairs and private business oikonomiae incumbentes be sober thrifty wary circumspect modest and compose themselves to live to their husband's means as a good housewife should do quae studiis gawisicoli partita labores fallet opus cantu formae assimulata coronae cura puellaris circum fusosque rotasque cum volvet etc howsoever tis good to keep them private not in prison quis quis custodit uxorem vectibus et seris et si sibi sapiens stultus est et nihil sapit read more of this subject horologium principium book two per totum arnesaeus politica cyprian tertullian bossus de mulieribus apparatus godefridus de amoribus book two chapter four lewinus lemnius chapter fifty four de institutione christianae barbaros de reuxoria book two chapter two franciscus patritius de institutione republicae book 4 
tituli four and five de officio mariti et uxoris christoforo fonseca amphitheatrum amorum chapter forty five samuel neander etc these cautions concern him and if by those or his own discretion otherwise he cannot moderate himself his friends must not be wanting by their wisdom if it be possible to give the party grieved satisfaction to prevent and remove the occasions objects if it may be to secure him if it be one alone or many to consider whom he suspects or at what times in what places he is most incensed in what companies nevisanus makes a question whether a young physician ought to be admitted in cases of sickness into a new married man's house to administer a julep a syrup or some such physic the persians of old would not suffer a young physician to come amongst women apollonides cos made artaxerxes cuckold and was after buried alive for it a jailer in aristinatus had a fine young gentleman to his prisoner in commiseration of his youth and person he let him loose to enjoy the liberty of the prison but he unkindly made him a cornuto menelaus gave good welcome to paris a stranger his whole house and family were at his command but he ungently stole away his best beloved wife the like measure was offered to aegis king of lacedaemon by alcibiades an exile for his good entertainment he was too familiar with timea his wife begetting a child of her called leotychides and bragging moreover when he came home to athens that he had a son should be king of the lacedaemonians if such objects were removed no doubt but the parties might easily be satisfied or that they could use them gently and entreat them well not to revile them scoff at hate them as in such cases commonly they do tis a human infirmity a miserable vexation and they should not add grief to grief nor aggravate their misery but seek to please and by all means give them content by good counsel removing such offensive objects or by mediation of some discreet friends in old rome there was a temple erected by the matrons to that Placadea, another to venus verticorda quae maritos uxoribus redebat benevolos whither if any difference happened between man and wife they did instantly resort there they did offer sacrifice a white heart plutarch records sine fele without the gall some say the like of juno's temple and make their prayers for conjugal peace before some indifferent arbitrators and friends the matter was heard between man and wife and commonly composed in our times we want no sacred churches or good men to end such controversies if use were made of them some say that precious stone called beryllus others a diamond hath excellent virtue contra hostium injurias et conjugatos in vicem conciliare to reconcile men and wives to maintain unity and love you may try this when you will and as you see cause if none of all these means and cautions will take place i know not what remedy to prescribe or whither such persons may go for ease except they can get into the same turkey paradise where they shall have as many fair wives as they will themselves with clear eyes and such as look on none but their own husbands no fear no danger of being cuckolds or else i would have them observe that strict rule of alphonsus to marry a deaf and dumb man to a blind woman if this will not help 
let them to prevent the worst consult with an astrologer and see whether the significators in her horoscope agree with his that they be not in signis et partibus odiose intuentibus aut imperantibus sed mutuo et amice antisciis et obedientibus otherwise as they hold there will be intolerable enmities between them or else get them sigillum veneris a characteristical seal stamped in the day and hour of venus when she is fortunate with such and such set words and charms which villanovanus and leosuavius prescribe ex sigillis magicis salomonis hermetis raguelis etc with many such which alexis albertus and some of our natural magicians put upon us ut mulier cum aliquo adulterare non possit incide di capilis eius etc and he shall surely be gracious in all women's eyes and never suspect or disagree with his own wife so long as he wears it if this course be not approved and other remedies may not be had they must in the last place sue for a divorce but that is somewhat difficult to effect and not all out so fit for as philosacus in his tract de justa uxore urgeth if that law of constantine the great or that of theodosius and valentinian concerning divorce were in use in our times in numeras propemodem viduas haberemus et celebes viros we should have almost no married couples left try therefore those former remedies or as tertullian reports of democritus that put out his eyes because he could not look upon a woman without lust and was much troubled to see that which he might not enjoy let him make himself blind and so he shall avoid that care and molestation of watching his wife one other sovereign remedy i could repeat an especial antidote against jealousy an excellent cure but i am not now disposed to tell it not that like a covetous empiric i conceal it for any gain but some other reasons i am not willing to publish it if you be very desirous to know it when i meet you next i will peradventure tell you what it is in your ear this is the best counsel i can give which he that hath need of as occasion serves may apply unto himself in the meantime diitalem teris avertite pestem as the proverb is from heresy jealousy and frenzy good lord deliver us end of section 34Section 35 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3, by Robert Burton. Section 35. Partition 3, Section 4, Member 1, Subsection 1. Religious Melancholy. Its Object God. What His Beauty Is. How It Allures. The Parts and Parties Affected. That there is such a distinct species of love melancholy, no man hath ever yet doubted. But whether this subdivision of religious melancholy be warrantable, it may be controverted. Pergite peridies medio nec calle vagantem, linquite me, 
qua nulla pedum vestigia ducunt, nulla rotae curus testantur signa priores. I have no pattern to follow as in some of the rest, no man to imitate. No physician hath as yet distinctly written of it as of the other. All acknowledge it a most notable symptom, some a cause, but few a species or kind. Arateus, Alexander, Rassis, Avicenna, and most of our late writers, as Gordonius, Fuxius, Plater, Brühl, Montaltus, etc., repeat it as a symptom. Some seem to be inspired of the Holy Ghost, some take upon them to be prophets, some are addicted to new opinions, some foretell strange things, de statu mundi et antichristi, saith Gordonius. Some will prophesy the end of the world to a day almost, and the fall of the Antichrist, as they have been addicted or brought up, for so melancholy works with them, as Laurentius holds. If they have been precisely given, all their meditations tend that way, and in conclusion produce strange effects the humour imprints symptoms according to their several inclinations and conditions which makes guianerius and felix plater put too much devotion blind zeal fear of eternal punishment and that last judgment for a cause of those enthusiastics and desperate persons but some do not obscurely make a distinct species of it, dividing love melancholy into that whose object is women, and into the other whose object is God. Plato, in Convivio, makes mention of two distinct furies, and amongst our neoterics, Hercules de Saxonia doth expressly treat of it in a distinct species. Love melancholy, saith he, is twofold. The first is that, to which peradventure some will not vouchsafe this name or species of melancholy, affection of those which put God for their object, and are altogether about prayer, fasting, etc., the other about women. Peter Forestus, in his observations, delivereth as much in the same words, and Felix Platerus de Mentis Alienatio, chapter 3, Frequentissima est eius species, in qua curanda saepissime multum fui impeditus. Tis a frequent disease, and they have a ground of what they say, forth of Aretius and Plato. Aretius, an old author, in his third book, chapter 6, doth so divide love melancholy, and derives this second from the first, which comes by inspiration or otherwise. Plato, in his Phaedrus, hath these words, Apollo's priests in Delphos and at Dodona, in their fury do many pretty feats, and benefit the Greeks, but never in their right wits. He makes them all mad, as well he might. And he that shall but consider that superstition of old, those prodigious effects of it, as in its place I will shew the several furies of our Fatidici Dei, Pythonissas, Sibyls, Enthusiasts, Pseudoprophets, Heretics, and Schismatics in these our latter ages, shall instantly confess that all the world again cannot afford so much matter of madness, so many stupendous symptoms as superstition, heresy, schism have brought out, that this species alone may be paralleled to all the former, has a greater latitude and more miraculous effects that it more besots and infatuates men than any other above-named whatsoever, does more harm, works more disquietness to mankind, 
and has more crucified the souls of mortal men such hath been the devil's craft than wars plagues sicknesses dearth famine and all the rest give me but a little leave and i will set before your eyes in brief a stupendous vast infinite ocean of incredible madness and folly a sea full of shelves and rocks sands gulfs euripes and contrary tides full of fearful monsters uncouth shapes roaring waves tempests and siren calms halcyonian seas unspeakable misery such comedies and tragedies such absurd and ridiculous feral and lamentable fits that i know not whether they are more to be pitied or derided or may be believed but that we daily see the same still practised in our days fresh examples nova novitia fresh objects of misery and madness in this kind that are still represented unto us abroad at home in the midst of us in our bosoms but before i can come to treat of these several errors and obliquities their causes symptoms affections etc i must say something necessarily of the object of this love god himself what this love is how it allureth whence it proceeds and which is the cause of all our miseries how we mistake wander and swerve from it amongst all those divine attributes that god doth vindicate to himself eternity omnipotency immutability wisdom majesty justice mercy etc his beauty is not the least one thing saith david have i desired of the lord and that i will still desire to behold the beauty of the Lord. Psalm 27, 4 And out of Sion, which is the perfection of beauty, hath God shined. Psalm 1, 2 All other creatures are fair, I confess, and many other objects do much enamour us. A fair house, a fair horse, a comely person i am amazed saith augustine when i look up to heaven and behold the beauty of the stars the beauty of angels principalities powers who can express it who can sufficiently commend or set out this beauty which appears in us so fair a body so fair a face eyes nose cheeks chin brows all fair and lovely to behold besides the beauty of the soul which cannot be discerned if we so labour and be so much affected with the comeliness of creatures how should we be ravished with that admirable lustre of god himself if ordinary beauty have such a prerogative and power and what is amiable and fair to draw the eyes and ears hearts and affections of all spectators unto it to move win entice allure how shall this divine form ravish our souls which is the fountain and quintessence of all beauty calum pulchrum sed pulchrio cali fabricator if heaven be so fair the sun so fair how much fairer shall he be that made them fair for by the greatness and beauty of the creatures proportionally the maker of them is seen wisdom thirteen five if there be such pleasure in beholding a beautiful person alone and as a plausible sermon he so much affect us 
what shall this beauty of god himself that is infinitely fairer than all creatures men angels etc omnis pulcritudo florem hominum angelorum et rerum omnium pulcerimarum ad dei pulcritudinem colata nox est et tenebrae all other beauties are night itself mere darkness to this our inexplicable incomprehensible unspeakable eternal infinite admirable and divine beauty this lustre pulcritudo omnium pulcherima this beauty and splendor of the divine majesty is it that draws all creatures to it to seek it love admire and adore it and those heathens pagans philosophers out of those relics they have yet left of god's image are so far forth incensed as not only to acknowledge a god but though after their own inventions to stand in admiration of his bounty goodness to adore and seek him the magnificence and structure of the world itself and beauty of all his creatures his goodness providence protection enforceth them to love him seek him fear him though a wrong way to adore him but for us that are christians regenerate that are his adopted sons illuminated by his word having the eyes of our hearts and understandings opened how fairly doth he offer and expose himself ambit nos deus augustine saith donis et forma sua he woos us by his beauty gifts promises to come unto him the whole scripture is a message an exhortation a love letter to this purpose to incite us and invite us god's epistle as gregory calls it to his creatures he sets out his son and his church in that epithalamium or mystical song of solomon to enamour us the more comparing his head to fine gold his locks curled and black as a raven canto four five his eyes like doves on rivers of waters washed with milk his lips as lilies drooping down pure juice his hands as rings of gold set with chrysolite and his church to a vineyard a garden enclosed a fountain of living waters an orchard of pomegranates with sweet scents of saffron spike calamus and cinnamon and all the trees of incense as the chief spices the fairest among women no spot in her his sister his spouse undefiled the only daughter of her mother dear unto her fair as the moon pure as the sun looking out as the morning that by these figures that glass these spiritual eyes of contemplation we might perceive some resemblance of his beauty the love between his church and him and so in the forty-fifth psalm this beauty of his church is compared to a queen in a vesture of gold of ophir embroidered raiment of needlework that the king might take pleasure in her beauty to incense us further yet john in his apocalypse makes a description of that heavenly jerusalem the beauty of it and in it the maker of it likening it to a city of pure gold like unto clear glass shining and garnished with all manner of precious stones having no need of sun or moon for the lamb is the light of it the glory of god doth illuminate it to give us to understand the infinite glory beauty 
and happiness of it not that it is no fairer than these creatures to which it is compared but that this vision of his this lustre of his divine majesty cannot otherwise be expressed to our apprehensions no tongue can tell no heart can conceive it as paul saith moses himself exodus thirty three eighteen when he desired to see god in his glory was answered that he might not endure it no man could see his face and live sensibile forte destruit sensum a strong object overcometh the sight according to that axiom in philosophy fulgorem solis fere non potes multo magis creatoris if thou canst not endure the sunbeams how canst thou endure that fulgor and brightness of him that made the sun the sun itself and all that we can imagine are but shadows of it tis visio praecellens as augustine calls it the quintessence of beauty this which far exceeds the beauty of heavens sun and moon stars angels gold and silver woods fair fields and whatsoever is pleasant to behold all those other beauties fail vary are subject to corruption to loathing but this is an immortal vision a divine beauty an immortal love an indefatigable love and beauty with sight of which we shall never be tired nor wearied but still the more we see the more we shall covet him for as one saith where this vision is there is absolute beauty and where is that beauty from the same fountain comes all pleasure and happiness neither can beauty pleasure happiness be separated from his vision or sight or his vision from beauty pleasure happiness in this life we have but a glimpse of this beauty and happiness we shall hereafter as john saith see him as he is thine eyes as isaiah promiseth thirty three seventeen shall behold the king in his glory then shall we be perfectly enamoured have a full fruition of it desire behold and love him alone as the most amiable and fairest object or summum bonum or chiefest good this likewise should we now have done had not our will been corrupted and as we are enjoined to love god with all our heart and all our soul for to that end were we born to love this object as melanchthon discourseth and to enjoy it and him our will would have loved and sought alone as our summum bonum or principal good and all other good things for god's sake and nature as she proceeded from it would have sought this fountain but in this infirmity of human nature this order is disturbed our love is corrupt and a man is like that monster in plato composed of a scylla a lion and a man we are carried away headlong with the torrents of our affections the world and that infinite variety of pleasing objects in it do so allure and enamour us that we cannot so much as look towards god seek him or think on him as we should we cannot saith augustine republica celestem cogitare we cannot contain ourselves from them their sweetness is so pleasing to us marriage saith gualter detains many a thing in itself laudable good and necessary but many 
deceived and carried away with the blind love of it, have quite laid aside the love of God and desire of his glory. Meat and drink hath overcome as many, whilst they rather strive to please, satisfy their guts and belly, than to serve God and nature. Some are so busied about merchandise to get money, they lose their own souls whilst covetously carried, and with an insatiable desire of gain they forget God. As much we may say of honour, leagues, friendships, health, wealth, and all other profits or pleasures in this life whatsoever. In this world there be so many beautiful objects, splendours and brightness of gold, majesty of glory, assistance of friends, fair promises, smooth words, victories, triumphs, and such an infinite company of pleasing beauties to allure us and draw us from God that we cannot look after him. And this is it which Christ himself those prophets and apostles so much thundered against. First John seventeen fifteen, Dehort us from. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 16. For all that is in the world, as lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life is not of the father but of the world and the world passeth away and the lust thereof but he that fulfilleth the will of god abideth for ever no man saith our saviour can serve two masters but he must love the one and hate the other etc bonos vel malos mores boni vel mali faciunt amores augustine well infers and this is that which all the fathers inculcate he cannot augustine admonisheth be god's friend that is delighted with the pleasures of the world make clean thine heart purify thine heart if thou wilt see this beauty prepare thyself for it it is the eye of contemplation by which we must behold it, the wing of meditation which lifts us up and rears our souls with the motion of our hearts and sweetness of contemplation. So saith Gregory, cited by Bonaventure. And as Philo Judaeus seconds him, he that loves God will soar aloft and take him wings, and leaving the earth fly up to heaven, wander with sun and moon, stars, and that heavenly troop, God himself being his guide. If we desire to see him, we must lay aside all vain objects which detain us and dazzle our eyes, and as Ficinus adviseth us, get us solar eyes, spectacles as they that look on the sun to see this divine beauty lay aside all material objects all sense and then thou shalt see him as he is thou covetous wretch as augustine expostulates why dost thou stand gaping on this dross muck hills filthy excrements behold a far fairer object god himself woos thee behold him enjoy him he is sick for love canto five he invites thee to his sight to come into his fair garden to eat and drink with him to be merry with him to enjoy his presence for ever wisdom cries out in the streets besides the gates in the top of high places before the city at the entry of the door and bids them give ear to her instruction which is better than gold or precious stones no pleasures can be compared to it leave all then and follow her 
vos exhortor o amici et obsecro in ficinus's words i exhort and beseech you that you would embrace and follow this divine love with all your hearts and abilities by all offices and endeavours make this so loving god propitious unto you for whom alone saith plotinus we must forsake the kingdoms and empires of the whole earth sea land and air if we desire to be engrafted into him leave all and follow him now for as much as this love of god is a habit infused of god as thomas holds book two question twenty three by which a man is inclined to love god above all and his neighbour as himself we must pray to god that he will open our eyes make clear our hearts that we may be capable of his glorious rays and perform those duties that he requires of us deuteronomy six and joshua twenty three to love god above all and our neighbour as ourself to keep his commandments in this we know saith john chapter five two we love the children of god when we love god and keep his commandments this is the love of god that we keep his commandments he that loveth not knoweth not god for god is love chapter four eight and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in god and god in him for love presupposeth knowledge faith hope and unites us to god himself as leon hebraeus delivereth unto us and is accompanied with the fear of god humility meekness patience all those virtues and charity itself for if we love god we shall love our neighbour and perform the duties which are required at our hands to which we are exhorted first corinthians fifteen four and five ephesians four colossians three romans twelve we shall not be envious or puffed up or boast disdain think evil or be provoked to anger but suffer all things endeavour to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace forbear one another forgive one another clothe the naked visit the sick and perform all those works of mercy which clemens alexandrinus calls amoris et amicitiae impletionem et extentionem the extent and complement of love and that not for fear or worldly respects but ordine ad deum for the love of god himself this we shall do if we be truly enamoured but we come short in both we neither love god nor our neighbour as we should our love in spiritual things is too defective in worldly things too excessive there is a jar in both we love the world too much god too little our neighbour not at all or for our own ends vulgus amicitias utilitate probat the chief thing we respect is our commodity and what we do is for fear of worldly punishment for vain glory praise of men fashion and such by respects not for god's sake we neither know god aright nor seek love or worship him as we should and for these defects we involve ourselves into a multitude of errors we swerve from this true love and worship of god which is a cause unto us of unspeakable miseries running into both extremes we become fools madmen 
without sense, as now in the next place I will show you. The parties affected are innumerable almost, and scattered over the face of the earth far and near, and so have been in all precedent ages, from the beginning of the world to these times, of all sorts and conditions. For method's sake, I will reduce them to a twofold division, according to those two extremes of excess and defect, impiety and superstition, idolatry and atheism. Not that there is any excess of divine worship or love of God. That cannot be. We cannot love God too much, or do our duty as we ought, as papists hold, or have any perfection in this life, much less supererogate. When we have all done, we are unprofitable servants. But because we do aliud agere, zealous without knowledge and too solicitous about that which is not necessary, busying ourselves about impertinent, needless, idle and vain ceremonies, populo ut placerent, as the Jews did about sacrifices, oblations, offerings, incense, new moons, feasts, etc. But Isaiah taxeth them, 1, 12, who required this at your hands. We have too great opinion of our own worth that we can satisfy the law, and do more than is required at our hands by performing those evangelical counsels and such works of supererogation, merit for others, which Bellarmine, Gregory de Valentia, all their Jesuits and champions defend, that if God should deal in rigor with them, some of their Franciscans and Dominicans are so pure that nothing could be objected to them. Some of us again are too dear, as we think, more divine and sanctified than others, of a better metal, greater gifts, and with that proud Pharisee, contemn others in respect of ourselves. We are better Christians, better learned, choice spirits, inspired, no more, have special revelation, perceive God's secrets, and thereupon presume, say, and do that many times which is not befitting to be said or done. Of this number are all superstitious idolaters, ethnics, Mahometans, Jews, heretics, enthusiasts, divinators, prophets, sectaries, and schismatics. Zanchius reduceth such infidels to four chief sects, but I will insist and follow mine own intended method. All which with many other curious persons, monks, hermits, etc., may be ranged in this extreme, and fight under this superstitious banner, with those rude idiots and infinite swarms of people that are seduced by them. In the other extreme, or in defect, march those impious epicures, libertines, atheists, hypocrites, infidels, worldly, secure, impenitent, unthankful and carnal-minded men, that attribute all to natural causes, that will acknowledge no supreme power, that have cauterized consciences, or live in a reprobate sense, or such desperate persons as are too distrustful of his mercies. Of these there be many subdivisions, diverse degrees of madness and folly, some more than other, as shall be shown in the symptoms, and yet all miserably out, perplexed, doting, and beside themselves for religion's sake. For as Zanke well distinguished, and all the world knows, religion is twofold, true 
or false false is that vain superstition of idolaters such as were of old greeks romans present mahometans etc temorem deorum inanem tully could term it or as zanchi defines it ubi falsi dii ut falso culu colitur deus when false gods or that god is falsely worshipped and tis a miserable plague a torture of the soul a mere madness religiosa insania meteran calls it or insanus error as seneca a frantic error or as augustine insanus animi morbus a furious disease of the soul insania omnium insanissima a quintessence of madness for he that is superstitious can never be quiet tis proper to man alone uni superbia avaritia superstitio saith pliny book seven chapter one atque etiam post saevit de futuro which wrings his soul for the present and to come the greatest misery belongs to mankind a perpetual servitude a slavery ex timore timor a heavy yoke the seal of damnation an intolerable burden they that are superstitious are still fearing suspecting vexing themselves with auguries prodigies false tales dreams idle vain works unprofitable labours as bocerus observes cura mentis ancipite versantur enemies to god and to themselves in a word as seneca concludes religio deum colit superstitio destruit superstition destroys but true religion honours god true religion ubi veros deus vere colitur where the true god is truly worshipped is the way to heaven the mother of virtues love fear devotion obedience knowledge etc it rears the dejected soul of man and amidst so many cares miseries persecutions which this world affords it is a soul ease an unspeakable comfort a sweet reposal jugum suave et lewe a light yoke an anchor and a haven it adds courage boldness and begets generous spirits although tyrants rage persecute and that bloody lictor or sergeant be ready to martyr them aut lita aut morere as in those persecutions of the primitive church it was put in practice as you may read in eusebius and others though enemies be now ready to invade and all in an uproar si fractus illabatur orbis impavidos ferient ruinae though heaven should fall on his head he would not be dismayed but as a good christian prince once made answer to a menacing turk facile scelerata hominum arma contemnit qui del presidio tutus est or as phalaris writ to alexander in a wrong cause he nor any other enemy could terrify him for that he trusted in god si deus nobiscum quis contra nos in all calamities persecutions whatsoever as david did second samuel two twenty two he will sing with him the lord is my rock my fortress my strength my refuge the tower and horn of my salvation etc in all troubles and adversities psalm forty six one god is my hope and help 
still ready to be found, I will not therefore fear, etc. Tis a fear expelling fear. He hath peace of conscience and is full of hope, which is, saith Augustine, vita vitae mortalis. The life of this our mortal life, hope of immortality, the sole comfort of our misery. Otherwise, as Paul saith, we of all others were most wretched, but this makes us happy, counterpoising our hearts in all miseries. Superstition torments and is from the devil, the author of lies, but this is from God himself, as Lucian, that Antiochian priest, made his divine confession in Eusebius, Octor nobis de Deo Deus est. God is the author of our religion himself. His word is our rule, a lantern to us, dictated by the Holy Ghost. He plays upon our hearts as many harp strings, and we are his temples. He dwelleth in us, and we in him. The part affected of superstition is the brain, heart, will, understanding, soul itself and all the faculties of it, totum compositum, all is mad and dotes. Now for the extent, as I say, the world itself is the subject of it, to omit that grand sin of atheism. All times have been misaffected, past, present. There is not one that doth good, no, not one, from the prophet to the priest, etc. A lamentable thing it is to consider how many myriads of men this idolatry and superstition, for that comprehends all, hath infatuated in all ages, besotted by this blind zeal which is religion's ape, religion's bastard, religion's shadow, false glass. For where God hath a temple, the devil will have a chapel. Where God hath sacrifices, the devil will have his oblations. Where God hath ceremonies, the devil will have his traditions. Where there is any religion, the devil will plant superstition. And tis a pitiful sight to behold and read what tortures, miseries it hath procured, what slaughter of souls it hath made, how it rageth amongst those old Persians, Syrians, Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, Tuscans, Gauls, Germans, Britons, etc. Britannia yam hodie celebrat tam atonite, saith Pliny. Tantis ceremoniis, speaking of superstition, ut dedice persis videri posit. The Britons are so stupendly superstitious in their ceremonies that they go beyond those Persians. He that shall but read in Pausanias alone those gods, temples, altars, idols, statues so curiously made with such infinite cost and charge amongst those old Greeks, such multitudes of them and frequent varieties, as Gerbelius truly observes, may stand amazed and never enough wonder at it, and thank God withal that by the light of the gospel we are so happily freed from that slavish idolatry in these our days. But heretofore, almost in all countries, in all places, superstition hath blinded the hearts of men. In all ages, what a small portion hath the true church ever been? Divisum imperium cum Jove daimon habet. The patriarchs and their families, the Israelites a handful in respect, Christ and his apostles, and not all of them neither. Into what straits hath it been compinged, a little flock? How hath superstition on the other side dilated herself? Error, ignorance, barbarism, folly, madness, deceived, triumphed, and insulted over the most wise, 
discreet and understanding man philosophers dynasts monarchs all were involved and overshadowed in this mist in more than cimmerian darkness adeo ignara superstitio mentes hominum depravat et non nunquam sapientum animos transversos agit at this present quota pars how small a part is truly religious how little in respect divide the world into six parts and one or not so much as christians idolaters and mahometans possess almost asia africa america magellanica the kings of china great cham siam and borneo pegu Deccan, narsinga japan etc are gentiles idolaters and many other petty princes in asia monomotopa congo and i know not how many negro princes in africa all terra australis incognita most of america pagans differing all in their several superstitions and yet all idolaters the mahometans extend themselves over the great turks dominions in europe africa asia to the zerifes in barbary and its territories in fez sus morocco etc the tartar the great mogor the sophi of persia with most of their dominions and subjects are at this day mahometans see how the devil rageth those at odds or differing among themselves some for ali some enbokar for akmor and ozimen those four doctors mahomet's successors and are subdivided into seventy-two inferior sects as leo affer reports the jews as a company of vagabonds are scattered over all parts whose story present estate progress from time to time is fully set down by mr thomas jackson doctor of divinity in his comment on the creed a fifth part of the world and hardly that now professeth christ but so enlarded and interlaced with several superstitions that there is scarce a sound part to be found or any agreement amongst them presbyter john in africa lord of those abyssinians or ethiopians is by his profession a christian but so different from us with such new absurdities and ceremonies such liberty such a mixture of idolatry and paganism that they keep little more than a bare title of christianity they suffer polygamy circumcision stupend fastings divorce as they will themselves etc and as the papists call on the virgin mary so do they on thomas didymus before christ the greek or eastern church is rent from this of the west and as they have four chief patriarchs so have they four subdivisions besides those nestorians jacobins syrians armenians georgians etc scattered over asia minor syria egypt etc greece wallachia circassia bulgaria bosnia albania illyricum sclavonia croatia thrace serbia raskia and a sprinkling amongst the tartars the russians muscovites and most of that great duke's sars subjects are part of the greek church and still christians but as one saith temporis successu multas ilia diderunt superstitiones in process of time they have added so many superstitions they be rather semi-christians than otherwise that which remains is the western church with us in europe but so eclipsed with several schisms heresies and superstitions 
that one knows not where to find it the papists have italy spain savoy part of germany france poland and a sprinkling in the rest of europe in america they hold all that which spaniards inhabit hispania nova castella aurea peru etc in the east indies the philippines some small holds about goa malacca zelan ormus etc which the portuguese got not long since and those land-leaping jesuits have essayed in china japan as appears by their yearly letters in africa they have melinda quiloa mombaze etc and some few towns they drive out one superstition with another poland is a receptacle of all religions where samosetans socinians photinians now protected in transylvania and poland arians anabaptists are to be found as well as in some german cities scandia is christian but damianus agois the portugal knight complains so mixed with magic pagan rites and ceremonies they may be as well counted idolaters what tacitus formerly said of a like nation is verified in them a people subject to superstition contrary to religion and some of them as about lapland and the pilapeans the devil's possession to this day misera haec gens saith mine author satanae hac tenus possessio et quod maxime mirandum et dolendum and which is to be admired and pitied if any of them be baptized which the kings of sweden much labour they die within seven or nine days after and for that cause they will hardly be brought to christianity but worship still the devil who daily appears to them in their idolatrous courses gandentibus diis patriis quos religiose colunt etc yet are they very superstitious like our wild irish though they of the better note the kings of denmark and sweden themselves that govern them be lutherans the remnant are calvinists lutherans in germany equally mixed and yet the emperor himself dukes of lorraine bavaria and the princes electors are most part professed papists and though some part of france and ireland great britain half the cantons in switzerland and the low countries be calvinists more defecate than the rest yet at odds amongst themselves not free from superstition and which brochard the monk in his description of the holy land after he had censured the greek church and showed their errors concluded at last faxit deus ne latinis multa irepserint stultifies i say god grant there be no fopperies in our church as a dam of water stopped in one place breaks out into another so doth superstition i say nothing of anabaptists socinians brownists familists etc there is superstition in our prayers often in our hearing of sermons bitter contentions invectives persecutions strange conceits besides diversity of opinions schisms factions etc but as the lord job forty two chapter seven five said to eliphaz the temanite and his two friends his wrath was kindled against them for they had not spoken of him things that were right we may justly of these schismatics and heretics how wise soever in their own conceits non recte loquuntur de deo they speak not they think not 
they write not well of god and as they ought and therefore quid quaeso mi dorpi as erasmus concludes to dorpius hisce theologis faciamus aut quid preceris nisi forte fidelum medicum qui cerebro mediatur what shall we wish them but sanam mentem and a good physician but more of their differences paradoxes opinions mad pranks in the symptoms i now hasten to the causes end of section thirty five Section 36 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 3, by Robert Burton section thirty six partition three section four member one subsection two part one causes of religious melancholy from the devil by miracles apparitions oracles his instruments or factors politicians priests impostors heretics blind guides in them simplicity, fear, blind zeal, ignorance, solitariness, curiosity, pride, vainglory, presumption, etc. His engines, fasting, solitariness, hope, fear, etc. We are taught in Holy Scripture that the devil rangeth abroad like a roaring lion, still seeking whom he may devour. And as in several shapes, so by several engines and devices he goeth about to seduce us. Sometimes he transforms himself into an angel of light, and is so cunning that he is able, if it were possible, to deceive the very elect. He will be worshipped as God himself, and is so adored by the heathen and esteemed and in imitation of that divine power as eusebius observes to abuse or emulate god's glory as dandinus adds he will have all homage sacrifices oblations and whatsoever else belongs to the worship of god to be done likewise unto him similis erit altissimo and by this means infatuates the world, deludes, entraps, and destroys many a thousand souls. Sometimes by dreams, visions, as God to Moses by familiar conference, the devil in several shapes talks with them. In the Indies it is common, and in China nothing so familiar as apparitions, inspirations, oracles, by terrifying them with false prodigies, counterfeit miracles, sending storms, tempests, diseases, plagues, as of old in Athens there was Apollo Alexicacus, Apollo Loimios, Pestifer et Malorum Depulsor, raising wars, seditions by spectrums, troubling their consciences, driving them to despair, terrors of mind, intolerable pains by promises rewards benefits and fair means he raiseth such an opinion of his deity and greatness that they dare not do otherwise than adore him do as he will have them they dare not offend him and to compel them more to stand in awe of him he sends and cures diseases disquiets their spirits as cyprian saith torments and terrifies their souls to make them adore him and all his study 
all his endeavour is to divert them from true religion to superstition and because he is damned himself and in an error he would have all the world participate of his errors and be damned with him the primum mobile therefore and first mover of all superstition is the devil that great enemy of mankind the principal agent who in a thousand several shapes after diverse fashions with several engines illusions and by several names hath deceived the inhabitants of the earth in several places and countries still rejoicing at their falls all the world over before christ's time he freely domineered and held the souls of men in most slavish subjection saith eusebius in diverse forms ceremonies and sacrifices till christ's coming as if those devils of the air had shared the earth amongst them which the platonists held for gods ludus deorum sumus and were our governors and keepers in several places they had several rites orders names of which read virus de prestigiis demonum book one chapter five strozius cicogna and others adonided amongst the syrians adramalek amongst the capernaites asinii amongst the amathites astartes with the sidonians astaroth with the palestines dagon with the philistines tartary with the hanai melconis amongst the ammonites belly the babylonians Bezelbub and baal with the samaritans and moabites apis isis and osiris amongst the egyptians apollo pythias at delphos colophon ancyra cuma erythra jupiter in crete venus at cyprus juno at carthage asclepius at epidaurus diana at ephesus pallas at athens etc and even in these our days both in the east and west indies in tartary china japan etc what strange idols in what prodigious forms with what absurd ceremonies are they adored what strange sacraments like ours of baptism and the lord's supper what goodly temples priests sacrifices they had in america when the spaniards first landed there let acosta the jesuit relate book five chapters one two three four etc and how the devil imitated the ark and the children of israel's coming out of egypt with many such for as lipsius well discourseth out of the doctrine of the stoics maxime cupiunt adorationem hominum now and of old they still and most especially desire to be adored by men see but what vertomanus book five chapter two marcus polus lerius benzo petrus martyr in his ocean decades acosta and Matthäus Riccius, Expeditione Christiana, in Sinus, Book I, Relate. Eusebius wonders how that wise city of Athens and flourishing kingdoms of Greece should be so besotted, and we, in our times, how those witty Chinese, so perspicacious in all other things, should be so gulled, so tortured with superstition, so blind as to worship stocks and stones but it is no marvel when we see all out as great effects amongst christians themselves how are those anabaptists arians and papists above the rest miserably infatuated mars jupiter apollo and asclepius have resigned their interest names and offices to saint george maxime bellorum rector quem nostra juventus pro mavorte colet saint christopher and a company of fictitious saints 
venus to the lady of loretto and as those old romans had several distinct gods for diverse offices persons places so have they saints as lavater well observes out of lactantius mutato nomine tantum tis the same spirit or devil that deludes them still the manner how as i say is by rewards promises terrors affrights punishments in a word fair and foul means hope and fear how often hath jupiter apollo bacchus and the rest sent plagues in greece and italy because their sacrifices were neglected dii multa neglecti dederunt hesperiae mala luctuosae to terrify them to arouse them up and the like see but livy dionysius halicarnassius thucydides pausanias philostratus polybius before the battle of cani prodigiis signis ostentis templa cuncta privates etiam aedes scatebant oinus reigned in aetolia and because he did not sacrifice to diana with his other gods see more in libanius his diana she sent a wild boar in solitae magnitudinis qui terras et homines misere de pascebatur to spoil both men and country which was afterwards killed by meleager so plutarch in the life of lucullus relates how mithridates king of pontus at the siege of chisicum with all his navy was overthrown by proserpina for neglecting of her holy day she appeared in a vision to aristagoras in the night cras inquit tibicinum libicum cum tibicine pontico comitam to-morrow i will cause a contest between a libyan and a pontic minstrel and the day following this enigma was understood for with a great south wind which came from libya she quite overwhelmed mithridates army what prodigies and miracles dreams visions predictions apparitions oracles have been of old at delphus dodona trophonius den at thebes and labaudia of jupiter ammon in egypt amphiaros in attica etc what strange cures performed by apollo and asclepius juno's image and that of fortune spake castor and pollux fought in person for the romans against hannibal's army as pallas mars juno venus for greeks and trojans etc amongst our pseudo-catholics nothing so familiar as such miracles how many cures done by our lady of loretto at sichem of old at our saint thomas's shrine etc saint sabine was seen to fight for anolphus duke of spoleto saint george fought in person for john the bastard of portugal against the castilians saint james for the spaniards in america in the battle of bannockburn where edward the second our english king was foiled by the scots saint philinus arm was seen to fight if hector boethius doth not impose that was before shut up in a silver cap case another time in the same author saint magnus fought for them now for visions revelations miracles not only out of the legend out of purgatory but every day comes news from the indies and at home read the jesuits letters ribadiniera thersilenius acosta lipomenus javieras ignatius lives etc and tell me what difference his ordinary instruments or factors which he useth as god himself did good kings lawful magistrates patriarchs prophets to the establishing of his church 
are politicians statesmen priests heretics blind guides impostors pseudo-prophets to propagate his superstition and first to begin of politicians it hath ever been a principal axiom with them to maintain religion or superstition which they determine of alter and vary upon all occasions as to them seems best they make religion mere policy a cloak a human invention nihil aeque valet ad regendos vulgi animos ac superstitio as tacitus and tully hold augustine book four de civitate dei chapter nine censures scavola saying and acknowledging expedire civitates religione fali that it was a fit thing cities should be deceived by religion according to the diverb si mundus vult decipi decipiatur if the world will be gulled let it be gulled tis good howsoever to keep it in subjection tis that aristotle and plato inculcate in their politics religion neglected brings plague to the city opens a gap to all naughtiness tis that which all our late politicians ingeminate cromerus book two polish history boterus book three de incrementis urbium Clapmarius, book two chapter nine de arcanis rerum publicarum chapter four book two polit captain machiavel will have a prince by all means to counterfeit religion to be superstitious in show at least to seem to be devout frequent holy exercises honour divines love the church affect priests as numa lycurgus and such law-makers were and did nonut his fidem habeant sed ut subditos religionis metu facilius in officio continent to keep people in obedience nam naturaliter as cardan writes lex christiana lex est pietatis justitiae fide simplicitatis etc but this error of his innocentius gentiletus a french lawyer theorem nine commentary one de religione and thomas bosius in his book de ruinis gentium et regnorum have copiously confuted many politicians i dare not deny maintain religion as a true means and sincerely speak of it without hypocrisy are truly zealous and religious themselves justice and religion are the two chief props and supporters of a well-governed commonwealth but most of them are but machiavellians counterfeits only for political ends for solus rex which campanella chapter eighteen atheismi triumphali observes as amongst our modern turks republicae finis as knowing magnus eus in animos imperium and that as sabellicus delivers a man without religion is like a horse without a bridle no way better to curb than superstition to terrify men's consciences and to keep them in awe they make new laws statutes invent new religions ceremonies as so many stalking horses to their ends haec enum religio si falsa sit dum moda vera credatur animorum ferociam domat libidines coercet subditos principi obsequentes efficit therefore saith polybius of lycurgus did he maintain ceremonies not that he was superstitious himself but that he had perceived mortal men more apt to embrace paradoxes than aught else and durst attempt no evil things for fear of the gods 
this was Zamolkis' stratagem amongst the Thracians, Numa's plot when he said he had conference with the nymph Egeria, and that of Sertorius with a heart, to get more credit to their decrees by deriving them from the gods, or else they did all by divine instinct, which Nicholas Damascen well observes of Lycurgus, Solon, and Minos. They had their laws dictated, Montesacro, by Jupiter himself. So Mahomet referred his new laws to the angel Gabriel, by whose direction he gave out they were made. Caligula, in Dion, feigned himself to be familiar with Castor and Pollux, and many such, which kept those Romans under, who, as Machiavel proves, Book I, Disputationes, Chapter Eleven and Twelve, were religione maxime moti, most superstitious, and did curb the people more by this means than by force of arms or severity of human laws. Sola plebecula eam agnoscebat, saith Vaninus, Dialogue 1, Book 4, De admirandis naturae arcanis, speaking of religion, que facili decipitur magnates vero et philosophi nequaquam. Your grandees and philosophers had no such conceit. Sed ad imperii conformationem et amplificationem quam sine praetextu religionis tueri non poterant. And many thousands in all ages have ever held as much, philosophers especially, Animad vertebant hi semper haec esse fabelas, atamen op metum publicae potestate silere cogebantur. They were still silent for fear of laws, etc. To this end that Syrian, Phyresides, Pythagoras his master, broached in the east amongst the heathens, first the immortality of the soul, as Trismegistus did in Egypt, with a many of feigned gods. Those French and Briton druids in the West first taught, saith Caesar, non inter ire animas, that souls did not die, but after death to go from one to another, that so they might encourage them to virtue. Twas for a politic end, and to this purpose the old poets feigned those Elysian fields, their Aeacus, Minus, and Radamanthus, their infernal judges, and those Stygian lakes, fiery Phlegathons, Pluto's kingdom, and variety of torments after death. Those that had done well went to the Elysian fields, but evildoers to Cocytus, and to that burning lake of hell with fire and brimstone for ever to be tormented. Tis this which Plato labours for in his Phaedon, and the Ninth De Republica. The Turks in their Alcoran, when they set down rewards and several punishments for every particular virtue and vice, when they persuade men that they that die in battle shall go directly to heaven, but wicked livers to eternal torment, and all of all sorts much like our papistical purgatory, for a set time shall be tortured in their graves, as appears by that tract which John Baptista Alfaki, that Mauritanian priest, now turned Christian, hath written in his confutation of the Alcoran. After a man's death, two black angels, nunquir and nequir, so they call them, come to him to his grave and punish him for his precedent sins. If he lived well, they torture him the less. If ill, per indesinentes cruciatus ad diem fudicii, they incessantly punish him to the day of judgment. Nemo viventium quiad horum mentionum non totus horet et contremiscit, the thought of this crucifies them all their lives long, and makes them spend their days in fasting and prayer. 
ne mala haec contingant, etc. A Tartar prince, saith Marcus Polus, Book One, Chapter Twenty Three, called Senex de Montibus, the better to establish his government amongst his subjects and to keep them in awe found a convenient place in a pleasant valley environed with hills in which he made a delicious park full of odoriferous flowers and fruits and a palace of all worldly contents that could possibly be devised music pictures varieties of meats etc and chose out a certain young man whom with a soporiferous potion he so benumbed that he perceived nothing and so fast asleep as he was caused him to be conveyed into this fair garden where after he had lived a while in all such pleasures a sensual man could desire he cast him into a sleep again and brought him forth that when he awaked he might tell others he had been in paradise the like he did for hell and by this means brought his people to subjection because heaven and hell are mentioned in the scriptures and to be believed necessary by christians so cunningly can the devil and his ministers in imitation of true religion counterfeit and forge the like to circumvent and delude his superstitious followers many such tricks and impostures are acted by politicians in china especially but with what effect i will discourse in the symptoms next to politicians if i may distinguish them are some of our priests who make religion policy if not far beyond them for they domineer over princes and statesmen themselves carnificiam exercent one saith they tyrannize over men's consciences more than any other tormentors whatsoever partly for their commodity and gain religionem enim omnium abusus as postellus holds quaestus scilicet sacrificum in causa est for sovereignty credit to maintain their state and reputation out of ambition and avarice which are their chief supporters what have they not made the common people believe impossibilities in nature incredible things what devices traditions ceremonies have they not invented in all ages to keep men in obedience to enrich themselves quibus quaestui sunt capti superstitioni animi as livy saith those egyptian priests of old got all the sovereignty into their hands and knowing as curtius insinuates nulla res efficacius multitudinem reget quam superstitio melius vatibus quam ducibus parent vana religioni capti etiam impotentes feminae the common people will sooner obey priests than captains and nothing so forcible as superstition or better than blind zeal to rule a multitude have so terrified and gulled them that it is incredible to relate all nations almost have been besotted in this kind amongst our britons and old gauls the druids magi in persia philosophers in greece chaldeans amongst the oriental brahmani in india gymnosophists in ethiopia the turditanes in spain augurs in rome have insulted apollo's priests in greece Theobades and Pythonice by their oracles and phantasms, Amphiaraos and his companions, now Mahometan and pagan priests, what can they not effect? How do they not infatuate the world? Adeo ubique, as Scaliger writes of the Mahometan priests, Tum gentium tum locorum gains ista sacrorum ministra, vulgi secat spes 
ad ea quae ipsi fingunt somnia so cunningly can they gull the commons in all places and countries but above all others that high priest of rome the dam of that monstrous and superstitious brood the bull bellowing pope which now rageth in the west that three-headed kerberus hath played his part whose religion at this day is mere policy a state wholly composed of superstition and wit and needs nothing but wit and superstition to maintain it that useth colleges and religious houses to as good purpose as forts and castles and doth more at this day by a company of scribbling parasites fiery spirited friars zealous anchorites hypocritical confessors and those praetorian soldiers his janissary jesuits and that dissociable society as languis terms it postremus diaboli conatus et saeculi excrementum that now stand in the forefront of the battle will have a monopoly of and engross all other learning but domineer in divinity excipiunt solitotius vulnera belli, and fight alone almost for the rest are but his dromedaries and asses than ever he could have done by garrisons and armies what power of prince or penal law be it never so strict could enforce men to do that which for conscience sake they will voluntarily undergo and as to fast from all flesh abstain from marriage rise to their prayers at midnight whip themselves with stupendous fasting and penance abandon the world wilful poverty perform canonical and blind obedience to prostrate their goods fortunes bodies lives and offer up themselves at their superior's feet at his command what so powerful an engine as superstition which they right well perceiving are of no religion at all themselves primum enum as calvin rightly suspects the tenor and practice of their life proves arcanae ilius theologiae quod apud eos regnat caput est nullum esse deum they hold there is no god as leo the tenth did hildebrand the magician alexander the sixth julius the second mere atheists and which the common proverb amongst them approves the worst christians of italy are the romans of the romans the priests are wildest the lewdest priests are preferred to be cardinals and the baddest men amongst the cardinals is chosen to be pope that is an epicure as most part the popes are infidels and lucianists for so they think and believe and what is said of christ to be fables and impostures of heaven and hell day of judgment paradise immortality of the soul are all rumores vacui verbaque inania et par solicito fabula somnio dreams toys and old wives tales yet as so many whetstones to make other tools cut but cut not themselves though they be of no religion at all they will make others most devout and superstitious by promises and threats compel enforce from and lead them by the nose like so many bears in a line when as their end is not to propagate the church advance god's kingdom seek his glory or common good but to enrich themselves to enlarge their territories to domineer and compel them to stand in awe to live in subjection to the sea of rome for what otherwise care they si mundus vult decipi decipiatur since the world wishes 
to be gulled let it be gulled tis fit it should be so and for which augustine cites varro to maintain his roman religion we may better apply to them multa vera quae vulgus scire non est utile pleraque falsa quae tamen uliter existimare populum expedit some things are true some false which for their own ends they will not have the gullish commonality take notice of as well may witness their intolerable covetousness strange forgeries fopperies fooleries unrighteous subtleties impostures illusions new doctrines paradoxes traditions false miracles which they have still forged to enthrall circumvent and subjugate them to maintain their own estates one while by bulls pardons indulgencies and their doctrines of good works that they be meritorious hope of heaven by that means they have so fleeced the commonality and spurred on this free superstitious horse that he runs himself blind and is an ass to carry burdens they have so amplified peter's patrimony that from a poor bishop he is become rex regum dominus dominantium a demigod as his canonists make him felonus and the rest above god himself and for his wealth and temporalities is not inferior to many kings his cardinals princes companions and in every kingdom almost abbots priors monks friars etc and his clergy have engrossed a third part half in some places all into their hands three princes electors in germany bishops besides magdeburg spire salzburg bremen bamberg etc in france as bodin liber de republica gives us to understand their revenues are twelve million three hundred thousand livres and of twelve parts of the revenues in france the church possesseth seven the jesuits a new sect begun in this age have as middendorpius and pelargus reckon up three or four hundred colleges in europe and more revenues than many princes in france as arnoldus proves in thirty years they have got bis centum librarum milia annua two hundred thousand livres i say nothing of the rest of their orders we have had in england as armacanus demonstrates above thirty thousand friars at once and as speed collects out of leland and others almost six hundred religious houses and near two hundred thousand livres in revenues of the old rent belonging to them besides images of gold silver plate furniture goods and ornaments as weaver calculates and esteems them at the dissolution of abbeys worth a million of gold how many towns in every kingdom hath superstition enriched what a deal of money by musty relics images idolatry have their mass priests engrossed and what sums have they scraped by their other tricks loretto in italy walsingham in england in those days ubi omnia auro nitent where everything shines with gold saith erasmus saint thomas's shrine etc may witness delphos so renowned of old in greece for apollo's oracle delos commune conciliabulum et emporium sola religione munitum dodona whose fame and wealth were sustained by religion were not so rich so famous 
if they can get but a relic of some saint the virgin mary's picture idols or the like that city is for ever made it needs no other maintenance now if any of these their impostures or juggling tricks be controverted or called in question if a magnanimous or zealous luther an heroical luther as dithmarus calls him dare touch the monk's bellies all is in a combustion all is in an uproar demetrius and his associates are ready to pull him in pieces to keep up their trades great is the diana of the ephesians with a mighty shout of two hours long they will roar and not be pacified End of section 36section thirty seven of the anatomy of melancholy volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by cynthia moyer the anatomy of melancholy volume three by robert burton section thirty seven partition three section four member one subsection two part two now for their authority what by auricular confession satisfaction penance peter's keys thunderings excommunications etc roaring bulls this high priest of rome shaking his gorgon's head hath so terrified the soul of many a silly man insulted over majesty itself and swaggered generally over all europe for many ages and still doth to some holding them as yet in slavish subjection as never tyrannizing spaniards did by their poor negroes or turks by their galley slaves the bishop of rome saith stapleton a parasite of his de magnitudine ecclesiae book two chapter one hath done that without arms which those roman emperors could never achieve with forty legions of soldiers deposed kings and crowned them again with his foot made friends and corrected at his pleasure etc tis a wonder saith machiavel florentine historiae book one what slavery king henry the second endured for the death of thomas becket what things he was enjoined by the pope and how he submitted himself to do that which in our times a private man would not endure and all through superstition henry the fourth disposed of his empire stood barefooted with his wife at the gates of Canossus. frederick the emperor was trodden on by alexander the third another held adrian's stirrup king john kissed the knees of pandolfos the pope's legate etc what made so many thousand christians travel from france britain etc into the holy land spend such huge sums of money go a pilgrimage so familiarly to jerusalem to creep and crouch but slavish superstition what makes them so freely venture their lives to leave their native countries to go seek martyrdom in the indies but superstition to be assassins to meet death murder kings but a false persuasion of merit of canonical or blind obedience which they instil into them and animate them by strange illusions hope of being martyrs and saints such pretty feats can the devil work by priests 
and so well for their own advantage can they play their parts and if it were not yet enough by priests and politicians to delude mankind and crucify the souls of men he hath more actors in his tragedy more irons in the fire another scene of heretics factious ambitious wits insolent spirits schismatics impostors false prophets blind guides that out of pride singularity vainglory blind zeal cause much more madness yet set all in an uproar by their new doctrines paradoxes figments crotchets make new divisions subdivisions new sects oppose one superstition to another one kingdom to another commit prince and subjects brother against brother father against son to the ruin and destruction of a commonwealth to the disturbance of peace and to make a general confusion of all estates how did those arians rage of old how many did they circumvent those pelagians manichees etc their names alone would make a just volume how many silly souls have impostors still deluded drawn away and quite alienated from christ lucian's alexander simon magus whose statue was to be seen and adored in rome saith justin martyr simoni deo sancto etc after his decease apollonius tianeus cynops eumo who by counterfeiting some new ceremonies and juggling tricks of that dea syria by spitting fire and the like got an army together of forty thousand men and did much harm with eudo de Stelis, of whom nubrigensis speaks book one chapter nineteen that in king stephen's days imitated most of christ's miracles fed i know not how many people in the wilderness and built castles in the air etc to the seducing of multitudes of poor souls in franconia 1476 a base illiterate fellow took upon him to be a prophet and preach john beheim by name a neat herd at nickelhausen he seduced thirty thousand persons and was taken by the commonality to be a most holy man come from heaven tradesmen left their shops women their distaffs servants ran from their masters children from their parents scholars left their tutors all to hear him some for novelty some for zeal he was burnt at last by the bishop of wartsburg and so he and his heresy vanished together how many such impostors false prophets have lived in every king's reign what chronicles will not afford such examples that as so many ignes fatui have led men out of the way terrified some deluded others that are apt to be carried about by the blast of every wind a rude inconstant multitude a silly company of poor souls that follow all and are cluttered together like so many pebbles in a tide what prodigious follies madness vexations persecutions absurdities impossibilities these impostors heretics etc have thrust upon the world what strange effects shall be shown in the symptoms now the means by which or advantages the devil and his infernal ministers take so to delude and disquiet the world with such idle ceremonies false doctrines superstitious fopperies are from themselves innate fear ignorance simplicity hope and fear those two battering cannons and principal engines with their objects 
reward and punishment purgatory limbus patrum etc which now more than ever tyrannize for what province is free from atheism superstition idolatry schism heresy impiety their factors and followers thence they proceed and from that same decayed image of god which is yet remaining in us os homini sublime dedit caelumque tueri usit our own conscience doth dictate so much unto us we know there is a god and nature doth inform us nulligens tam barbara saith tully cui non insideat haec persuasio deum esse sed nec scytha nec grecus nec persa nec hyperboreus dissentiet as maximus tyrius the platonist sermone one farther adds nec continentis nec insularum habitator let him dwell where he will in what coast soever there is no nation so barbarous that is not persuaded there is a god it is a wonder to read of that infinite superstition amongst the indians in this kind of their tenets in america pro suo quisque libitu varias res venerabantur superstitiose plantas animalia montes etc omne quod amabant ot horebant some few places excepted as he grants that had no god at all so the heavens declare the glory of god and the firmament declares his handiwork psalm nineteen every creature will evince it praesentimque refert quae libet herba deum nolentis sciunt fatentur inviti as the said tyrius proceeds will or nil they must acknowledge it the philosophers socrates plato plotinus pythagoras trismegistus seneca epictetus those magi druids etc went as far as they could by the light of nature multa praeclara de natura dei scripta reliquerunt writ many things well of the nature of god but they had but a confused light a glimpse quale per incertam lunam subluce maligna est iter in silvis as he that walks by moonshine in a wood they groped in the dark they had a gross knowledge as he in euripides o deus quisquid es sive celum sive terra sive aliud quid and that of aristotle ens entium miserere mei and so of the immortality of the soul and future happiness immortalitatem animae saith hierome pythagoras somniavit democritus non credidit in consolationem damnationes suae socrates in carcre disputavit indus persia cothus etc philosophantur so some said this some that as they conceived themselves which the devil perceiving led them farther out as lemnius observes and made them worship him as their god with stocks and stones and torture themselves to their own destruction as he thought fit himself inspired his priests and ministers with lies and fictions to prosecute the same which they for their own ends were as willing to undergo taking advantage of their simplicity fear and ignorance for the common people are as a flock of sheep a rude illiterate rout void many times of common sense a mere beast bellua multorum capitum will go whithersoever they are led 
as you lead a ram over a gap by the horns, all the rest will follow. Non qua eundum sed qua itur. They will do as they see others do, and as their prince will have them, let him be of what religion he will, they are for him. Now for those idolaters, Maxentius and Licinius, then for Constantine a Christian. Qui Christum negant male pereant, acclamatum est decies, for two hours space. Qui Christum non colunt, Augusti in mici sunt, acclamatum est ter decies and by and by idolaters again under that apostate julianus all arians under constantius good catholics again under jovinianus and little difference there is between the discretion of men and children in this case especially of old folks and women as cardan discourseth when as they are tossed with fear and superstition and with other men's folly and dishonesty so that i may say their ignorance is a cause of their superstition a symptom and madness itself supplicii causa est supplicumque sui their own fear folly stupidity to be deplored lethargy is that which gives occasion to the other and pulls these miseries on their own heads for in all these religions and superstitions amongst our idolaters you shall find that the parties first affected are silly rude ignorant people old folks that are naturally prone to superstition weak women or some poor rude illiterate persons that are apt to be wrought upon and gulled in this kind prone without either examination or due consideration for they take up religion a trust as at mercers they do their wares to believe anything and the best means they have to broach first or to maintain it when they have done is to keep them still in ignorance for ignorance is the mother of devotion as all the world knows and these times can amply witness this hath been the devil's practice and his infernal ministers in all ages not as our saviour by a few silly fishermen to confound the wisdom of the world to save publicans and sinners but to make advantage of their ignorance to convert them and their associates and that they may better effect what they intend they begin as i say with poor stupid illiterate persons so mahomet did when he published his al Quran which is a piece of work saith bredenbachius full of nonsense barbarism confusion without rhyme reason or any good composition first published to a company of rude rustics hog rubbers that had no discretion judgment art or understanding and is so still maintained for it is a part of their policy to let no man comment dare to dispute or call in question to this day any part of it be it never so absurd incredible ridiculous fabulous as it is must be believed implicite upon pain of death no man must dare to contradict it god and the emperor etc what else do our papists but by keeping the people in ignorance vent and broach all their new ceremonies and traditions when they conceal the scripture read it in latin and to some few alone 
feeding the slavish people in the meantime with tales out of legends and such like fabulous narrations whom do they begin with but collapsed ladies some few tradesmen superstitious old folks illiterate persons weak women discontent rude silly companions or sooner circumvent so do all our schismatics and heretics marcus and valentinian heretics in irenaeus seduced first i know not how many women and made them believe they were prophets friar cornelius of dort seduced a company of silly women what are all our anabaptists brownists barrowists femalists but a company of rude illiterate capricious base fellows what are most of our papists but stupid ignorant and blind bayards how should they otherwise be when as they are brought up and kept still in darkness if their pastors saith lavater have done their duties and instructed their flocks as they ought in the principles of christian religion or had not forbidden them the reading of scriptures they had not been as they are but being so misled all their lives in superstition and carried hoodwinked like hawks how can they prove otherwise than blind idiots and superstitious asses what else shall we expect at their hands neither is it sufficient to keep them blind and in cimmerian darkness but withal as a schoolmaster doth by his boys to make them follow their books sometimes by good hope promises and encouragements but most of all by fear strict discipline severity threats and punishment do they collog and sooth up their silly auditors and so bring them into a fool's paradise rex eris aiunt si recte facies do well thou shalt be crowned but for the most part by threats terrors and affrights they tyrannize and terrify their distressed souls knowing that fear alone is the sole and only means to keep men in obedience according to that hemistichium of petronius primus in orbe deus fecit timor the fear of some divine and supreme powers keeps men in obedience makes the people do their duties they play upon their consciences which was practised of old in egypt by their priests when there was an eclipse they made the people believe god was angry great miseries were to come they take all opportunities of natural causes to delude the people's senses and with fearful tales out of purgatory feigned apparitions earthquakes in japonia or china tragical examples of devils possessions obsessions false miracles counterfeit visions etc they do so insult over and restrain them never hobie so dared a lark that they will not offend the least tradition tread or scarce look awry deus bone lavater exclaims quot hoc commentum de purgatorio misere afflixit good god how many men have been miserably afflicted by this fiction of purgatory to these advantages of hope and fear ignorance and simplicity he hath several engines traps devices to batter and enthrall omitting no opportunities according to men's several inclinations abilities to circumvent and humour them to maintain his superstitions sometimes to stupefy besought them 
sometimes again by oppositions factions to set all at odds and in an uproar sometimes he infects one man and makes him a principal agent sometimes whole cities countries if of meaner sort by stupidity canonical obedience blind zeal etc if of better note by pride ambition popularity vain glory if of the clergy and more eminent of better parts than the rest more learned eloquent he puffs them up with a vain conceit of their own worth scientia inflati they begin to swell and scorn all the world in respect of themselves and thereupon turn heretics schismatics broach new doctrines frame new crotchets and the like or else out of too much learning become mad or out of curiosity they will search into god's secrets and eat of the forbidden fruit or out of presumption of their holiness and good gifts inspirations become prophets enthusiasts and what not or else if they be displeased discontent and have not as they suppose preferment to their worth have some disgrace repulse neglected or not esteemed as they fondly value themselves or out of emulation they begin presently to rage and rave caelum terrae miscant they become so impatient in an instant that a whole kingdom cannot contain them they will set all in a combustion all at variance to be revenged of their adversaries donatus when he saw sicilianus preferred before him in the bishopric of carthage turned heretic and so did arian because alexander was advanced we have examples at home and too many experiments of such persons if they be laymen of better note the same engines of pride ambition emulation and jealousy take place they will be gods themselves alexander in india after his victories became so insolent he would be adored for a god and those roman emperors came to that height of madness they must have temples built to them sacrifices to their deities divus augustus divus claudius divus adrianus heliogabalus put out that vestal fire at rome expelled the virgins and banished all other religions all over the world and would be the sole god himself our turks china kings great chams and mogars do little less assuming divine and bombast titles to themselves the meaner sort are too credulous and led with blind zeal blind obedience to prosecute and maintain whatsoever their sottish leaders shall propose what they in pride and singularity revenge vainglory ambition spleen for gain shall rashly maintain and broach their disciples make a matter of conscience of hell and damnation if they do it not and will rather forsake wives children house and home lands goods fortunes life itself than omit or abjure the least tittle of it and to advance the common cause undergo any miseries turn traitors assassins pseudo martyrs with full assurance and hope of reward in that other world that they shall certainly merit by it win heaven be canonized for saints 
now when they are truly possessed with blind zeal and misled with superstition he hath many other baits to inveigle and infatuate them farther yet to make them quite mortified and mad and that under colour of perfection to merit by penance going woolward whipping alms fastings etc anno thirteen twenty there was a sect of whippers in germany that to the astonishment of the beholders lashed and cruelly tortured themselves i could give many other instances of each particular but these works so done are meritorious ex opere operato ex condigno for themselves and others to make them macerate and consume their bodies specie virtutis et umbra those evangelical counsels are propounded as our pseudo-catholics call them canonical obedience wilful poverty vows of chastity monkery and a solitary life which extend almost to all religions and superstitions to turks chinese gentiles abyssinians greeks latins and all countries amongst the rest fasting contemplation solitariness are as it were certain rams by which the devil doth batter and work upon the strongest constitutions non nulli saith peter forestus oblongas in edias studia et meditationes celestes de rebus sacris et religione semper agitant by fasting overmuch and divine meditations are overcome not that fasting is a thing of itself to be discommended for it is an excellent means to keep the body in subjection a preparative to devotion the physic of the soul by which chaste thoughts are engendered true zeal a divine spirit whence wholesome counsels do proceed concupiscence is restrained vicious and predominant lusts and humours are expelled the fathers are very much in commendation of it and as calvin notes sometimes immoderate the mother of health key of heaven a spiritual wing to arrear us the chariot of the holy ghost banner of faith etc and tis true they say of it if it be moderately and seasonably used by such parties as moses elias daniel christ and his apostles made use of it but when by this means they will supererogate and as erasmus well taxeth celum non sufficere putant suis meritis heaven is too small a reward for it they make choice of times and meats buy and sell their merits attribute more to them than to the ten commandments and count it a greater sin to eat meat in lent than to kill a man and as one saith plus rescipiunt assum piscem quam christum crucifixum plus salmonem quam solomonem quibus in ore christus epicurus in corde pay more respect to a broiled fish than to christ crucified more regard to salmon than to solomon have christ on their lips but epicurus in their hearts when some counterfeit and some attribute more to such works of theirs than to christ's death and passion the devil sets in a foot strangely deludes them and by that means makes them to overthrow the temperature of their bodies and hazard their souls never any strange illusions of devils amongst hermits anchorites 
never any visions phantasms apparitions enthusiasms prophets any revelations but immoderate fasting bad diet sickness melancholy solitariness or some such things were the precedent causes the forerunners or concomitants of them the best opportunity and sole occasion the devil takes to delude them marsilius cognatus book one continue chapter seven hath many stories to this purpose of such as after long fasting have been seduced by devils and tis a miraculous thing to relate as cardan writes what strange accidents proceed from fasting dreams superstition contempt of torments desire of death prophecies paradoxes madness fasting naturally prepares men to these things monks anchorites and the like after much emptiness become melancholy vertiginous they think they hear strange noises confer with hobgoblins devils rivel up their bodies et dum hostem in sequimor saith gregory quim quim diligimus trucidamus they become bare skeletons skin and bones carnibus abstinentes proprias carnes devorant ut nil praeter cutem et ossa sit reliquum hilarion as hierome reports in his life and athanasius of antonius was so bare with fasting that the skin did scarce stick to the bones for want of vapours he could not sleep and for want of sleep became idle-headed heard every night infants cry oxen low wolves howl lions roar as he thought clattering of chains strange voices and the like illusions of devils such symptoms are common to those that fast long are solitary given to contemplation over much solitariness and meditation not that these things as i said of fasting are to be discommended of themselves but very behoveful in some cases and good sobriety and contemplation join our souls to god as that heathen porphyry can tell us ecstasy is a taste of future happiness by which we are united unto god a divine melancholy a spiritual wing bonaventure terms it to lift us up to heaven but as it is abused a mere dotage madness a cause and symptom of religious melancholy if you shall at any time see saith genarius a religious person over superstitious too solitary or much given to fasting that man will certainly be melancholy thou mayst boldly say it he will be so petrus forestus hath almost the same words and cardan subtilis book eighteen et chapter forty book eight de rerum varietate solitariness fasting and that melancholy humour are the causes of all hermits illusions lavater de spectris chapter nineteen part one and part one chapter ten puts solitariness a main cause of such spectrums and apparitions none saith he so melancholy as monks and hermits the devil's hath melancholy none so subject to visions and dotage in this kind as such as live solitary lives they hear and act strange things 
in their dotage polydor virgil book two prodigiis holds that those prophecies and monks revelations nuns dreams which they suppose come from god to proceed wholly ab instinctu daemonum by the devil's means and so those enthusiasts anabaptists pseudo-prophets from the same cause fracastorius book two de intellectione will have all your pythonesses sibyls and pseudo-prophets to be mere melancholy so doth virus prove book one chapter eight and book three chapter seven and arculanus in nine rasis that melancholy is a sole cause and the devil together with fasting and solitariness of such sibylline prophecies if there were ever such which with casaubon and others i justly accept at for it is not likely that the spirit of god should ever reveal such manifest revelations and predictions of christ to those pythonese witches apollo's priests the devil's ministers they were no better and conceal them from his own prophets for these sibyls set down all particular circumstances of christ's coming and many other future accidents far more perspicuous and plain than ever any prophet did but howsoever there be no febades or sibyls i am assured there be other enthusiasts prophets dii fatidici magi of which read johannes Buesardus, who hath laboriously collected them into a great volume of late with elegant pictures and epitomized their lives etc ever have been in all ages and still proceeding from those causes qui visiones suas enarant somniant futura prophetisant et eus modi deliriis agitati spiritum sanctum sibi communicari putant that which is written of saint francis five wounds and other such monastical effects of him and others may justly be referred to this our melancholy and that which matthew paris relates of the monk of evesham who saw heaven and hell in a vision of sir owen that went down into saint patrick's purgatory in king stephen's days and saw as much walthingham of him that showed as much by saint julian Beda, book five chapters thirteen fourteen fifteen and twenty reports of king seba book four chapter eleven ecclesiae historiae that saw strange visions and stumphius helvetian chronicles of a cobbler of basil that beheld rare apparitions at augsburg in germany alexander ab alexandro dies geniales book six chapter twenty one of an enthusiastical prisoner all out as probable as that of eris armenius in plato's tenth dialogue de republica that revived again ten days after he was killed in a battle and told strange wonders like those tales ulysses related to alcinous in homer or lucian's vera historia itself was still after much solitariness fasting or long sickness when their brains were addled and their bellies as empty of meat as their heads of wit florilegus hath many such examples folio one hundred ninety one one of saint gutlock of crowald that fought with devils but still after long fasting overmuch solitariness the devil persuaded him therefore to fast as moses and elias did the better to delude him 
in the same author is recorded carolus magnus vision on one hundred eighty five or ecstasis wherein he saw heaven and hell after much fasting and meditation so did the devil of old with apollo's priests amphiaraus and his fellows those egyptians still enjoin long fasting before he would give any oracles tridium a cibo et vino abstinerent before they gave any answers as volateran book thirteen chapter four records and strabo's geographies book fourteen describes charon's den in the way between tralles and nissum whither the priests led sick and fanatic men but nothing performed without long fasting no good to be done that scoffing lucian conducts his menippus to hell by the directions of that chaldean mithrobarzanes but after long fasting and such like idle preparation which the jesuits right well perceiving of what force this fasting and solitary meditation is to alter men's minds when they would make a man mad ravish him improve him beyond himself to undertake some great business of moment to kill a king or the like they bring him into a melancholy dark chamber where he shall see no light for many days together no company little meat ghastly pictures of devils all about him and leave him to lie as he will himself on the bare floor in this chamber of meditation as they call it on his back side belly till by this strange usage they make him quite mad and beside himself and then after some ten days as they find him animated and resolved they make use of him the devil hath many such factors many such engines which what effect they produce you shall hear in the following symptoms End of section 37section thirty eight of the anatomy of melancholy volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by cynthia moyer the anatomy of melancholy volume three by robert burton section thirty eight partition three section four member one subsection three part one symptoms general love to their own sect hate of all other religions obstinacy peevishness ready to undergo any danger or cross for it martyrs blind zeal blind obedience fastings vows belief of incredibilities impossibilities particular of gentiles mahometans jews christians and in them heretics old and new schismatics schoolmen prophets enthusiasts etc fleat heraclitus an redeat democritus in attempting to speak of these symptoms shall i laugh with democritus or weep with heraclitus they are so ridiculous and absurd on the one side so lamentable and tragical on the other a mixed scene offers itself so full of errors and a promiscuous variety of objects that i know not in what strain to represent it when i think of the turkish paradise those jewish fables and pontifical rites 
those pagan superstitions, their sacrifices and ceremonies, as to make images of all matter and adore them when they have done, to see them, kiss the picks, creep to the cross, etc. I cannot choose but laugh with Democritus. But when I see them whip and torture themselves, grind their souls for toys and trifles, desperate and now ready to die, I cannot but weep with Heraclitus. When I see a priest say mass, with all those apish gestures, murmurings, etc., read the customs of the Jews' synagogue or Mahometa Mesquites, I must needs laugh at their folly, risum teneatis amici. But when I see them make matters of conscience of such toys and trifles, to adore the devil, to endanger their souls, to offer their children to their idols, etc., I must needs condole their misery. When I see two superstitious orders contend pro aris et focis, with such have and hold, delana caprina, some write such great volumes to no purpose, take so much pains to so small effect, their satires, invectives, apologies, dull and gross fictions. When I see grave learned men rail and scold like butter-women, methinks tis pretty sport, and fit for Calphurnius and Democritus to laugh at. But when I see so much blood spilt, so many murders and massacres, so many cruel battles fought, etc., tis a fitter subject for Heraclitus to lament. As Merlin, when he sat by the lakeside with Vortigern, and had seen the white and red dragon fight, before he began to interpret or to speak, infletum prorupit, fell a-weeping, and then proceeded to declare to the king what it meant. I should first pity and bewail this misery of humankind with some passionate preface, wishing mine eyes a fountain of tears, as Jeremiah did, and then to my task. For it is that great torture, that infernal plague of mortal men, omnium pestium pestilentissima superstitio, and able of itself alone to stand in opposition to all other plagues, miseries, and calamities whatsoever, far more cruel, more pestiferous, more grievous, more general, more violent, of a greater extent. Other fears and sorrows, grievances of body and mind, are troublesome for the time, but this is for ever, eternal damnation, hell itself, a plague, a fire. An inundation hurts one province alone, and the loss may be recovered. But this superstition involves all the world almost, and can never be remedied. Sickness and sorrows come and go, but a superstitious soul hath no rest. Superstitione imbutus animus nunquam quietus esse potest. No peace, no quietness. True religion and superstition are quite opposite. Longe diversa carnificina et pietas. As Lactantius describes, the one erects, the other dejects. Ilorum pietas mera impietus. The one is an easy yoke, the other an intolerable burden, an absolute tyranny. The one a sure anchor, a haven, the other a tempestuous ocean. The one makes, the other mars. The one is wisdom, the other is folly, madness, indiscretion. The one unfeigned, the other a counterfeit. The one a diligent observer, the other an ape. One leads to heaven, 
the other to hell but these differences will more evidently appear by their particular symptoms what religion is and of what parts it doth consist every catechism will tell you what symptoms it hath and what effects it produceth but for their superstitions no tongue can tell them no pen express they are so many so diverse so uncertain so inconstant and so different from themselves tot mundi superstitiones quot celo stellae one saith there be as many superstitions in the world as there be stars in heaven or devils themselves that are the first founders of them with such ridiculous absurd symptoms and signs so many several rites ceremonies torments and vexations accompanying as may well express and beseem the devil to be the author and maintainer of them i will only point at some of them ex ungue leonem guess at the rest and those of the chief kinds of superstition which beside us christians now domineer and crucify the world gentiles mahometans jews etc of these symptoms some be general some particular to each private sect general to all are an extraordinary love and affection they bear and show to such as are of their own sect and more than vatinian hate to such as are opposite in religion as they call it or disagree from them in their superstitious rites blind zeal which is as much a symptom as a cause vain fears blind obedience needless works incredibilities impossibilities monstrous rites and ceremonies wilfulness blindness obstinacy etc for the first which is love and hate as montanus saith nulla firmior amicitia quam quae contrahitur hinc nulla discordia maior quam quae a religione fit no greater concord no greater discord than that which proceeds from religion it is incredible to relate did not our daily experience evince it what factions quam teterimae factiones as richard dinoth writes have been of late for matters of religion in france and what hurly-burlies all over europe for these many years nihil est quod tam impotentur rapiat homines quam suscepta de salute opinio siquidem pro ea omnes gentes corpora et animas devovere solent et actissimo necessitudinis vinculo se invicem colligare we are all brethren in christ servants of one lord members of one body and therefore are or should be at least dearly beloved inseparably allied in the greatest bond of love and familiarity united partakers not only of the same cross but coadjutors comforters helpers at all times upon all occasions as they did in the primitive church acts the fifth they sold their patrimonies and laid them at the apostles' feet. And many such memorable examples of mutual love we have had under the ten general persecutions, many since. Examples on the other side of discord, none like, as our Saviour saith, he came therefore into the world to set father against son, etc. In imitation of whom the devil belike, nam superstitio irepsit verae religionis imitatrix superstition is still religion's ape as in all other things so in this doth so combine and glue together his superstitious followers in love and affection that they will live and die together 
and what an innate hatred hath he still inspired to any other superstition opposite how those old romans were affected those ten persecutions may be a witness and that cruel executioner in eusebius aut lita aut morere sacrifice or die no greater hate more continuate bitter faction wars persecution in all ages than for matters of religion no such feral opposition father against son mother against daughter husband against wife city against city kingdom against kingdom as of old at tentira and combos immortale odium et nunquam sanabile vulnus inde furor vulgo quod numina vicinorum odit uterque locus quum solos credit habendos esse deos quos ipse colat immortal hate it breeds a wound past cure and fury to the commons still to endure because one city t'other's gods as vain deride and his alone as good maintain the turks at this day count no better of us than of dogs so they commonly call us gears infidels miscreants make that their main quarrel and cause of christian persecution if he will turn turk he shall be entertained as a brother and had in good esteem a mussulman or a believer which is a greater tie to them than any affinity or consanguinity the jews stick together like so many burrs but as for the rest whom they call gentiles they do hate and abhor they cannot endure their messiah should be a common saviour to us all and rather as luther writes than they that now scoff at them curse them persecute and revile them shall be co-heirs and brethren with them or have any part or fellowship with their messiah they would crucify their messiah ten times over and god himself his angels and all his creatures if it were possible though they endure a thousand hells for it such is their malice towards us now for papists what in a common cause for the advancement of their religion they will endure our traitors and pseudo-catholics will declare unto us and how bitter on the other side to their adversaries how violently bent let those marian times record as those miserable slaughters at merindol and cabrières the spanish inquisition the duke of alva's tyranny in the low countries the french massacres and civil wars tantum religio potuit suadere malorum such wickedness did religion persuade not there only but all over europe we read of bloody battles racks and wheels seditions factions oppositions obvia signis signa pares aquilas et pila minantia pilis invectives and contentions they had rather shake hands with a jew turk or as the spaniards do suffer moors to live amongst them and jews than protestants my name saith luther is more odious to them than any thief or murderer so it is with all heretics and schismatics whatsoever and none so passionate violent in their tenets opinions obstinate wilful refractory peevish factious singular and stiff in defence of them they do not only persecute and hate but pity all other religions account them damned blind as if they alone were the true church they are the true heirs have the fee simple of heaven by a peculiar donation tis entailed on them and their posterities their doctrine sound per funem aureum decelo de lapsa doctrina 
let down from heaven by a golden rope they alone are to be saved the jews at this day are so incomprehensibly proud and churlish saith luther that soli salvari soli domini terrarum salutari volunt and as buxtorfius adds so ignorant and self-willed withal that amongst their most understanding rabbins you shall find naught but gross dotage horrible hardness of heart and stupendous obstinacy in all their actions opinions conversations and yet so zealous withal that no man living can be more and vindicate themselves for the elect people of god tis so with all other superstitious sects mahometans gentiles in china and tartary our ignorant papists anabaptists separatists and peculiar churches of amsterdam they alone and none but they can be saved zealous as paul saith romans ten two without knowledge they will endure any misery any trouble suffer and do that which the sunbeams will not endure to see religionis acti furiis all extremities losses and dangers take any pains fast pray vow chastity wilful poverty forsake all and follow their idols die a thousand deaths as some jews did to pilate's soldiers in like case exertos praebentes jugulos et manifeste praese ferentes as josephus hath it cariorem esserita sibilegis patriae observationem rather than abjure or deny the least particle of that religion which their fathers profess and they themselves have been brought up in be it never so absurd ridiculous they will embrace it and without farther inquiry or examination of the truth though it be prodigiously false they will believe it they will take much more pains to go to hell than we shall do to heaven single out the most ignorant of them convince his understanding show him his errors grossness and absurdities of his sect non persuadebis etiamsi persuaseris he will not be persuaded as those pagans told the jesuits in japona they would do as their forefathers have done and with ratolde the frisian prince go to hell for company if most of their friends went thither they will not be moved no persuasion no torture can stir them so that papists cannot brag of their vows poverty obedience orders merits martyrdoms fastings alms good works pilgrimages much and more than all this i shall show you is and hath been done by these superstitious gentiles pagans idolaters and jews their blind zeal and idolatrous superstition in all kinds is much at one little or no difference and it is hard to say which is the greatest which is the grossest for if a man shall duly consider those superstitious rites amongst the ethnics in japan the banians in gusart the chinese idolaters americans of old in mexico especially mahometan priests he shall find the same government almost the same orders and ceremonies or so like that they may seem all apparently to be derived from some heathen spirit and the roman hierarchy no better than the rest in a word this is common to all superstition there is nothing so mad and absurd so ridiculous impossible incredible which they will not believe observe and diligently perform as much as in them lies nothing so monstrous to conceive or intolerable to put in practice so cruel to suffer which they will not willingly undertake 
so powerful a thing is superstition. O Egypt, as Trismegistus exclaims, thy religion is fables, and such as posterity will not believe. I know that in true religion itself many mysteries are so apprehended alone by faith as that of the Trinity, which Turks especially deride, Christ's incarnation, resurrection of the body at the last day. Quod ideo credendum, saith Tertullium, quod incredibile, etc. Many miracles not to be controverted or disputed of. Mirari non rimari sapientia vera est, saith Gerhardus, et in divinis, as a good father informs us, quaedam credenda, quaedam admiranda, etc. Some things are to be believed, embraced, followed with all submission and obedience, some again admired. Though Julian the apostate scoff at Christians in this point, quod capti vemus intellectum in obsequium fide, saying that the Christian creed is like the Pythagorean ipse dixit, we make our will and understanding too slavishly subject to our faith, without farther examination of the truth. Yet as St. Gregory truly answers, our creed is altiores praestantiae, and much more divine. And as Thomas will, pie consideranti semper sopetunt rationis, ostendentes credibilitatem in mysterii supernaturalibus, we do absolutely believe it, and upon good reasons, for, as Gregory well informeth us, fides non habit meritum ubi humana ratio quaerit experimentum, that faith hath no merit, is not worth the name of faith, that will not apprehend without a certain demonstration. We must and will believe God's word, and if we be mistaken or err in our general belief, as Ricardus de Sancto Victore, vows he will say to Christ himself at the day of judgment, Lord, if we be deceived, thou alone hast deceived us, thus we plead. But for the rest I will not justify that pontifical consubstantiation, that which Mahometans and Jews justly accept at, as Campanella confesseth, Ateismus Triumphatus, chapter 12, folio 125. Difficilimum dogma esse, nec aliud subjectum magis haereticorum blasphemiis, et stultis irisionibus politicorum repereri. They hold it impossible, deum in pane manducari, and besides, they scoff at it, videgentem comedentem deum suum, inquit quidam maurus, hunc deum muscae et vermes irident, quum ipsum poluunt et devorant, subditus est igni, aquae, et latrones furantur, pixidem auream humi prosternunt, et se tamen non defendit hic Deus. Qui fieri potest, ut sit integer in singulis hostiae particulis, idem corpus numero, tam multis locis, caelo, terra, etc. But he that shall read the Turks al Koran the Jews' Talmud, and Papists' golden legend, in the meantime will swear that such gross fictions, fables, vain traditions, prodigious paradoxes and ceremonies, could never proceed from any other spirit than that of the devil himself, which is the author of confusion and lies. And wonder withal how such wise men as have been of the Jews, such learned understanding men as Averroes, Avicenna, or those heathen philosophers, could ever be persuaded to believe or to subscribe to the least part of them. 
aut fraudem non detegere but that as vaninus answers ob publicae potestatis formididem alatrare philosophy non audebant they durst not speak for fear of the law but i will descend to particulars read their several symptoms and then guess of such symptoms as properly belong to superstition or that irreligious religion i may say as of the rest some are ridiculous some again feral to relate of those ridiculous there can be no better testimony than the multitude of their gods those absurd names actions offices they put upon them their feasts holy days sacrifices adorations and the like the egyptians that pretended so great antiquity three hundred kings before amasis and as mela writes thirteen thousand years from the beginning of their chronicles that bragged so much of their knowledge of old for they invented arithmetic astronomy geometry of their wealth and power that vaunted of twenty thousand cities yet at the same time their idolatry and superstition was most gross they worshipped as diodorus siculus records sun and moon under the name of isis and osiris and after such men as were beneficial to them or any creature that did them good in the city of bubasti they adored a cat saith herodotus ibis and storks an ox saith pliny leeks and onions macrobius porum et caepe deus imponere nubibus ausi hos tu nile deus colis scoffing lucian in his vera historia which as he confesseth himself was not persuasively written as a truth but in comical fashion to glance at the monstrous fictions and gross absurdities of writers and nations to deride without doubt this prodigious egyptian idolatry feigns this story of himself that when he had seen the elysian fields and was now coming away radamanthus gave him a mallow root and bade him pray to that when he was in any peril or extremity which he did accordingly for when he came to hydamordia in the island of treacherous women he made his prayers to his root and was instantly delivered the syrians chaldeans had as many proper gods of their own invention see the said lucian de dea syria Morne, chapter twenty two de veritate religionis Williamus ducius sacrorum sacrificiorumque gentilium descripto pater faber semester book three chapters one two three selden de diis siris purchases pilgrimage rosinus of the romans and lilius hiraldus of the greeks the romans borrowed from all besides their own gods which were maiorum and minorum gentium as varro holds certain and uncertain some celestial select and great ones others indigenous and semidei lares lemures dioscuri soteres and perestatae dii tutelares amongst the greeks gods of all sorts for all functions some for the land some for sea some for heaven some for hell some for passions diseases some for birth some for weddings husbandry woods waters gardens orchards etc all actions and offices pax quies salus libertas felicitas strenua stimula horta pan silvanus preapus flora cloacina stercutius febris 
palor, invidia, protervia, risus, angerona, volupia, vacuna, viriplaca, veneranda, pales, neptunia, doris, kings, emperors, valiant men that had done any good offices for them, they did likewise canonize and adore for gods, and it was usually done, usitatum apud antiquos, as Jacobus Bossardus well observes, deificari homines qui beneficiis mortales juvarent, and the devil was still ready to second their intents. Statim se ingesit ilorum sepulcris statuis templis aris, etc. He crept into their temples, statues, tombs, altars, and was ready to give oracles, cure diseases, do miracles, etc. As by Jupiter, Asclepius, Tiresias, Apollo, Mopsus, Amphiaraus, etc., Dii et semidii, for so they were semidii, demigods, some medii inter deos et homines, as Maximus Tyrius the Platonist, Sermones twenty six and twenty seven, maintains and justifies in many words. When a good man dies, his body is buried, but his soul, ex homine daemon evadit becomes forthwith a demigod, nothing disparaged with malignity of air or variety of forms, rejoiceth, exalts, and sees that perfect beauty with his eyes. Now being deified, in commiseration he helps his poor friends here on earth, his kindred and allies, informs, succors, etc., punisheth those that are bad and do amiss, as a good genius to protect and govern mortal men, appointed by the gods, so they will have it, ordaining some for provinces, some for private men, some for one office, some for another. Hector and Achilles assist soldiers to this day. Aesculapius all sick men, the Dioscuri seafaring men etc., and sometimes, upon occasion, they show themselves. The Dioscuri, Hercules and Aesculapius, he saw himself, or the devil in his likeness, non somniance sed vigilans ipse vidi, so far Tyrius. And not good men only do they thus adore, but tyrants, monsters, devils, as Stuccius inveys, Nero's, Domitian's, Heliogables, beastly women, and arrant whores amongst the rest. For all intents, places, creatures, they assign gods. Et domibus tectis thermis et equis soleatis assignare solent genius, saith Prudentius. Cuna for cradles, Divera for sweeping houses, Nodina knots, Prema, Pramunda, Hymen, Hymeneus for weddings, Comus, the god of good fellows, gods of silence, of comfort, Hebe, goddess of youth, Mena menstruarum, etc. Male and female gods, of all ages, sexes, and dimensions, with beards, without beards, married, unmarried, begot, not born at all, but, as Minerva, start out of Jupiter's head. Hesiod reckons up at least thirty thousand gods, Varro three hundred Jupiters. As Jeremy told them, their gods were to the multitude of cities. Quisquid humus pelagus celum miserabile gignit id dixere deos, coles, freta, flumina, flamas. Whatever heavens, sea, and land begat, hills, seas, and rivers, God was this and that. And which was most absurd, 
they made gods upon such ridiculous occasions as children make babies so saith morneus their poets make gods et quos adorant in templis ludunt in theatris as lactantius scoffs saturn a man gelded himself did eat his own children a cruel tyrant driven out of his kingdom by his son jupiter as good a god as himself a wicked lascivious paltry king of crete of whose rapes lusts murders villainies a whole volume is too little to relate venus a notorious strumpet as common as a barber's chair mars adonis anchises whore is a great she-goddess as well as the rest as much renowned by their poets with many such and these gods so fabulously and foolishly made ceremoniis hymnis et canticis celebrunt their errors luctus et gaudia amores iras nuptias et liberorum procreationes as eusebius well taxeth weddings mirth and mornings loves angers and quarrelling they did celebrate in hymns and sing of in their ordinary songs as it were publishing their villainies but see more of their originals when romulus was made away by the sedition of the senators to pacify the people julius proculus gave out that romulus was taken up by jupiter into heaven and therefore to be ever after adored for a god amongst the romans Syrophanes of egypt had only one son whom he dearly loved he erected his statue in his house which his servants did adorn with garlands to pacify their master's wrath when he was angry so by little and little he was adored for a god this did semiramis for her husband belus and adrian the emperor by his minion antinous flora was a rich harlot in rome and for that she made the commonwealth her heir her birthday was solemnized long after and to make it a more plausible holiday they made her goddess of flowers and sacrificed to her amongst the rest the matrons of rome as dionysius halicarnassius relates because at their entreaty coriolanus desisted from his wars consecrated a church for tunes muliebri and venus barbata had a temple erected for that somewhat was amiss about hair and so the rest the citizens of alabanda a small town in asia minor to curry favour with the romans who then warred in greece with perseus of macedon and were formidable to these parts consecrated a temple to the city of rome and made her a goddess with annual games and sacrifices so a town of houses was deified with shameful flattery of the one side to give and intolerable arrogance on the other to accept upon so vile and absurd an occasion tully writes to atticus that his daughter tulliola might be made a goddess and adored as juno and minerva and as well she deserved it their holy days and adorations were all out as ridiculous those lupercals of pan florales of flora bonadea anna perena saturnals etc as how they were celebrated with what lascivious and wanton gestures bald ceremonies by what bawdy priests how they hang their noses over the smoke of sacrifices saith lucian and lick blood like flies that was spilled about the altars their carved idols gilt images of wood iron ivory silver brass stone 
olim troncos eram etc were most absurd as being their own workmanship for as seneca notes adorant ligneos deos et fabros interim qui fecerunt contemnunt they adore work contemn the workman and as tertullian follows it si homines non essent diis propitii non essent dii had it not been for men they had never been gods but blocks and stupid statues in which mice swallows birds make their nests spiders their webs and in their very mouths laid their excrements those images i say were all out as gross as the shapes in which they did represent them jupiter with a ram's head mercury a dog's pan like a goat hecate with three heads one with a beard another without see more in carterius and verdurius of their monstrous forms and ugly pictures and which was absurder yet they told them these images came from heaven as that of minerva in her temple at athens quod e caelo cecidisse credebant acolae saith pausanias they formed some like storks apes bulls and yet seriously believed and that which was impious and abominable they made their gods notorious whoremasters incestuous sodomites as commonly they were all as well as jupiter mars apollo mercury neptune etc thieves slaves drudges for apollo and neptune made tiles in phrygia kept sheep hercules emptied stables vulcan a blacksmith unfit to dwell upon the earth for their villainies much less in heaven as mornay well saith and yet they gave them out to be such so weak and brutish some to whine lament and roar as isis for her son and kenocephalus as also all her weeping priests mars in homer to be wounded vexed venus ran away crying and the like than which what can be more ridiculous non e ridiculum lugere quod colas vel colere quod lugeas which minutius objects si dii cur plangitis si mortui cur adoratis that it is no marvel if lucian that adamantine persecutor of superstition and pliny could so scoff at them and their horrible idolatry as they did if diagoras took hercules's image and put it under his pot to seethe his pottage which was as he said his thirteenth labor but see more of their fopperies in cyprian's fourth tract de idolorum vanitate chrysostom adversus gentiles arnobius adversus gentes augustine de civitate dei theodoret de curatio graecarum affectionum clemens alexandrinus minutius felix eusebius lactantius stuccius etc lamentable tragical and fearful those symptoms are that they should be so far forth affrighted with their fictitious gods as to spend the goods lives fortunes precious time best days in their honour to sacrifice unto them to their inestimable loss such hecatombs so many thousand sheep oxen with gilded horns goats as croesus king of lydia marcus julianus surnamed obcrebras hostias victimarius et toricremus and the rest of the roman emperors usually did with such labour and cost and not emperors only and great ones pro communi bono 
were at this charge but private men for their ordinary occasions. Pythagoras offered a hundred oxen for the invention of a geometrical problem, and it was an ordinary thing to sacrifice, in Lucian's time, a heifer for their good health, four oxen for wealth, a hundred for a kingdom, nine bulls for their safe return from Troia to Pelus, etc. Every god almost had a peculiar sacrifice. The sun, horses, Vulcan, fire, Diana, a white heart, Venus, a turtle, Ceres, a hog, Proserpina, a black lamb, Neptune, a bull, read more in Stuchius at large, besides sheep, cocks, corals, frankincense, to their undoings, as if their gods were affected with blood or smoke. And surely, saith he, if one should but repeat the fopperies of mortal men in their sacrifices, feasts, worshipping their gods, their rites and ceremonies, what they think of them, of their diet, houses, orders, etc., what prayers and vows they make, if one should but observe their absurdity and madness, he would burst out a laughing and pity their folly. For what can be more absurd than their ordinary prayers, petitions, requests, sacrifices, oracles, devotions? of which we have a taste in Maximus Tyrius, Sermon I, Plato's Alcibiades Secundus, Perseus Satire II, Juvenal Satire X, there likewise exploded. Mactant opimas et pingues hostias deo quasi esurienti, profundunt vinatan quam sitienti, Lumina accendunt velut in tenebris agenti. Lactantius, Book 2, Chapter 6. As if their gods were hungry, athirst in the dark, they light candles, offer meat and drink. And what so base as to reveal their counsels and give oracles? E viscerum sterquiliniis out of the bowels and excremental parts of beasts. Sordidos Deus, Varro truly calls them, therefore, and well he might. I say nothing of their magnificent and sumptuous temples, those majestical structures. To the roof of Apollo Didymeus temple, ad branchidas, as Strabo writes, a thousand oaks did not suffice. Who can relate the glorious splendor and stupend magnificence, the sumptuous building of Diana at Ephesus, Jupiter Ammon's temple in Africa, the Pantheon at Rome, the capital, the Sarapium at Alexandria, Apollo's temple at Daphne in the suburbs of Antioch, the great temple at Mexico, so richly adorned and so capacious, for ten thousand men might stand in it at once. That fair pantheon of Cusco, described by Acosta in his Indian history, which eclipses both Jews and Christians. There were in old Jerusalem, as some write, four hundred eight synagogues. But New Cairo reckons up, if Radzivilus may be believed. 6,800 mosques, Fez 400, whereof 50 are most magnificent, like St. Paul's in London. Helena built 300 fair churches in the Holy Land, but one Basa hath built 400 mosques. The Mahometans have a thousand monks in a monastery, the like saith Acosta of Americans, Riccius of the Chinese, for men and women fairly built, and more richly endowed some of them than Arras in Artois, Fulda in Germany, or St. Edmundsbury in England with us. 
who can describe those curious and costly statues idols images so frequently mentioned in pausanias i conceal their donaries pendants other offerings presents to these their fictitious gods daily consecrated end of section thirty eight